Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, uh, I table uh, a statement from the presiding officers in response to questions regarding searches of sign-in registers. A similar statement, uh, the same statement, is being tabled in the other place. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks, President. I uh, seek leave to make a short statement in response to the uh, statement that you've just tabled. Just leave granted. Uh, no more than two minutes. Leave is granted for two minutes. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. Look, uh, we've waited a couple of weeks uh, to get an answer on the question of who signed in Brittany Higgins's rapist into the building after that rape was alleged to have occurred in Minister Reynolds' uh, office. We've waited those two weeks and we've had this response, which you've just now tabled, President which says you think it might be privileged information and you're going to send it to a confidential committee to advise on whether that's the case and how to proceed. Well, it looks an awful lot like sweeping this under the carpet and sending it to a committee uh, that is not conducted in public and that presumably can't be spoken about publicly. Um, and I also question uh, the fact that the clerk will be uh, sought advice from, well, could have asked the clerk for advice a couple of weeks ago, and we all could have benefited from the response to that advice. I'm concerned at the level of uh, the lack of transparency that will now be associated with this process. I also asked some questions about the event that the alleged rapist uh, was uh, in the building to attend. Now, those questions didn't pertain at all to who signed him in. Um, they are in no way privileged information and should have been answered. Now, I acknowledge you've said you've still got a couple of weeks to respond to those, and I really look forward to the answers to those questions. Because at this point in time, people not only want to know that their workplaces are safe around the country, but they want to know that everything is being done in this workplace to keep young female workers and all workers safe. And I'm very concerned that this process is now being sent to a confidential committee, committee that the Greens will participate in, um, but it feels deeply inappropriate to uh, send it off with no date for when a resolution will occur um, and with limited ability for this to be then publicly spoken about. I really don't think this is going to go down well, and we will continue to seek answers to these questions of who signed the rapist into the building. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Thanks Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank the Senate. Uh, Senator Waters, uh, I understand your concerns. Uh, the presiding officers we have to respect uh, are bound by decisions uh, made uh, through the various procedures uh, of the parliament uh, and do need to act in accordance with those. Uh, the government uh, has sought and will continue to seek to cooperate as fully and as expeditiously as possible in terms of information uh, requested. Uh, when you first asked these questions, we provided a swift response uh, in relation to whether or not uh, a pass had been issued uh, through and with the cooperation of the presiding officers. 
uh, that was capable within the rules that were established and also able to be provided, uh, noting, that, uh, uh, noting that the technology uh, and records in relation to the allocation of passes enabled a swift uh, answer to be provided. Uh, the manual and physical process of signing individuals in uh, is obviously governed through different arrangements but also creates uh, additional difficulties in terms of physically ascertaining that information. I'm not aware that there is any particular information that says the individual has ever been signed in. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, government uh, will continue to cooperate as best we possibly can uh, through all of these processes to get swift answers to these matters, uh, but uh, I would stress uh, that, uh, that uh, we have uh, to date uh, provided as much information um, as is actually available in relation to uh, passes, uh, in relation to access, uh, and will continue to do so uh, where we can. Senator Waters, I wasn't aware you were going to make those particular comments that, in my view, unfairly impugn my motives or actions over the last few weeks. When you have asked questions, those answers have been provided. This statement was drafted in response to a specific question that was raised in the other place. I have consulted with you privately and given you the courtesy of explaining the approach we were taking over the last two weeks. This involves matters under the administration of both houses. It is not something that I can unilaterally do. The committee to which it is being sent is, I am advised, the appropriate committee to first look at this matter that is set up by the Senate. It is not a committee set up by me. I operate under the rules that this entire Senate imposes on me. I might also say I think it is only appropriate that after this decision was reached by the Speaker and myself that we seek advice from the clerk, in my case the clerk of the Senate. And I think it would be inappropriate of me to make such determinations without seeking such advice and providing it to the committee, which, as you said, you are free to participate in and is one of the reasons that is the appropriate committee. I mean, with respect to the question on notice you have asked, we are still within the window and, as I have privately indicated to you, I am seeking to answer that question and I will do so in consultation with the advice the committee receives from the clerk. But I do reject the motives or implications that you said in your statement then, given that at all times with respect to your questions, I think I have acted in good faith towards you and the questions you have asked. I will call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Fair Work Amendment Supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Green. Well, thank you, Deputy President. Last week, I attended rallies in Townsville and Cairns with workers who are against this bill. And I told those workers that I would come in here and I would vote against this legislation because it does nothing to help our recovery, it does nothing to support jobs, and it does nothing to fix insecurity in work, which we know this government talks a lot about but doesn't do anything when it comes to the crunch. Those rallies took place outside of the member for Herbert's office. It, they took place outside the member for Leichhardt's office. But we weren't able to get straight answers from either members of parliament about whether they would guarantee that no workers would be worse off under this legislation. The member for Leichhardt didn't even front the media after this rally was held. Workers had to go all the way to his office to be heard and they still, still had no answers from this government or the member for Leichhardt about why this legislation is being pushed through at a time when regional economies are facing an economic crisis with JobKeeper being pulled out. It doesn't make any sense. Just because you put words in the title of legislation doesn't mean that that is what that legislation delivers. And the worst part about this legisla legislation, and I will go through the provisions in a moment, but we know that this government is t using COVID as an opportunity to attack workers' rights. It says a lot about them, it says a lot about that, their priorities. The workers that got us through this crisis 
are now the workers that the Morrison government wants to attack. The cleaners, the retail workers, the transport and dock workers, the people that kept the country moving in the middle of a pandemic are the people now being attacked by this government. It says a lot about them. They were in here thanking those workers posting things on Facebook, thanking people for going out there, doing their jobs, keeping the country moving. But now this is how they thank those workers. This bill does a number of things to undermine the working conditions of Australian workers. It cuts workers' pay by changing the hours and overtime power given to employers in, given to employers instead of workers. It does this by introducing what they say is a modest change to have, an, by agreement, part-time workers work extra hours without getting overtime. And they say, well, if the employer and the employee comes together, comes together and decides that this is a good thing to do, then what's the harm in that? Well, the Liberals will tell you that there is an even playing field between employees and employers when it comes to making this agreement, but we know that that is not true. Individual workplace agreements were the cornerstone of work choices, and maybe members of this government don't know what it is like to have an individual workplace agreement slid across the table and for you to have no other option but to sign that agreement. Well, I know what that feels like. When, when John Howard was here, when Work Choices was in, when this government was trashing workers' rights, that is what happened to me as a young worker, an inter individual workplace agreement. I didn't have another choice. I didn't have a choice to sign another agreement or to push back. I needed a job. And so many people are now in that situation. They are desperate for work. They are desperate for hours. And this government is putting through a system that means that part-time workers will receive less take-home pay because they won't be able to get overtime because their employer will slide an individual workplace agreement. That's what it is. They might want to call it a different name now, but that's what this is. They're going to slide that across the table, and you can't say no to signing that agreement. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't have a job. You won't get the hours that you need. We know how this works. This government doesn't talk to workers. They don't understand what happens in workplaces, so they don't understand how this will play out when it comes to workplaces in this country. The other thing that this legislation does is, the Liberals will tell you, creates a pathway to permanency. They like that term, a pathway to permanency. What it doesn't do is actually give workers a right to permanency. Because we know that there are two federal court cases at the moment, two federal court cases that say you can't make a worker casual forever. And if you do, you will have to pay them all of the entitlements that you didn't pay them when they were a casual. Pretty simple concept. That's why workers supported by the CFMEU Mining Division took these cases to the federal court. This government joined the federal court case, not on the side of workers. They joined the court case to support the company to stop these cases going forward. And now they lost that bid, they lost these cases. The federal court ruled in favour of the workers to stop them becoming permanent casuals. So what has this government done? Well, it's bringing legislation forward to overturn those decisions. That's what this government is doing. They say, the Liberals will tell you, the Liberal National Party will tell you that all they're doing is just cleaning up the definition of casual. But what they've done is they will overturn those federal court cases. Now, members of this government have been out in central Queensland and north Queensland telling people that this legislation will pr provide a pathway to permanency. But where is the enforcement? If, this, uh, if a case goes to arbitration, then an employer can decide not to take part in that arbitration. 
There is no enforcement mechanism. It is all smoke and mirrors from this government. And for all of the time, all of the time that Senator Canavan, that the member for uh, Dawson, George Christensen, that members of this government have been telling people in far north Queensland, in regional Queensland, in central Queensland, that we are going to do something about dodgy labour hire, about the, the problems with casualisation in the mining industry. Here's their chance, and what do they do? Well, they put forward a haphazard overturn of federal court cases that will do nothing to help workers in central Queensland. This bill also contains eight-year greenfield agreements so that no negotiation can take place between workers and employers for eight years. We heard evidence at Senate inquiries that, that greenfields agreements have locked in what workers call suicide rosters. Suicide rosters. And they haven't been able to negotiate that. Well, after four years, right now, they can. They can go and negotiate those um, rosters. They can go and negotiate the terms and agreement. Things change on a workplace when there is no project. Four years as the project progresses, those workers have invested their hard time to get that project off the ground, and this government will remove the opportunity for them to negotiate for eight years. There's not many projects that actually take eight years to complete. So what it means is that workers on these Greenfields Agreements will never get to negotiate their workplace conditions. This government is bringing forward legislation that they say will improve wage theft laws, will make wage theft laws better in this country. But what we know is that in Queensland, the Labor state government has already brought in workplace wage theft laws. And those wage theft laws make sure that the penalty for stealing from a worker is the same if someone stole from their boss. There's an equivalency. That's an important part of those laws. But this legislation from this government, from, this, uh, lib from the Liberal National Party, is watering down Queensland's wage theft laws by not delivering the same level of penalties for employers. That's not good enough for Queensland workers. That is why they rallied outside the offices of LNP members. It says a lot also about what's not in this bill, about this government. It says a lot about this government, about what is not in this bill. There is no policy in this bill so that if you work the same job, you get the same pay. If you work the same job, you should get the same pay. If we had laws that delivered that, then dodgy labour hire would not be able to undermine the working conditions of people in our country. People working in regional Queensland on dodgy labour hire agreements that undercut the hard-fought working conditions of people Labour hire companies have been able to undercut these working conditions so that people now are not able to plan for their future. They don't know when they're going to be able to take a holiday with their family. They are being paid less than the person standing next to them, doing the exact same job. This is an opportunity for the government to fix this problem, but they're not doing that through this bill. It says a lot about them. It says a lot about them that they're pushing through this legislation, but they're not doing anything to make sure that if you do the same job, you get the same pay. It doesn't do anything to stop permanent casuals or continuing short-term contracts. This legislation doesn't actually provide a way for wages to increase by bargaining better. It doesn't fix that problem. And it doesn't provide, when it comes to IR legislation and making changes, it doesn't provide things like 10 days domestic violence leave. The government is making industrial relation legislation changes, but they left that one out. They left that out. 
The other thing that is deeply concerning about this bill, with the short time that I have left, this bill makes work more insecure. It means that workers won't be able to plan for their future. It means that they will be paid less. It means that work in this country will be, as they refer to it, more flexible. But we know that when they say flexible, what they really mean is insecure. And it's coming at a time when the government is also cutting JobKeeper. It is also taking support off the table for communities, for jobs, for workers around this country. And the problem with that is that this government's plan to rebuild the economy is to let workers do it themselves. The Minister for Tourism said of it's the recovery plan that this government is delivering that Australians had to dig deep and resist the urge to be stingy when booking a holiday at home. Mr Tian said that he encouraged Australians not to be tight, to spend the same way you do overseas. He said there should be no penny pinching in Australia this year. Well, at the same time that the Morrison government is asking Australians to spend their own money to save jobs in tourism, they're pushing through legislation that makes work less secure. At the same time that the Morrison government is cutting JobKeeper, it's pushing through laws to make jobs less secure. At the same time that thousands of workers risk losing their jobs, the Morrison government is pushing through dodgy IR legislation. Dodgy IR legislation. At the same time that thousands of workers in Cairns and around the country are concerned that they will lose their job because this government, this government's only plan to support workers is to ask other Australians not to penny pinch. This is the legislation that they are pushing through. This is their plan for recovery, to cut workers' rights, to make it harder for workers to get a secure, good-paying job, to make sure that the hard working conditions and the federal court cases that have won working rights in this country are overturned. That is their plan. And do you think it's going to work? Well, they said the Morrison government, the Liberal National Party, member for Leichhardt, Warren Ench, said that cutting penalty rates would create jobs. Remember that one? They said if we cut penalty rates, we'll create more jobs. It didn't create a single one. Cutting penalty rates didn't create a single job. And this legislation will not save or create a single job. Thank you, uh, Senator Green. Senator Wish Wilson. <coughs> Thank you, Acting Deputy President. It's disappointing that the Senate Chamber is standing here today debating a bill the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill. At the end of a very difficult 12 months for a lot of Australians uh, doing their bit to get through uh, a pandemic, um, and we find ourselves dealing with a piece of legislation which has proposed changes to our industrial relations system that would result in the most drastic changes to our industrial relations in over a decade. And it's no coincidence this is coming uh, at the recovery phase, we hope, of a pandemic. Uh, just like the government's used uh, COVID to push its agendas or the agendas of its donors with a fossil fuel-led recovery, uh, the gas-led recovery, and uh, myself and many senators have sat on the COVID commission hearings over many months. and we've. We've witnessed this cynical uh, use of a pandemic to say, hey, you know, we, need, we need a COVID recovery, jobs are important, the economy is under assault, uh, let's do this. And they've pushed their agendas. Well, today is another example of an agenda that they just can't let go, doing whatever they can to undermine workers' rights, to come into this place and uh, work for their special interests, the big business sector. What's especially disappointing about this is there's two things we can reflect on from COVID. 
in the last 12 months and as to how that relates to workers' rights and how we operate in this place. And firstly, can I say um, it gave me a lot of hope as a senator during the first phase of COVID when we're all in lockdown, uh, we're all working from our homes, to see political parties come together, to see unions come together with business uh, ad advocacy groups and put in place a stimulus package that both help businesses, especially small businesses, and help workers. And of course, that was the JobKeeper program. Now, it wasn't perfect. Uh, not enough people got it. Uh, the Greens pushed hard for those who were unfairly and unnecessarily, through mean-spirited politics, left out of JobKeeper. Uh, and I would like to remind my uh, colleagues across the chamber uh, that the Greens were the first to be campaigning and calling for a living wage during the pandemic. And we worked hard to speak to stakeholders and try and get everybody on board, as I'm sure the Labor Party did. And to your credit, you did listen. Now, it took a few weeks for you to get on board. But eventually you did listen to the business sector and the unions and other political parties in here, and we got a good result for Australians. And I don't think any of us can deny that JobKeeper and, and certainly an increase in JobSeeker, which we would like to see kept permanent, uh, has helped the economy in every state. It's helped our national economy. It's helped small business stay in business, and it's given workers certainty that they've needed during a very difficult period. So where's that spirit of cooperation gone, where everybody's kind of working for the public interest? Where's that spirit of cooperation gone? It's especially damning that it's back to cynical, self-interested politics so early when we also know that COVID laid bare, COVID laid bare just how bad insecure work is in this country, just how big a problem it is. Many of us remember and probably felt the frustrations, and it wasn't just state premiers or, or prime ministers who felt frustrated when we saw uh, outbreaks from hotel quarantine. But what we learnt was those hotel workers that had spread COVID and led to more shutdowns were working two or three jobs. They were out there because of insecure work. They had to do two or three jobs to put food on the table. If that's not an indictment of insecure work in this country and just how bad it is, I don't know what is. And what we have before us today is an attempt to use a COVID recovery period under the guise of we need jobs and we need growth. I mean, just the name of the uh, bill tells you that. Supporting Australia's jobs and economic recovery. This is an attempt, a cynical attempt, to say, well, forget about the, these concerns uh, that workers have and unions have, and even some in the small business sector have about this bill. Forget about that. What's more important is that we just have jobs and we have recovery during a pandemic. If anything, it should be the other way around. The pandemic should be an opportunity for us to press reset for the next 20, 30, 50 years. It uses an opportunity to get things right, to maintain a higher level of job seeker, give people fairness and dignity in their life, review this concept of a living wage that's so helped so many Australians. And that money's just been circulated through the economy. The circular flow of income, it's worked. It's kept certainty uh, in our communities. And of course, seeing the reaction uh, right around the country to the removal of JobKeeper tells you something very important. People aren't confident that without that government stimulus in the next nine to 12 months of the economic landscape, both here and overseas. While government regulations are in place, 
while it's the government dictating border closures, restrictions for business, restrictions on international travel, and may I say, restrictions that are totally necessary, while government are dictating these things, they have a, a role to play, a responsibility to look after small business and to look after workers. And it's worked very well in the last 12 months. But here we have before us today an attempt to lock in insecure work. And I'm going to go through my key problems with this bill in a moment. But it's worth pointing out that there's over two million people unemployed or underemployed in Australia, with women, young people and migrant workers particularly bearing the brunt of this statistic. And instead of improving job security and lifting wages, which of course the Reserve Bank Governor continues to remind us of is absolutely necessary if we're going to have a future recovery, lift wages. Instead of improving job security and lifting wages, the government's pushing through a bill that will further entrench insecure work, suppress wages, give more power to businesses at workers' expense and undermine the role of unions. More of the same, more of what myself and other senators in this chamber have seen every day in this place since the government came to power in 2013. And I've mentioned that the pandemic's highlighted uh, inequality that's been allowed to flourish as a result of this push for insecure work over many, many years by this government. And casual workers were hit the hardest during the pandemic, accounting for approximately two-thirds of people who lost their job when the pandemic hit just over a year ago. Those casuals who still had a job were amongst the lowest paid and insecure workers with no access to paid leave entitlements. And we mustn't forget the role insecure work has played in spreading COVID across the country as workers without paid sick leave were faced to choose between their health or losing their income. And I once again remind senators of issues around quarantine outbreaks with hotel workers. Many employers have built insecure work into their business models, and while they turn a profit, workers have not had a job or income security. And changes in this bill will just entrench that. So instead of passing a bill that further entrenches insecure work, reduces wages, and increases the powers of employers, we need to outlaw insecure work and ensure the right of all workers to have a safe, meaningful, secure job with good wages and good conditions. Firstly, the first issue that I have with this bill is the definition of a casual. The new definition will give employers all the power to determine whether a worker is casual and will allow businesses to classify workers as casual at the start of their employment, regardless of what ends up happening after that or how many other hours they end up working. The bill clarifies that to avoid any doubt, the question of whether a person is a casual employee is to be assessed on the basis of the offer of employment and the acceptance of that offer, not on the basis of any subsequent conduct of either party. In other words, it allows the use and abuse of casual workers. Casual workers that may be required to work full-time hours but don't get any of the entitlements that go with that. Now, I've got no problem with casual work if it's with the agreement of the worker. Uh, acting Deputy President. Um, I've been a casual worker myself and that has suited my, uh, my personal circumstances. But without agreement and with a scant regard for workers' wellbeing, it's totally unacceptable. The other issue is casual conversion. Casual conversion offers must be made to casuals who have been employed for 12 months unless, and I quote, unless there are reasonable business grounds not to make the offer. This is unenforceable as arbitration is only available if both parties agree and the employer has very broad rights to refuse conversion on reasonable business grounds. Well, what do reasonable business grounds mean? The employer wants more profit? As if that's going to work and be a fair basis to make casual conversion deliberations. I've also got problems with a new class of workers, what we call part-time flexi. So this bill will create 
a new class of de facto casual workers by robbing part-time workers of hours and income security by allowing businesses to effectively treat them like casuals with the power to increase and decrease workers' hours. The bill introduced simplified additional hour agreements, which allow part-time workers in industries that have been hardest hit by the pandemic, such as hospitality and retail, to be employed on contracts that only offer a guarantee of 16 hours a week, while with their employer able to increase their hours without paying overtime. Um, we note that penalty rates will still be paid where applicable. This applies to 12 modern awards. However, the minister will have the power to make regulations to include or exclude modern awards. And if you're a worker having seen the track record of this government in the last nine years, would you trust the minister and this government to make those decisions in your interest? I wouldn't. Enterprise bargaining. There are a suite of proposed changes in this bill that significantly erode workers' rights and undermine the role of unions in enterprise bargaining process. Time and time again, we have seen big business act in their own self-interest at the expense of workers' wages and conditions. However, the government is removing the safety net, checks and balances that are designed to protect workers and asking them to trust big business to do the right thing. Once again, I remind you of Philip Lowe, uh, who spoke recently about the need for wages growth. What is needed and what economists, unions and workings court for are for policies that will increase wages. However, this government is pursuing a bill that will suppress wages, as if we haven't learnt of the importance of being fair and equitable during the pandemic. Greenfields. Uh, this bill will allow the Fair Work Commission to approve greenfield agreements to operate for eight years, locking workers into subpar agreements without the opportunity to renegotiate or access arbitration. Eight years. That's a long time. Eight years. Nearly a decade. Wage theft. While the bill criminalises wage theft for systemic patterns of underpayments, which is welcomed, however, it doesn't apply to one-off underpayments, inadvertent mistakes or miscalculations. And that needs to be fixed also. So, Acting Deputy President, there are six or seven key things in this bill that the Greens fundamentally oppose. But more importantly, I ask senators in this place to think about the last 12 months. Think about the spirit of cooperation that we've all worked together on in this place, something we can be proud of for the rest of our careers, helping our country get through a difficult period. Unions working with businesses, politicians working across political parties to help workers, to help small businesses, to help everybody get through the most difficult of times. That spirit of cooperation has now gone. This bill signals that. This is a return to business as usual, trying to screw workers, trying to help big business, support your donors in politics. Uh, I urge senators to reject this bill. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This legislation shows what this government is willing to sacrifice for its conservative idealism, attacking workers at the expense of our economic prosperity. And that's what this bill does. It takes away job security for millions of Australian workers, delays our recovery from the pandemic by crushing wage growth and stripping away workers' rights, which in turn impacts on our economy. This bill sickens our economy and certainly sickens our workers. The ANU submission to the Senate inquiry into this bill called it an immediate threat to public health. They warned lack of paid sick leave will exacerbate a weakness in Australia's COVID-19 response. This bill promotes insecure work, erodes the security and protections provided to employees. It allows businesses to hire employees as casuals and deprive them of leave entitlements, even if they subsequently work a regular roster. The ANU Research School submission notes that Australia already has one of the highest rates of individuals without leave entitlements among OECD nations, with estimates ranging from 25 to 37 per cent of the workforce. We know casual workers are doubly impacted by the COVID pandemic due to the absence of leave entitlements, 
and being among some of the lowest paid workers. The public health experts cited modelling that paid leave, including for flu and other infectious diseases, can reduce workplace infections by at least 25 per cent. They argue casual workers are already at risk of infection and transmission, as we've seen this year among healthcare workers, personal care attendants, cleaners, security guards, abattoir workers, delivery workers, supermarket staff, public transport and taxi drivers and childcare staff. We have listened to the public health experts in our response to the pandemic. Acting Madam Deputy President, this has been a big part of our success in staying safe and reducing the impacts of COVID-19 on Australians. We should be listening to the public health experts on this bill. They said very, very clearly that the proposed changes will undermine our world-class response to COVID-19 by increasing casual employment and insecure working conditions. The so-called reforms will hurt workers and hurt the economy at the exact moment that both need help the most. Reserve Bank Governor Philip Lowe has said jobs and wages are key to Australia's recovery. But the government, as usual, isn't listening. And it's getting it wrong on both sides of the jobs and wages equation. With no plans for investment on the scale that this once in a generation crisis demands. And the government still plans an abrupt end to income supports in a few weeks, despite pleas from workers and businesses. This bill fails every test. It makes worse work less secure and cuts pay. It is a fundamental attack on the very workers who got us through this pandemic. It's a fundamental attack on the very workers who campaigned so hard and so long in the past to ensure Australian workers have these rights and protections. Many of you, both in the Senate and in the other place, would have seen and spoken with so many workers, representatives who've been in Parliament House this week, campaigning against this bill, telling us what harm it's going to cause them, their families, their colleagues and their workplaces. Among them are representatives from Kalgoorindji in the Northern Territory, people from the Gurindji Nation, from the place of the Wave Hill walk-off. The history of the walk-off and land rights is tied to the history of the union movement and workers' rights in this country, and it is a significant legacy. I'd like to quote some of the speech given by Cara Keyes, the then ACTU Indigenous officer, at the 50th anniversary of the Wave Hill walk-off. And I quote, it is a great legacy because once the Gurindji walked off Wave Hill, the North Australian Workers' Union gave them their 100 per cent support. It is a great legacy because the union movement nationwide galvanised around the workers and gave them great support. It is a great legacy because it fundamentally shifted the NAWU and other unions in the country, and it showed unions that Indigenous workers were willing to fight for wage equality and it shifted unions to the role of supporting and fighting for all workers. It is a great legacy because while the trigger for the Wave Hill walk-off was equal wages, the gunpowder was the systemic racism, poor living conditions, a legislative environment which allowed for the theft of children from their families and the theft of Aboriginal people having an agency over their own lives. The Wave Hill walk-off shifted the nation. Thank you, Cara Keys, for reminding all Australians of that. That legacy continues, and it is a fantastic thing to see so many First Nations union members here today in the Australian Parliament. I thank each and every one of you, the union members of First Nations families from across the country, 
who are not just in the parliament this week but are around the country working with our unions, working to improve the working conditions of all people around Australia. Your message is very clear. This bill will cause more harm to workers and it will particularly hurt casual workers. The government has ignored years of common law and overturned the recent federal court decisions on what it means to be a casual. Under these laws, if a worker agrees to be employed as casual at the start of their employment, then they remain as a casual regardless of their actual work pattern, so long as the employer employs them on the basis they make no firm advance commitment to continuing and indefinite work according to an agreed pattern of work. If a court finds later they are in fact a permanent, then any casual loading they receive will be offset against any permanent entitlements they are owed. Both the definition and offset apply retrospectively. So under the government's own figures, this involves cancelling around $39 billion in back pay that would otherwise be owed to casuals. There were just over 2.6 million casual workers employed in Australia in August 2019, who accounted for 24.4 per cent of all employees. Tasmania had the highest casual employee share of total employees in August 2019 at 28.3 per cent, while the Northern Territory had the lowest casual share at 21.2 per cent. That is still more than a fifth of our Northern Territory workforce, particularly in our tourism and hospitality sector. This is a sector we know particularly has been hard hit by the pandemic. Many hospitality businesses have closed or downgraded, hundreds of hotel rooms are offline, and many workers have lost their jobs. They've had their hours reduced or rely on JobKeeper to stay employed. Making it easier for employers to casualise jobs that would have otherwise been permanent will not assist or stabilise an industry where workers are already struggling. The mining and construction sectors are also made up of a critical part of the Northern Territory economy, creating hundreds of direct jobs and contributing in a huge way to the economy. But workers in these sectors will be hard hit by this legislation. Workers on mining and construction projects could be locked in to eight-year enterprise agreements, which could actually see wages that don't keep pace with inflation. So how is this good for workers or good for the wider economy? How does ensuring workers end up with less money in their pockets contribute to our economy and its recovery? The simple answer is it doesn't. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed the fact that too many people in this country work in low-paid, insecure employment, casuals, contractors, freelancers, labour hire workers and gig workers. These vulnerable workers, the ones who can least afford it, were hit first and hit the hardest. Rather than taking this opportunity, acting Madam Deputy President, to learn the lessons from COVID-19 and dealing with the twin problems of insecure work and flatlining wages, the government's proposed new laws do exactly the opposite. This bill is bad for the Northern Territory workers, it's bad for the Northern Territory businesses, and it is most certainly bad for our nation, and it cannot be supported. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Walsh. The Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, at the outset, Labor said that we would apply a very simple test to this legislation. Will it deliver decent pay and more secure jobs for Australian workers? Uh, and in fact, this legislation does 
the exact opposite. It fails our test, uh, and that's why we will not be supporting this bill. This bill is an attack on workers, especially on the lowest paid and most insecure workers in the country. And Labor has always, and Labor always will, stand up for the workers of Australia. We will stand up against pay cuts and job insecurity, and we will stand up against this legislation. The legislation before us has come to us at an absolutely unprecedented time in our history. We face remarkable challenges as a result of COVID-19. COVID has seen the loss of hundreds of thousands of jobs across the country. The recovery is patchy and jobs in some sectors are still at risk. So the government's pay cuts and their attacks on job security could not come at a worse time. But one of our greatest problems, low wage growth, that simply cannot be blamed on the pandemic because under this government, wage growth has never been slower. And the problem of low wage growth will only be made worse by this legislation. Low wages growth is bad for workers. Of course it's bad for workers who are finding it hard to make ends meet and put food on the table. Uh, but it is also bad for the economy because right now we need people with money in their pockets and with the confidence to spend it. And it seems that everyone agrees with that basic proposition. Uh, that's everyone except the Morrison government. Of course, we know that the Reserve Bank Governor, Philip Lowe, uh, has said on multiple occasions, so many times, that we need to get wages moving in this country. Wage growth, he says, is absolutely fundamental to repairing the economy and lifting spending, investment and growth. The Australian economy desperately needs wages to get moving right now. And so do Australian workers. But the wage suppressing policies of this government are hurting workers and putting a break on the economy. The bill that is in front of us today, uh, make no mistake, will only make this worse. The Prime Minister is asking us to believe that cutting wages will create jobs. Well, where have I heard that before? The government is a repeat offender on the lie that cutting wages creates jobs. The lie. Cutting penalty rates did not create a single additional job in this country. Even business groups admit that. So for Australia to recover from the pandemic, we need people with money in their pockets and with the confidence to spend it, not pay cuts and not even more insecure jobs. It's estimated that today up to 5 million Australians have insecure work arrangements. And the government's legislation it will make work even less secure through an expanded employer-controlled definition of casual labour. So under this provision, if an employer says that you're casual, even if you work like a permanent, you'll be treated like a casual. No leave, no entitlements, no rights, no security. That is what the government is offering you with this bill. And while you could ask your, your employer to be made permanent after 12 long months, if they say no, well, that is just the end of it, full stop. So if this legislation uh, is passed, it will hurt wage growth and it will increase job insecurity and financial uncertainty for Australian workers. And it will damage the economy more broadly by hurting consumer confidence and consumer spending. And too many Australians are already in insecure jobs. Too many Australians. Casuals, contractors, freelancers, labour hire workers, gig economy workers. And we saw the devastating consequences of this insecurity in the pandemic. We saw aged care workers juggling two or three jobs just to make ends meet. 
and their insecurity tragically put them and the people in their care at extreme risk. Aged care workers, like so many workers, often have jobs with no certainty of work for the next day, the next week, the next month ahead. Workers like Cherie, a veteran aged care worker uh, with more than 20 years' experience in the sector. Cherie is contracted to work just 16 hours a fortnight. Uh, and while she consistently works above that, she is never sure exactly how many hours she's going to get from week to week. And on top of her irregular hours, the pay is low in her job. So she can't convince a real estate agent to give her a lease. She can't convince a bank to give her a loan. And sometimes she can't make enough money even to meet her own basic needs. Cherie wants us to vote this legislation down. She has spoken out against this le legislation, and today I stand with Cherie, and I stand with all of the Australian workers who are stuck in casual jobs and in insecure jobs. We need to vote this legislation down. This government's legislation would increase the casualisation of jobs and insecurity for all workers. The so-called part-time flexibility arrangements turn permanent part-time workers into casuals. These measures allow the government to extend the sort of hours Cherie works to everyone on an award—16 hours one week, 20 hours the next, 30 hours the week after that. No overtime for going above your rostered hours. No certainty of when you will be offered more hours. No security whatsoever. And this is happening right at the time when we need more job security, not less. Now, last year, the Prime Minister took every opportunity he could find to thank an essential worker every photo opportunity, every doorstop. Uh, but what a difference a new year makes, because this legislation is how he is thanking the workers of Australia, the hardworking, essential people who kept our country going through the pandemic. This nasty IR bill is how Prime Minister Morrison is thanking the essential workers that he once called heroes this year. This nasty IR bill contains pay cuts. It casualises work. It makes work less secure. Uh, it gives more power for employers over workers, uh, and it gives fewer rights to unions. Well, I have a different message for Australia's essential workers, and Labor has a different message for Australia's essential workers. Because we know that you turned up every day last year to do your job. We know that you turned up to deliver the parcels. We know that you turned up to put food on the shelves. We know that you turned up to take care of our elderly in aged care facilities. We know that you turned up every day to our childcare centres, and we know that you continue to turn up every day to do your job. Well, the Morrison government needs to do its job and turn up for you. The Morrison government needs to do its job and turn up for you and scrap this nasty IR bill. The Morrison government needs to do its job and turn up for you and tell the people of Australia, tell the workers of Australia exactly what their plan is to get wages moving, to tell the people of Australia exactly what their plan is to make their jobs more secure, because this bill is not that plan. This bill is not that plan. This is a bill that will keep wages low. This is a bill that will keep jobs casual and make more jobs casual. This is a job that will hurt people's job security. This is a bill that will hurt Australian workers, and this is a bill that will hurt our economy and hurt our recovery. And we fundamentally and absolutely reject this bill.
Now, this government has had nine years to answer the questions that I've asked today. How are they going to get wages moving? How are they going to make jobs more secure? Nine long years. And in that time, I have to say, I cannot think of a single thing, a single initiative that this government has done to get wages moving. I can't think of a single thing, a single initiative that this government has taken to make our jobs in this country more secure. In nine years, I cannot think of a, a single thing that this government has contributed to getting wages moving and making jobs more secure. But one thing is clear today. This bill is not the answer that the people of Australia are looking for. This nasty IR bill is not the answer to getting wages moving. This bill is not the answer to building more secure jobs. It's not the answer for workers struggling to put food on the table. It's not the answer for local businesses who actually want to see people in their communities opening their wallets uh, and having the confidence to spend. That's what local business wants to see. So this bill is not the answer for our economic recovery. What it is is just one more tired and nasty iteration of this government's same old ideological driven um, uh, policies that hurt workers and that hurt unions. Cutting your wages, going after union bargaining rights, calling what is actually insecurity, the better sounding word, the more acceptable word, um, calling it flexibility. This is the Liberals' go-to plan. Well, enough is enough. People need good jobs. They need secure jobs that they can count on. They need rights at work and they need a government that is going to look out for them and back them up. And this Morrison government will never deliver what the people of Australia need. This bill also misses the opportunity to deal with wage theft, which is a national epidemic. Wage theft robs workers of wages and entitlements, uh, and it also robs us of tax income. It's estimated that national revenue loss due to foregone income uh, is over $9 billion annually. Wage theft is bad for workers. It's bad for the economy. Um, it's bad for government, but this government doesn't seem to care. Um, if this bill passes, it will wipe out Victorian and Queensland uh, the stronger wage theft laws that we have in those states, laws that workers themselves have stood up for, that they have fought for. And this government's bill will set an impossibly high bar for successful prosecution of wage theft offences, and employers will face little prospect of prosecution and trivial criminal penalties if indeed they are caught. And that's why workers like Jules fought so hard for those Victorian wage theft laws. She's a veteran hospitality worker, and in her time she's seen every type of wage theft in that industry. And these are her words about the stronger wage theft laws that she fought for in Victoria being overturned by this bill. When the Victorians introduced legislation criminalising wage, wage theft, she said, I cried. Finally, workers were going to have something solid and strong. And she went on, the federal government's legislation is a kick in the guts to workers like me. The Victorian government has said that the Commonwealth should amend its legislation to bring wage theft provisions in line with stronger Victorian offences. But instead, the Morrison government will give unscrupulous employers in Victoria a free pass, and workers will find it much harder to prosecute their employers for wage theft. So the next George Columbaris, the next Rock Paul, the next um, Master Chef who comes under scrutiny could very well get off the hook if this bill becomes legislation. The government is pursuing a deeply entrenched ideology uh, in this legislation. Um, and there is clear evidence that where unions are engaged in effective bargaining, there are better agreements Thank struck. You. Senator Walsh. Senator Carr. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Mackey, President. 
The Morrison government spends a great deal of time talking about economic recovery from the pandemic, and it likes to talk about reviving the manufacturing sector to reduce Australia's dependence on fragile global supply chains. And in this process, it asserts it's creating new skilled jobs for Australians. But so far, we have seen very little evidence very little evidence of the investment necessary to actually achieve those objectives. The truth is that the government does not have a plan for recovery. It is only a plan for increasing the amount of insecure work, for keeping wages growth stagnant, for doing the bidding of the top end of town that we see is very much outlined in this bill. It's a bill which is the nearest thing the to an agenda that this government has. It is a bill which is aimed at increasing what the employers' advocates like to call flexibility. Flexibility has a very, very familiar phrase in the mouths of conservative politicians. We've come to understand what it really means. It means, of course, a code for cutting wages and for cutting working conditions for undermining job security, for making it harder for workers to organise in defence of their rights. And so all the talk about flexibility masks the fact that increasing numbers of people are being forced into insecure, precarious work. The Australian Institute of Centre for Future Work estimates that the casual jobs accounted for some 60 per cent of the jobs that have been created after May last year. And so from May to November 2020, casual employment grew by 400,000, the biggest increase in Australia's history. They have massively added to the numbers of what have already been called the precariat in this country. Now, in late May 2020, the International Labour Organisation called for urgent and large-scale policy responses to prevent long-lasting damage from the COVID-19 pandemic particularly to young people, fearing that multiple shocks would lead to a lockdown generation, that lacking the social and human rights, which including the right to collective bargaining and participation, and that little or no social protection, including adequate unemployment and sickness benefits, accounted for these precarious conditions. And that's what we're seeing, of course, in this government, a repudiation of that approach. The initial response from the government, of course, was to spend very, very large sums of money to ensure that uh, we did not sink uh, too far into depression. But now we see a revert, reversion to kind, to type. What we are seeing is a return to the policy positions where the government is seeking to impose a regime of competition, the neoliberal settings which informed the employment relations and welfare policies, which are about fostering more precarious approaches to social relations in this country. We, of course, have seen this being developed since the economic crisis of 2007, 2008. We've seen it exacerbated through our course throughout this last pandemic, right around the world. We've seen it happening not just in this country, but across, of course, all market economies. It's a consequence. It's not just a technological change. Some will say, well, look, what do you expect with the changes in digitalisation? It's a, a deliberate policy of conservative parties. It is part, it's a consequence of the disruption of the pandemic, but exacerbated by the policy positions being pursued by conservative parties. And when they apply these policies to the workplace, to the welfare system, to vocational education and training. It's a policy that creates to maintaining a pool of low-paid and mostly unemployed workers, workers who have to compete with one another at the bottom end of the labour market so that they are able to provide that reserve wage conditions for the capacity to maintain the suppression on the growth in real wages. So instead of stimulating growth, what we've got is a competition for jobs, and that is the fundamental principle that underlies the economic theory that is behind the development of the precariat, in not just in this country, but in so many other countries. It's about why we see 
the deregulation of employment conditions. Why are we seeing under the internationalisation and marketisation the growth in casualisation? And why are we seeing the reduction in social protections? Why are we seeing this push for supply side employment policies aimed at ensuring that we have an approach that's developing a marketing arrangement at, uh, matching existing skills rather than development of new skills for new industries. This is a bill that employer and advocates would naturally support. It is, it is said by them that not really a problem because insecure work has really been much the same over the last 20 years. They say casualisation has remained about 20 per cent of the workforce. What they do not acknowledge is the rise in casualisation throughout the period, from probably going back even before the previous economic crisis. In 1982, casuals comprised some 13 per cent of the workforce. By 2017, they were 25 per cent of the workforce. More importantly, casual work, which was defined by a much narrower definition in terms of sick leave and other entitlements, has formed only one part of the precarious work. Precarious work is work that's performed by workers with little economic or social security, with little control over their lives, with little control over the work environment. It includes not just casual work, but work on fixed-term contracts, seasonal work, employment under labour uh, hire contracts. And according to the OECD, in 2015, Australia ranked third in the world for non-standard forms of employment. The OECD average for those forms of employment is one in three jobs. But in Australia, the OECD noted it was 44 per cent. This bill before us will indeed increase competition for low-paid precarious work, but it will not drive economic growth. What it will do is be a further rip into the social fabric of this country. People will find it more difficult to control their economic lives and the bonds that keep households and communities together. People start to become alienated from a system they feel that no longer works for them. It further exacerbates the tensions within society. It undermines trust among citizens and between citizens and public institutions such as parliament. And we have seen as a consequence of this in many democracies around the world. We have seen the rise of far-right populist movements. We have seen fascism in its many forms, which many have said was defeated in 1945, re-emerge from the economic crisis of recent years in many parts of the world. Conservative governments in this country seem oblivious to the social and economic costs of the policies that they are pursuing. They have clung to a neoliberal approach aimed at driving down wages and making more people placed in more precarious situation within our society. A goal that gives the lie to their supposed interest in economic recovery. Because increasing the general wage level is the most direct means of stimulating economic growth. It's probably the most effective way of increasing people's opportunities. It's not complicated. When people on low incomes are paid more, they will spend more. And that benefits businesses and the workers they employ. But this short-sighted approach that the government's pursuing suggests that by cutting costs, it's a prescription for nothing less than a downward economic spiral in activity. And that's what we've been locked into for quite a while. The Centre for Future Work stated in its submission to the Senate inquiry into this bill that a dramatic continued deceleration of wages growth had took hold in 2013. Wages growth has fallen by half, with the private sector wages index dropping to 1.8 per cent in 2016-2017. And during the pandemic-induced recession, it has dropped to the record low of 1.2 per cent. 
Because the government keeps chipping away at everything that protects the standard of living of Australians, you could think that the government might actually be set upon an ideological agenda of actually undermining the living conditions of the people of this country. You'd be right to think that, because what you're seeing under these circumstances is that people who are often self-employed, who are often engaged in informal work or casual work, they've all had to face increasing economic pressures. And they are, of course, associated with a precarious way of life and their entitlements and their protections, their employment rights, have been reflected in the lower bargaining power that they enjoy and, as a result, the decline in their economic independence. It's often presented to them that they are, in fact, more independent because they're self-employed. In fact, their position is, in fact, more and more dependent upon others. They offer work is dependent on a relationship with a single source rather than a range of clients. And that's exactly what the courts of this country have found, and that's what obviously distresses the government so much. We have seen the provisions of this bill which seek to overturn those court rulings. Under this bill, a worker who agrees to be employed as a casual at the start of their employment can remain casual regardless of their actual work patterns. And that is uh, required as the employer has to hire them on the basis that they make no firm advance commitment to continuing an indefinite work according to an agreed pattern of work." Unquote. If a court were later to find that the worker was in this position was in fact permanent, any casual loadings paid would be offset against the permanent entitlements the worker is owed. Both the definition and the offset can apply retrospectively. But the government, by its own estimate, these changes will be cancelled up to $39 billion in back pay that otherwise would be paid to casuals. <clears throat> Under the national employment standards, employers are required to make written offer of a conversion to permanent employment after 12 months if there has been a regular pattern of work for six months. But under this bill, an employer faces not having to make the offer if there is no reasonable grounds to do so. For example, if an employer thinks that the job might not exist in another 12 months or if there has been a significant change in the hours of work. So the reasonable grounds exception is broad enough to block any transition to permanent employment. The bill offers people in insecure casual work a catch-22. And of course you can become a permanent employee, but there's still another reason why you can't. Working hours in this uh, bill allows for an employer, a part-time employee, who is working uh, on a minimum of 16 hours a week to agree on a work extra hours at ordinary hourly rate, that is, without overtime. The provision initially applied to a 12 awards nominated in the bill, but the number of awards to which this simplified additional hours provision can be expanded by regulation. It's another pernicious increase in the amount of delegated legislation, which of course is a matter that this Senate should take increasing can be concerned about. This is a provision which will inevitably reduce job security because it effectively casualises part-time work. So the better off overall test has been the crucial protection for workers during EBA negotiations. The Fur Work Commission has been able to exclude changes that would disadvantage employers. But this bill suspends those protections. And of course, with Greenfield agreements, the bill provides extended new EBA periods of up to eight years for Greenfield agreements, eight years. This provision will apply for projects with a construction cost of 500 million. But the minister, of course, can declare it to be a major project and the construction cost can be as low as 250 million. And we know in the scale of infrastructure projects in this country that does not a great deal of money. So their parliament to scrutinise these agreements, to hold them in account, is removed, and the government's capacity to introduce flexibility as defined by employers is increased dramatically. This bill increases penalties for the underpayment of wages, and that's a good thing. But the government, of course, is very deceptive. It does not define what dishonesty is. It does not, in fact, provide the protections that it asserts it is alluding to. These measures in no way are planned for recovery and no way 
protect us Thank from you. the precariat and the undermining of working conditions in Australia. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to begin my contribution on this debate on the government's uh, changes to workplace laws uh, with a story. Uh, a story of a guy in central Queensland who I've got to know pretty well uh, through my travels in central Queensland over the last few years. Uh, his name is Chad, and Chad's a coal miner. Chad is a coal miner employed as a casual by, through a labour hire company by a major multinational mining company. And Chad has been treated as a casual and paid as a casual and employed as a casual by that mining company and that labour hire firm, despite the fact that for over seven years he has worked the same roster week after week, month after month, year after year. If any objective person was to look at Chad's employment and recognise that he works the same shifts week after week, month after month, year after year, they would say that he is a permanent employee. And if, if Chad and the thousands of colleagues he has who are employed on the same basis were treated as permanent employees, they would get job security, they would get annual leave, they would get sick leave, uh, they would be able to get a home loan, they would be able to take a day off when a member of their family was unwell and needed attention. Uh, but of course, Chad and his colleagues, who are employed as casuals, despite really being permanent employees, get none of those benefits. Chad and every casual employee, whether they be coal miners or in any other industry, who are really permanent workers, don't get job security. They don't get annual leave. They don't get sick leave. They don't get a whole host of other benefits that permanent workers get. And of course, they can't even go and get a home loan from a bank because they're a casual employee and banks don't lend that, those sorts of sums of money to casual employees. Now, Chad is just one example of what I have come to learn is an epidemic of casualisation across regional Queensland in the mining industry. It's not just in the mining industry, and I'll come to that shortly, but certainly something that has dramatically changed in the mining industry in Queensland over recent years is the explosion of casualisation and labour hire at the expense of permanent employment. Major mining companies in this country now employ the majority of their workforce as casuals through labour hire firms. It's been done as a cost-cutting exercise. The mining companies don't deny that. Now, it's important that mining companies make profits. It's important that mining companies employ people. But it is a tragedy that in recent years, on this government's watch, we have seen that occur at the expense of coal miners and workers in general. To give you one other example, uh, two other miners who I've met, Simon and Ron. Simon is the permanent employee, paid the EBA rate of pay, has permanent employment, has job security, has all those types of leave benefits that come with permanent employment. And his colleague, Ron, who does exactly the same work as him, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year, out, year in, year out, Ron's employed through a labour hire firm as a casual. And Ron doesn't get the permanent employment, he doesn't get the job security, he doesn't get the leave, he doesn't get all of those benefits of permanent employment. And this isn't just some academic exercise. This has real-life consequences for people. As I say, they miss out on all of those benefits. They can't get loans. It puts immense stress on their families because they never know from one day to the next whether they're actually going to have a job. Because that's one of the consequences of casual employment is that you don't have job security. You can be terminated by your employer uh, at very short notice, without the usual redundancy pay that permanent employees get, so you're in constant fear and your family is in constant stress. It is a disgrace that this casualisation epidemic has exploded across regional Queensland on this government's watch. Now we see 
day after day, members of this government from the LNP in Queensland say how much they love coal, dress up like coal miners, parade themselves around as if they are the friend of coal miners. In some, you're right, Senator uh, Ayres. Some of them, including Senator Canavan, actually even go as far as wiping a bit of dust on their face to impersonate coal miners. But every time they're actually given the opportunity to do something to help coal miners or other workers who are trapped in casualisation, they squib it. Because every single time they line up with big business who are making profits at the expense of ordinary working people. And this legislation that we're dealing with today is just another example of that. Have you ever noticed that the only time we ever hear anything about casualisation from this government is in the run-up to an election? Pretty much, I've, I've been here about five years. It has gone quick. Uh, but the, sadly, what has been going on forever is this government's continued neglect of casual workers over the time that I've been here. Now, we put a lot of pressure on the government over casualisation, as did our friends in the union movement, as did workers themselves, to fix this casualisation epidemic in the run-up to the last election. And because we put so much pressure on the government, they promised in the run-up to the last election to fix casualisation. I remember all the press releases, the press conferences, the advertisements with you know, George Christensen, Michelle Landry, Matt Canavan, Ken O'Dowd, all saying they were going to fix casualisation in the run-up to the last election. And here we are, nearly two years after that election, and they still haven't done anything about it. They did the same thing in the run-up to the Queensland state election last year. They were silent for a year and a half after the federal election, having said they were going to fix it. But in the weeks leading up to the Queensland election, they were going to fix it again. And they brought in this legislation, which not only doesn't fix casualisation, but it actually makes things worse. It actually opens the door for more casualisation of our workplaces. Now, I've spoken quite a bit about the effect of casualisation and labour hire in the mining industry. Uh, because that is one of the most egregious examples that we've seen in recent times. Uh, but this is something that is affecting so many different parts of our economy and so many different types of workplaces. We see it in security, we see it in aged care, we see it, I'm sure, in the trucking industry, Senator Stirl, we see it in retail, we see it throughout our workplaces, this explosion of casualisation, insecure work, labour hire, with people being exploited. And this government continues to do nothing about it. I well remember uh, a, a particular day uh, in the last term of this government where I was in, I'm pretty sure it was Rockhampton, certainly regional Queensland, one day talking to coal miners about labour hire and casualisation and how hard their lives were as a result of it. I got on a plane to head home back to Brisbane to do a function with Commonwealth public servants mostly working in places like Centrelink and the tax office. And you know what their number one complaint was? It was the fact that this government was moving so many of their colleagues onto labour hire and casual work. So in the spate of one day, you can go from two different parts of Queensland, talk to blue-collar workers in the mining industry and white-collar workers in the Commonwealth Public Servant Service, and this, the same complaint they both had was about the fact that they couldn't get permanent work because there had been such a push towards casualisation and labour hire of their work. Now, we often hear from the apologists for casualisation uh, that that's OK, people choose to be casuals, people get compensated as casuals, they get a loading, all that kind of thing. But I don't know where they're getting their figures from, because I invite any of those people to come with me next time I go and speak to miners in central Queensland or to public servants in Brisbane or anywhere else in between. Because what they will tell you is that despite the fact they miss out on the benefits of permanent employment, the leave, uh, the regular hours, the job security, they actually get paid less than the permanent workers, even after their casual loading is applied. So this claim that casual workers are fairly compensated for missing out on the benefits of permanency through their casual loading is absolute rubbish. I have met people working in the mining industry who are being paid less on an hourly basis than the permanent workers they work right next door to, and they're still missing out on all the benefits of permanency. Now, this is, of course, 
a tragedy for the individuals and their families concerned, but it's also a tragedy for regional economies. And at a point when we know the economy is in very weak shape, when consumer confidence is very low, what we actually need is a workplace system that gives people confidence that from day to day their job is going to be safe, that their wages are going to increase, that they'll be fairly treated at work. Because if people have that confidence, they're more likely to take out a loan. They're more likely to go and spend money in the local shops and businesses. And you know what? That creates more jobs. But instead, people are terrified of losing their jobs, of not being able to pay off their loans. They rein in their spending, which means we don't have those jobs created in, in local economies. So this, this system that the government is presiding over, which will be made worse by this bill, actually th threatens to prolong the pain that we are experiencing through this recession, and it threatens to rein in the recovery that we all so desperately want to see happen. Now, I have focused a lot on casualisation in my contribution because it is something uh, that is a, of great concern to many workers, but there are a whole range of other changes that are being proposed in this bill as well, which will also make people's in employment more insecure, rein in their confidence, cut their pay and take away conditions that have been hard won over many years. And again, those changes, whether we're talking about changes to Greenfields agreements, uh, to uh, flexible work directions, to how enterprise bargaining is achieved, all of those things combined are on the wish list for big business that will actually only harm the average working person and will be another impediment to trade unions doing their job of working with workers to try to achieve better pay and conditions. And again, just to give you one example, back to casualisation, what these laws do, these laws that this government says will fix casualisation, what they actually will do is leave it in the hands of employers to choose whether someone is going to be employed as a casual or as a permanent. At least under the current system, an employee has the opportunity to go to a tribunal to get a fair hearing as to whether they're actually a casual or a permanent or not. But these laws would enshrine power and entrench power in the hands of employers to make the decision at the point of employment about whether someone is a permanent or a casual or not. And even if an employer decides, OK, Johnny, you're going to be a casual, when the facts are that they're a permanent, Johnny's going to be employed as a casual and there's nothing he's going to be able to do about it because that's what these laws will do. And in addition, what these laws do is effectively leave it up to employers to decide whether someone will be able to convert to permanency after 12 months or not. The government's out there saying that this is going to give employee, casual employees the right to convert to permanency after 12 months. What they don't tell you is that the decision is still left to the employer as to whether they will employ, convert someone to permanent or not. And it basically takes away all appeal rights that an employee has. An employee whose employer unfairly turns them down when they ask to be made permanent can go off to the Fair Work Commission, but only to get conciliation of the matter. They can't, the Fair Work Commission can't actually make a decision that someone is a, is a permanent or should be made permanent. And the only option that a casual employee has to, to enforce their rights is to trot off to the federal court. Well, I don't know about you, but I haven't found many casual coal miners, public servants, retail assistants, hospitality workers who've got a lazy fifty, seventy, a hundred thousand dollars sitting around in their pockets to spend on barristers to fight out a matter in the federal court. So these laws do nothing to fix the casualisation crisis that we've seen across Queensland and across the country. And in fact, what they will do is make things worse. So Labor has been very clear from the moment we saw this bill that we will be opposing these laws because what they will do is actually entrench casualisation in the workforce. They will see people's pay cut and conditions taken away from them. At the very time that we want to see people spending more in our local economies and creating more jobs and having more secure employment. And there's one group who still hasn't shared their hand about what they're going to do on this legislation and it's Senator Hanson and her colleague Senator Roberts in One Nation. Now this legislation is a very big test for One Nation. They spend a lot of time rolling around Queensland talking about how much they support battlers. Well this will be a test. 
Will they vote with Labor to stop this legislation which will cut workers' pay, or will they side with the LNP and back in big business? Thank you, Senator Watts. Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. On this day last year, Australia had recorded its 100th confirmed case of COVID-19. There were recorded coronavirus cases in every state and territory. There have been COVID-19 deaths in New South Wales and in Western Australia. The first, ultimately inadequate, stimulus package had been announced, and the first public health restrictions were coming into effect. Australia's case numbers were rising in line with comparable countries uh, like the United States and the United Kingdom. Our trend followed Italy's trend, who had just entered their lockdown. And when the isolation measures were announced, millions of Australian workers lost their jobs—700,000 in the first week of April. Those who could prepared to work from home, and still millions of Australian workers went to work. They were the essential workers, the ones who we could not function without. And every morning, many of them went into, dangerous, uh, into a dangerous and uncertain world. Health workers, doctors, nurses, paramedics, the receptionists, the porters, the cleaners, they risked exposure to the virus to treat those who were already infected. It was dangerous and important work, and it still is. In January, the International Council of Nurses announced that globally 2,262 nurses died from coronavirus in 2020, and yet they went to work. Some of them came out of retirement in order to staff hospitals. We saw that same courage in so many types of workers in those early months. Teachers, supermarket transport and warehouse workers, aged care workers, cleaners, food manufacturing workers, food manufacturing workers like the ones on strike at McCormick's today, who haven't had a pay rise for five years and the company is opportunistically using these current bargaining laws to strip away their rights and entitlements and conditions. There was a promise that was made by the Parliament of Australia in that moment of fear and uncertainty that, as a nation, we would rebuild in a way which looked after those workers who had looked after us. This bill is a repudiation of that promise. It is a broken promise for Australian workers. It is especially a broken promise to those workers, mostly women, to all of those workers who stood by us during the pandemic. If it's passed, it will make workers' jobs less secure. If it's passed, it will mean many workers are subject to pay cuts and less secure work. It will casualise some permanent workers' jobs and create new loopholes for employers to exploit and put competitive pressure on those good employers in a race to the bottom in Australian workplaces to drive their own wages and conditions down. And it will further entrench a bargaining system that is sclerotic and failing, that denies workers the right to be effectively represented and to win the pay and conditions they deserve. Minister Porter, the architect of this piece of legislation, is conspicuously absent this week. He's availed himself of the paid leave that this bill would deny to many millions of Australian workers. In his speech commending this bill to the other chamber, the minister concluded, he said, this bill removes the barriers that stifle the job growth of today and limits the job creation of tomorrow. To the Morrison government, measures to give workers a fair say in their conditions of work are an impediment. To the Morrison government, Measures to ensure job security and protections for fair collective bargaining are a problem for employers. The underlying assumption of this bill is that the recovery will be built on an increasingly insecure labour market, on low wages and less secure jobs. 
That's not a plan to rebuild the Australian economy. That is a plan to entrench the problems that were already present in our labour market, that were driving higher levels of casualisation, that were producing more bad jobs into the economy instead of producing good jobs. For one thing, Australia's experience, the bad experiences during the coronavirus pandemic, were in no small part driven by problems in our labour market. The leaks from quarantine facilities that have come from insecure workers forced to take multiple jobs just to make ends meet. And particularly in Melbourne, spread by casual workers who were forced into an impossible choice between their own family's financial security uh, and taking appropriate public health measures in the public interest. It was this combination of insecure workers working multiple jobs that brought the virus into our nursing homes. And yet the government's plan does nothing to deal with insecure work. The problems of insecure work are well documented. It's not as if we don't know what they are. Casual workers can't make long-term financial decisions. Many of them can't buy a house. Uh, it expands the gender pay gap. Women workers are more likely to be casual workers. And it does mean that businesses fail to invest in skills and the long-term real productivity gains that this country needs are not made. Real economic recovery doesn't come from cutting wages and it doesn't come from holding back real wage growth. A real plan for recovery would come from investing in Australian workers. A real plan for recovery would understand that job security is a critical component of our long-term prosperity, all of our long-term prosperity. A bargaining system should encourage employers to negotiate fairly. It should ensure that workers' interests are properly represented. It should ensure that workers solve these problems in partnership with their employers, on an equal footing. It should allow labour market institutions to deal with the real productivity problems that plague our economy. It should deliver real, tangible economic benefits for everybody. It's not just about fairness. It's just not about ensuring that Australian workers have the democratic rights that they deserve. That should be their birthright in this country. It's about building a better type of economy, about lifting productivity about creating more good jobs. And this plan does nothing to achieve any of those objectives. Last month, Anthony Albanese offered a very different vision of work and dealing with insecure work in the economy. Job security explicitly inserted into the Fair Work Act. Rights for gig economy workers through the Fair Work Commission. Five dead uh, food delivery workers in Sydney over the course of the last six months. No plan from the government to deal with that question. Portable entitlements for workers in insecure industries. Casual work properly defined. Uh, a crackdown on cowboy labour hire firms that plague in particular the mining industry. That uh, Senator Canavan and some of these other characters put the Maybelline on, pretend that they are mining workers, wander around in the high vis confect an interest in the jobs of mining industry workers, but when it counts, they are on the side of the worst kind of labour hire operations that discriminate against ordinary workers and put them uh, in a very tough position indeed. A cap on back-to-back -back contracts for the same role. More secure public sector jobs and government contracts to companies and organisations that offer secure work. On top of that, a real plan to deal with the gender pay gap. We have a very different vision of the economy, and what is being shown this week is that there are two very divergent visions of the future of the Australian economy and Australian jobs. Firstly, Scott Morrison and Mr Porter's sclerotic, narrow, pea-hearted vision of a race to the bottom on wages and conditions on a low-wage, low-road future for Australian workers, or Anthony Albanese and Labor's vision of lifting everybody up 
of producing more good jobs, of having a real strategy to lift wages and conditions and to improve productivity in Australian workplaces, a vision that keeps its promise to those essential workers who stood by us during the pandemic. It delivers fairness and prosperity to everybody. Now, there have been critical failures of leadership from this government when it comes to the economy and the public health response. This government had to be dragged to measures to stop mass redundancies. This government left it to the states to run quarantine, blamed them when it went wrong, undermined it. I remember seeing senators from here, from Western Australia and Queensland, bellowing out about opening the borders. It was Scott Morrison, Mr Morrison, the Prime Minister, who teamed up with Clive Palmer. Indeed, he can take credit for the Western Australian election result. He should take credit for the Western Australian election result because it was his decision to team up with that plutocrat, absolutely in the interests of Clive Palmer and Mr Morrison, to undermine the public health response in Western Australia. And if they had succeeded, and every Western Australian knows it, the Western Australian economy would have been decimated as well as the public health response. The truth is there is no economic recovery without a public health recovery. The states got it right and Mr Morrison got it wrong at every juncture last year. The end of March, there are two important events that occur. One, the JobKeeper program ends. And the second, we will get to see whether Mr Morrison's promise to the people of Australia that four million vaccines would be delivered will, will really come to fruition. We'll see whether the four million vaccines that Mr Morrison promised have been delivered around the country. Why on earth are we cutting the JobKeeper program when we know that will cost at least 110,000 jobs? Why on earth are we cutting that program if Mr Morrison can't deliver on his promise to Australian workers and Australian people? And why on earth would Senators Hanson and Roberts and anybody on the crossbench vote for this rotten piece of legislation that will make workers' jobs less secure? not more secure. We should be legislating in this place to make people's lives better, to make people's lives safer, to lift people's wages and conditions. And instead, the miserable vision that this government has is a bit of tinkering to create a few more loopholes to make it easier for bad employers to work their way through the system to undermine wages and conditions to put pressure on good employers to do the wrong thing in order to compete and survive. Instead, instead of doing what we should be doing, Mr Morrison is breaking the promise that he made to those workers who got us through the recovery. And the strongest symbol of that, of course, is the fact that the Minister for Industrial Relations is not here to push this package through the parliament and make the arguments. Um, the, the Prime Minister wants this chamber to pass significant changes to our industrial relations system, while there are serious questions about whether the Minister for Industrial Relations is indeed fit to hold his own job. The Prime Minister wants this chamber to pass a bill condemning more workers to insecure work that erodes their right to negotiate better wages and conditions while the relevant minister is on paid leave. The Prime Minister wants this chamber to pass a bill that will likely extend the gender pay gap in a week when thousands of Australian women have been marching for equality. And one of the demands indeed of that, those marches, one of the things that's been squarely on the government over the course of the last 12 months, if they are really interested in people's rights, in Australian workplaces in, is dealing with the Respect at Work report, launched more than 12 months ago. Three out of 55 recommendations partially dealt with. 
Well, if that's a measure of the commitment of this government, if this bill is a measure of this commitment of this government to better jobs, no wonder our labour market performance is deteriorating so Thank poorly. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I rise to make a contribution on this very important piece of legislation. And there's, a, there's a lot of perceptions out in the community about how difficult it is for people to understand the lawmaking that goes on in this place. But I want to make a few things pretty clear to the ordinary Australians who vote and send us here and expect us to stand up for them, especially when the government's really going to have a good go at them. This government has created this bill called an omnibus bill. And, and it's an omnibus bill, and it's got bus on the end of it. If you understand what a bus is, it carries an awful lot of people. Well, this legislation is carrying an awful lot of legislation in it, and it's going to affect every Australian. It's very significant. And instead of having a long timeline for careful consideration of the legislation that they're advancing, this government squashed the amount of time, limited the amount of time for due scrutiny of this bill. And I know that the crossbench, who deal with Labor senators in good faith on many, many issues, will be paying attention to this debate. And they were right when they made it clear on the weekend that they wouldn't support the government's legislation this week. And they were right not only because it's such a bad piece of legislation, which I will get to, but because of the hasty the unseemly haste with which the government has tried to push this through. Instead of allowing hearings right across this country for Australians to participate in, this government forced us to hold only three days of hearings. The committee was able to travel to Townsville, to Adelaide and then have a hearing in Canberra. People were on, a, on the clock, half hour, rolling them in, one after the other, not able to even have their say. The committee had to apologise to nurses who came to give evidence in Adelaide because they weren't actually allowed to give their statements, because there wasn't adequate time allocated. That is the contempt that we see from this government about due process. And the people of Australia are waking up to it on many, many fronts. But this is not just an idea out there that might or might not affect you. This is something that's going to affect your business. If you're a decent business person employing people in your local community, you're going to be caught in this trap that the government is setting where the changes that they're advancing are being advanced by people who are acting in bad faith against the workers and the good small businesses of this country. So I want to put on the record right at the beginning of my speech what Ms Pulliton, a nurse in Adelaide, had to say of this bill. She read it. She got across the detail. She stood up on behalf of nurses who were on the front line. She came to Adelaide, and this is much, as much as she got out. I would say of this legislation, it's a real kick in the guts. Other people got to stay home and work from home and not have the risk of taking this infectious disease, referring to COVID, home to their families. That's something real we had to prepare for. I had to prepare my husband and my kids and say, if there's an outbreak, I'm not coming home to give it to you. Mum has to stay somewhere else. That was a real fear we had to face. And we still showed up. This is what she says about this bill. Cutting shifts and making life harder for us when we're going to have to put in all that extra effort. And when it does affect our residential aged care facilities, that's the time when everyone has to stand up. And the everyone that needs to stand up today that can prevent this government from advancing this bill in a way that will negatively impact on Australian workers and small businesses is the crossbench who are sitting on the benches here in this chamber. They have the capacity today to slow this bill, to halt this bill, to send the government back, to do better consultation other than three short days on legislation that will linger long and have a profound impact on Australians. But we see that they've got form on this because every time the Liberal National Party gets an inch of wiggle room on industrial relations, they will try to ram through anti-worker provisions. As soon as they got control of the Senate, there were people who remember in 2004, what did they push through then? They rammed through work choices. Indeed, they did. Senator Stirl, Senator Stirl remembers it well. One of the most repressive and cruel blows to workers outside of the Depression. 
Now, with everyone focused on a pandemic and a, vo a, a vaccine rollout that is really very problematic, disgraced Minister Christian Porter's omnibus bill is put before us. And it, this is a Frankenstein amalgam of anti-union provisions meant deliberately to crush wages, to crush wages at a time when workers absolutely need them to grow. Now, the bill as it stands for the debate is a little change from what it was just a few weeks ago, when the last version of the bill sought to exempt uh, enterprise bargaining agreements from a test called the Better Off Overall Test. That was so bad, because it was really the worse off overall test that they wanted to put in, the crossbench stood up to them at the time and said, forget it, that's just got to go. And the government, under pressure from the crossbench, removed that. Will the crossbench have the power to halt this bill today? And that is what I encourage them to do. The government's bill, in a time of wage crisis, if it comes through, if it gets through this House today, will push wages further down. The government's plans are actually revealed in this bill. And that is a plan for fewer full-time jobs. And they call it, in all of their media, and they'll speak about it as flexibility. Well, flexibility that only goes one way is a form of abuse. Flexibility for workers, flexibility for business owners needs to be something that's negotiated in good faith. And nothing about this bill has been undertaken in good faith. Everything about it has been a stitch up by very, very uh, powerful advocates of the largest businesses in this country against decent, hardworking sole traders, small businessmen and women, and the workers of this nation who keep things on the road. The government ludicrously, ludicrously pretend that this bill will allow a path to permanent conversion for a casual worker. But in fact, what it does is is the exact opposite. It gives the employer a veto over that request. And we had considerable evidence about this. So if you're a casual worker and you definitely want to be a casual worker, it, sometimes it does suit people's lives. That's, that's not a bad thing. But if you're a casual worker who can't get a car loan because you're a casual worker, if you're a casual worker who can't get a housing loan because you're a casual worker, and you decide you'd like to become permanent, do you know what this government's cooked up for you? A few magic words, you know, give them the old razzle-dazzle so they can say that they're giving you casual conversion. Mr, Mr. Morrison, the, the master of spin and show, the showman. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, the reality is your employer under this legislation will actually be able to say, there's a pattern of work. If I don't really want to have to offer them casual work, I'll just change their pattern of work. And then in that last six months, they haven't worked a regular pattern. Sorry, not eligible. And the definition of casual is entirely really up to the employer. They say you're casual, you're casual, you're stuck with it. That is not an advance of security for the Australian people. That is not good business practice. It's not good for the genuinely great small business employers who know their employees by name, who pay the right wages, who want to do the right thing. And they were on the record in these committee hearings about the need for a very, very different view of the conversion from casual status to full-time work. I acknowledge that this bill does address one issue that is relevant to some states, and that is the crime of wage theft, which is absent in federal legislation. But again, so close. They, they look like they're doing the right thing. But look just behind the curtain, a bit like the Wizard of Oz. You pull it back, and what's really going on with the machine? Well, behind the scenes, what this really means is for Queenslanders, workers in Queensland and workers in Victoria, that this legislation will water down the protections they have to get their wages back, their wages stolen from them by unscrupulous employers. 
stolen wages, wages taken from Australian workers. They've worked the shifts, they've done the hours, they've showed up, they've provided the service. They've done their part of the deal. And this government says, we need to do something about wage theft, but oh my God, let's make sure we don't do it as well as Victoria or Queensland. They've literally got the template of how to do it right, and they take those rights away from the workers of Queensland and Victoria if this bill passes today. So again, I say to the crossbench, do not let this government get away with this absolute con job. It is a con job with regard to protection of workers' wages. And I'm sure I had a great conversation with Senator Gallagher, who's in here, who may be making a contribution very shortly, about who's robbed when wages are robbed. It's not just the individual, and I'm sure he'll make more comments about that himself. I, re I read an article just the other day, and people are seeing this. We saw the 7-Eleven debacle. But Adele Ferguson said there's another wage theft case involving truck drivers in Victoria. She notes in the article that in the past month alone, 10 security businesses, a chat time bubble tea, a toy retailer and an IT service business have all been pinged for the by the regulator for a range, a various set of arrangements to take people's wages. In Victoria, on the 1st of July this year, that Victorian legislation comes into effect. So is that why the government are so hell-bent on pushing this through this week? Do they want to trump Victorians who fought for this fantastic piece of legislation for years and years and years? Is that the idea? Get the crossbench on board, look like you've done a little bit of work this week, and totally do over the Victorian and Queensland states and everyone who lives and works there. Is that what the rush is? Because if that's the reason for the rush, there's another reason why the crossbench should say, hold the phone, guys. We are not going to advance with this today. There are so many reasons why this bill should not be passed. At a time when everyone, everyone from unions and the Reserve Bank to prominent business leaders are clamouring for the government to do anything, anything to grow wages, the government has introduced this bill that will cut wages. Deloitte Access Economics reports that even on our current trajectory, Australian workers could wait up to five years for wage growth. And if this bill passes, it'll be even longer before you get a wage rise. If the government was really serious about helping struggling businesses, they wouldn't be pushing this through today. They would be instead advancing something to support the extension of JobSeeker, especially for select industries that are still struggling from lockdowns and the pandemic. They would be keeping consumers spending, not rashly ending the supplements for JobSeeker, which have lifted thousands and JobKeeper that have lift, lifted thousands of Australians out of poverty for the first time in years. I know that there are nine public health experts from the Australian National University in Canberra who wrote about this bill. And the, the terms that they use to describe it is it is an immediate threat to public health. That's how they describe the bill that this government is trying to get the crossbench to sign on to today. Their submission notes that the, Australia has one of the highest rates of individuals without leave entitlements. I love Australia. I'm so proud to be Australian, even though I am sort of celebrating St Patrick's Day today. The reality is we have in our country problems. Leave entitlements in Australia amongst the lowest in the OECD, estimates ranging from 35 to, uh, 25 to 37 per cent of the workforce without them. I'm sick and tired of the attacks on workers from this, co this coalition government. If it isn't an attack on their democratic representatives in the union movement, it's an attack on Australians' wages and conditions. It's a Neanderthal view from the, those opposite that the only way to achieve economic growth, the only way to achieve national prosperity is to pay workers less, to make them work more hours, give them more insecure conditions. It is a recipe for a disaster for this country, not just for individuals, but for the whole fabric of society. 
We should all be sharing in the wealth of this nation instead of concocting through this omnibus bill some ridiculous plan to disadvantage Australian workers, the people on whom this country relies to lift, to lift us during pandemics, to lift us every day when they go to work. They need security. They don't need this bill. They need leave. They don't need this Thank bill. You, Senator they don't Neil, need this government. Your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. And, uh, I too rise to make a contribution uh, against the uh, passing of this bill. <clears throat> and it was a time, uh, Madam Deputy President, when the conservative side of the chamber was much more forthright and open. And the Honourable, Honourable Peter Reith, uh, I think, gave a speech at the Perth Yacht Club where he said, I know whose side I'm on. I'm on the side of business. Small business, medium-sized business and big businesses. And we will do what's necessary for those businesses. And I think that that's what's remiss in this uh, debate. I listened to the contribution from Senator Bragg and others, uh, almost as if they're the worker's friend. Far be it from the worker's friend. And I wanted to put some economic data on the, on the record before I um, you know, hop into a bit of uh, criticism of the other side. <clears throat> on Thursday, the, uh, well, I'll just start at the absolute beginning. <clears throat> the share of the national income going to Australian workers <clears throat> has been steadily declining since the 1970s, with the profit share increasing. But the Labor share has suddenly fallen below 50 per cent for the first time since 1959. Obviously, the trend is exacerbated by the COVID-19 recession. And on Thursday, the Bureau of Statistics released its June quarter gross domestic product data, and the data showed economic activity across April, May and June shrank by 7 per cent, the biggest quarterly contraction in 60 years. But the ABS noted something else. It said company profits jumped a massive 14.9 per cent in this quarter. And while the total wages and salaries bill for workers, categorised as compensation for workers, fell by a record 2.5 per cent. So that meant that the labour share of the income has fallen below 50 per cent for the first time in decades, while profits have hit record levels. And why would wages and salaries decline when the government has been provided billion, providing billions of dollars for JobKeeper payments? Uh, Mr Pickering, an, an economist at Indeed Hiring Lab and a former Reserve Bank official, told the ABC the emergency subsidies to businesses had helped. What's basically happened is there's been a range of sectors that have reported quite significant increase in profits, largely due to subsidies received by the government uh, job keeper. At the same time, we've had a significant de decline in employment, which is putting downward pressure on compensation of employees, wages and salaries. Harry said the large shift in income share between labour and profit in the June quarter should only be temporary. It should unwind over the uh, coming quarters. Mr Eastlake, Saul Eastlake, a very familiar name in economic circles, and now Vice-Chancellor at the University of Tasmania, said the noticeable shift in income share in the June quarter was largely a statistical artefact. It's because a whole lot of people stopped working and had their income replaced by government benefits, so profits represented a bigger share of what was left. From one perspective, you could say JobKeeper propped up profits. In a way, they did, because it hadn't been for JobKeeper, profits would have been a lot lower. But it's basically showing that a whole lot of employees, and hence their wage payments, were removed from the equation. Mr Eastlake said there is an important phenomenon to consider when thinking about this issue. And he said we have to keep in mind what is happening to low-paid workers this year. What is happening to low-paid workers? And the data shows an average non-farm compensation uh, per employee actually increased by 3.3 per cent in the June quarter and by 5 per cent from a year earlier. And that was the fastest year on growth in, in that measurement since March 2012. Now, how do you explain the total wages going up by 2.5 per cent and the average non-farm compensation going up? 
The answer is it was disproportionately low income and low paid workers who have lost their jobs this year. So what is left to trend to tend What's, so what's left tend to be higher paid people, even though those higher paid people may have taken pay cuts, the impact has been more than outweighed by the culling of workers at the bottom end of the scale. So the average income goes up while the overall income goes down. And the punchline, when we get to it, is fairly straightforward. Australia has been sheltered uh, by the mining boom, but no longer. The fact over the last six years in Australia especially, over the last 20 years in other countries and over the last 40 years in the United States, there has been a steady shift of the distribution of income from labour to capital. So if we have a predicament like that, where the share of labour has consistently been declining for a number of years and has now fallen below 50 per cent of income, disproportionately shareholders and companies are taking the lion's share of the national income. So what you end up is with low inflation, clearly not a bad thing, but stagnating wage growth. And in that environment, in that environment where people can't get a pay rise at the moment, where can't get an increase in hours at the moment, where some of them can't get jobs at the moment, we have an omnibus bill designed to help them. Well, I think I've been around industrial relations long enough to know that the other side of the chamber has never put a bill up, never put a bill up designed to help workers get a pay rise. And if they're honest, they would say that. There's never been a case where that side of the chamber has put forward any sort of legislation which is designed to get people a greater share of their labour. It just doesn't happen. And Peter Reith was on enough to say that. And that honesty is lacking on that side of the chamber now because people are saying, oh, look, we're helping you. They're not helping people into higher, more secure, better paid employment. They're not doing that at all. They're making it easier for employers to spread what meagre amount of money they want to spend on labour across a greater number of people. And we end up exactly like the United States, where you know, if you don't get a tip uh, and you're working in a bar or a restaurant, you basically can't pay your rent. You can't pay your outgoings. And you know, I don't think the other side of the chamber is innovative enough or, uh, or smart enough, basically, to come up with a new scheme, with a new uh, paradigm. They're basically taking an old, uh, well-trodden path in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in other parts of the world, and bringing it into Australia and making Australia a poorer place for working people. And if they were honest, that's what they would say. That's their job to look after capital and you lot look after labour. But what's happened in terms of looking after labour, they've had 12 years of the Howard government, probably another seven years of this government, to make it extremely difficult, extremely difficult for organised labour to actually operate. And in the meantime, as uh, Senator Neil alluded to, they're actually ripping off Australia because, you know, there are submissions to the wage theft inquiry which say that the amount of foregone taxation revenue from wage theft would probably be approaching nine billion dollars to the national economy, and the amount of foregone uh, contributions tax in super is also quite a large figure. The taxation office is on record of saying, you know, what it is. Coincidentally, the taxation officer is the one who is charged with collecting it. Look, I know much has been foregone, but I don't make any steps to collect it. You know, if this side of, uh, if this government and the other side of the chamber had half, a, uh, half the acumen they profess to possess, they would stick on another thousand tax collectors, because I think the, the figures are quite simple. That for every dollar you spend on a tax collector. The return to the government is six dollars, five to six dollars. So you know another thousand people in the taxation department, chatting people who are not paying superannuation and therefore not paying contributions tax, would be beneficial. Another uh, group of people looking at those who systematically underpay uh, wages, we would have more taxation revenue. And we're not talking about mum and dad and two trucks or mum and dad and a small business in a 
landscaping area. We're talking about huge corporations, Woolworths owning up to $300 million worth of underpayment. $300 million of underpayment. How much was foregone in the taxation area there? How much was foregone in the superannuation area there? But no, the coalition will come up with a fair work amendment supporting Australia's jobs economic recovery bill, which basically I think will mean if you haven't got a job, you can probably get one, but it's not going to be as well paid as the one you lost. And by the way, we'll determine whether you're actually going to get overtime or not based on who's willing to work. And if you're starving or if you've got bills to pay and you want overtime, you won't get it. But if someone wants to continue on ordinary pay, they will. These are disgraceful things. Eight-year agreements. <clears throat> Eight-year agreements. Who's going to know what is happening in terms of the CPI and the like in eight years' time? And by the way, you won't get a chance to negotiate that because that'll be done if it's a $250 million investment. That'll be done before you get there. So by the time you get there, it'll be, oh, great news, we've got an eight-year agreement here. You ask what the wage rise is and they say stuff all. You know, well, you might get CPI, you might get half a percent. But anyway, that's nothing to do with you. It's already sorted out. How do you change it? Can't. Can't. So, you know, this is a prescription for what is a dire situation where we should be trying to recover people into proper, full time, secure work, reasonably paid, not create another underclass of people in Australia who will never see permanent employment. And there are many people, who, you know, young people at the moment, who've never had the luxury of a permanent job. They've never had it. They can get 16, 17, 22 hours, 25 hours, but they don't get a permanent job. And then in other areas of quite reasonable economic activity, you have an inordinate amount of casuals or labour hire people. So once again, those people don't see a permanent opportunity coming forward. But you know, the coalition's uh, putting up the smoke screen, in my view, that this legislation is coming along to help reinvigorate the economy. But if, if the share of uh, labour in national income continues to decline, we end up exactly like the United States, where you have a lot of people who, since the 70s, haven't seen their share of the wealth of their great country increase, which hasn't been good for the economy. I mean, America's deficits would, you know, you, you can't count the zeros on the end of it. And Australia was different. And I suppose because we are different and capital is no different, capital is international, uh, we're attracting the attention. But I wish that uh, those on the other side would at least come to the argument with clean hands. And, you know, the ACTU and other parties sat down with the Honourable Christian Porter and uh, the Honourable uh, Josh Frydenberg and you know, attempted to resolve areas of concern. But in my view, the whole lot should be just opposed absolutely. There are no redeeming features in here which will affect or uh, redress what is a national shame that workers who carry this country, cleaners, garbage men, all of the people who do all of those jobs we take for granted are not getting a fair share of the national income. And this Bill will make sure that that never happens, in my view. It, never, it will never happen. They'll be consigned to insecure, low paid, no hope for you know, the foreseeable future. And unless the, uh, the electorate changes and votes in a, a different government, there'll be no respite. And actually, this is a culmination of decades of attacks on working people. And we're now starting to see, in economic measuring terms, the fact that income is dropping below 50 per cent of national income. Now, I'd prefer an economy where we were growing through productivity and economic activity, where workers were getting an increasing share of the national income, because workers spend their money. Workers do not put it in a tin and dig a hole in the garden or the Caymans Islands or seek to avoid tax. There's no, there's no seeking to avoid tax if you're a wages and salary earner. 
you know, you earn your money, tax goes to the appropriate place, super goes to the appropriate place, you're contributing fully to the economy. And if we were to take a view that if we paid that sector correctly, we gave them more freedom to bargain, uh, the ability to increase their wages and contribute economically, they would educate their families, they would contribute all around in the community, Australia would be a much better place. Because I don't want to see the low wage inequality that exists in the United States. Thank you, Senator Gallacher. Uh, Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. It's my great pleasure to rise and speak on the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2021. And I do want to start by saying I was disappointed to hear of the contribution of Senator Gallagher, who made a number of sweeping statements, many of which were incorrect with no credibility. And unfortunately, it reflects the sad fact that Labor doesn't seem to understand that strong businesses equals more jobs and greater opportunities for Australian workers. And I just want to put on the record, I can only imagine if the member for Maribyrnong, Mr Shorten, had been elected Prime Minister in 2019 with his plan for $387 billion of more taxes imposed on Australians. Uh, just imagine what that would have done to this country. So I reject very strongly the sweeping discredited statements made by Senator Gallagher, which do not in any way represent the truth of the work of our government, of the work of the Morrison government in backing jobs and backing our economic recovery at this very important time. And it is the case that COVID-19 has derailed our economy and forced hundreds of thousands of Australians into the bleakness of unemployment or in being stood down. But despite the darkness of 2020, the lockdowns, the mass closures of businesses, the isolation from our friends and families, one small glimmer of hope remained that all of this would eventually pass and that we would emerge once again a stronger and more resilient nation than before. And already we have seen huge rebounds in our economic recovery, led by Prime Minister Morrison and the many hardworking members of our government. There are a few better indications that this hope has been vindicated than this bill, which manifests the government's commitment to ensuring Australians get back to work quickly and fairly. This bill makes a number of balanced and sensible changes to the Fair Work Act, which will stimulate jobs growth and boost the economy. It provides much needed certainty to businesses and employees by clearly defining what it means to be a casual employee, and it gives eligible casual employees a pathway to permanent full-time or part-time jobs that is guaranteed by statute. The bill gives casual employees the best of both worlds. If they wish to remain casually employed, they can do so and take advantage of the flexibility of casual work. However, and this is probably a, a key issue which Senator Gallagher, Gallagher overlooked, if they wish to transition to full-time or part-time work, they can do that too and take advantage of the stability of these forms of work. So in this way, the bill gives concrete rights to casual employees which respect their employment choices, but it also gives employers the kind of certainty and transparency they need when negotiating agreements with prospective employees. The bill also introduces greater flexibility into awards in sectors of the economy hardest hit by the pandemic, the retail and hospitality industries. Many businesses in these industries have emerged in the wake of the pandemic battered and bruised, but are still fighting hard to keep the, their employees they have and take on new ones. This government is committed to helping these hardworking Australians re-establish them, re themselves in our economy. In keeping with this commitment, the bill 
adapts the government's successful JobKeeper flexibilities concerning duties and location of work, which helped save thousands upon thousands of jobs during the pandemic. So they remain available for employers and employees to whom key awards apply across the hard-hit retail and hospitality sectors. The bill also allows employers and part-time employees in these sectors, which together employ over a third of all casual employees, to work together to agree on additional hours of work for part-time employees who want them. This will help to increase working hours and wages. It will also encourage employers to offer more permanent and secure roles with benefits including paid sick leave over traditionally more flexible forms of employment like casual roles. The bill simplifies and expedites enterprise bargaining by requiring that these agreements be finalised as far as practicable within 21 working days. This means employers can get on with creating jobs and employees can enter the workforce more quickly, easily and fairly. Enterprise agreements pay, on average, 69 per cent per week more than award wages. 69 per cent more than award wages. That is an average of $542 more per week. This shows that the government is serious, not just about getting Australians back to work, but about getting them better working conditions. A big part of the government's plan for Australia's economic recovery is securing investment for greenfields agreements involved in large-scale projects valued at over $500 million or between $250 million and $500 million if they are major projects of national or regional significance. The bill enables the Fair Work Commission to approve greenfields agreements for longer-term major projects by allowing the nominal expiry date to go up to eight years. In this way, the bill ensures that there will be certainty for investors in these large-scale projects and that this will help to create jobs and drive wage growth. So in other words, employers and large-scale projects cannot be held to ransom by protracted and uncertain EBA negotiations, which put jobs at risk. The bill also protects workers on these projects by guaranteeing that any longer term greenfields agreements will include annual pay increases for the nominal life of the agreement. Of course, this government proposes these changes with its eyes wide open. We all know that some businesses, including universities, I might add, have in the past underpaid their workers. In light of this, the bill introduces stronger protections for employees by instituting tougher penalties and orders to deter non-compliance. These are incredibly important measures. Some of these measures include a new criminal offence for dishonest and systematic underpayments of one or more employees with a maximum penalty of four years imprisonment, automatic director disqualification for five years and or a $1.1 million fine or $5.55 million for a body corp corporate. In, the measures also include increasing maximum civil penalties for underpayments, sham contracting, failing to comply with a regulator compliance notice and increasing penalties available under infringement notices. Prohibiting employers from advertising jobs with pay rates below the relevant national minimum wage. And the measures also include clarifying that the courts can make adverse publicity orders where appropriate. The bill encourages businesses to proactively identify and self-disclose and rectify underpayments more quickly and efficiently to ensure employees are repaid as soon as possible. Madam Deputy President, this is a good bill. It is good for the economy. 
It is good for employers. It is good for employees. It is a bill, and these are changes to our law, which are good for all Australians. It is a bill which takes the economic recovery of this country seriously and tackles the challenges of casual employment for both employers and employees head on. It complements the government's other economic measures, such as the $9 billion of tax cuts which have already gone into the pockets of hard-working Australians. It is a bill which implements changes to the law which will see our economy restored and our hope, hopes fulfilled. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Pratt. Madam Deputy President, here we are debating a bill today in the middle of an economic crisis where the government needs to be supporting economic recovery. Instead, we have a bill that makes it easier for employers to cut wages and conditions, which is contrary to our national interest. It's contrary to recovery. On this side of the chamber, in the Labor Party, we stand with working families. We oppose the government's bill that will allow workers to have their pay and conditions cut, leaving them worse off and indeed stymieing our national economic recovery. We have a bill that takes rights off workers, and we need a parliament that supports workers and that does not strip them of these hard-won rights, pay and conditions. We've seen through COVID, we've seen how important it is for us to stand together as a nation to support each other. However, making workers more vulnerable by allowing employers to cut their paying conditions as this bill facilitates is the opposite of that. Our Prime Minister paints himself ostensibly as the fair go PM, yet this bill undermines that fairness. It entrenches insecurity, inequality and a very unfair go for Australian workers. Why does the government want to do this? It won't help economic recovery. It will not help working families. But who does it help? Big businesses who claimed JobKeeper while giving executive bonuses, while sacking staff and enjoying increased profits? Yes, it certainly helps them. The government needs to be on the side of workers, not their mates to make it easier for them to rip them off. A good example is in Qantas, $267 million worth of JobKeeper subsidies to retain its workforce. Now it plans to axe 2,000 jobs. These jobs still exist. They, Qantas still needs baggage handlers, and yet Qantas is outsourcing uh, its work and it's therefore able to pay workers less, owe them less in entitlements and create more insecure jobs. This bill does nothing to address this. It's unbalanced. It favours employer interests in the name of flexibility. This bill weakens fundamental safeguards in our industrial system. It does this on the basis of a theory that employers will only create jobs if labour is cheaper. This ignores fundamental economic theory and the lived reality, indeed in our nation, as economic commentators have shown, that labour demand is in, frankly derived by market demand for goods and services. Lower labour costs do not create jobs. They do not drive productivity. They simply add to profits. Increasing demand, increasing employment, it requires local consumption, consumption that's heavily influenced by confidence. Insecure work and low wages are dampeners on consumer confidence. And again, this bill pushes in the opposite direction. It does nothing to address the problem of insecure work and low wages growth. And I draw attention of this place to the evidence of Ms Cherie Clark an aged care worker whose evidence towards to, to the committee was very moving. She said, because most of my work is so insecure, 
I can only plan to live on my minimum contracted hours, a contract of 16 hours per fortnight. It's not enough to live on. It impacts all aspects of my lifestyle, my health. My budget does not me allow me to choose healthy options. I often miss meals. Paying my car registration or visiting my dentist is a day-to-day -day decision for me. She expressed her distress that she could not afford to assist, assist her own elderly parents or even afford her own housing. She says she couldn't, can't secure a long-term rental lease because she doesn't have an income. She lives in a caravan park. She said, as a low-income worker, I'm not alone here. And what we have in the legislation before us is a how-to guide for corporate lawyers who want to construct employment contracts that casualise not just the existing casual jobs but casualise any job in this nation. Far from being a pathway for conversion to permanency, the impact of this bill, if you look at the detail on any analysis, is the opposite. It's there to manipulate the system and contrive employment offers that lock people into casual employment. I note the government did drop one hurtful amendment to the boot, but I have to say this is not a win. The government dropped this disastrous amendment knowing they would never receive support and to create a facade of compromise. But there's been no compromise. What we have in the bill is a bill that's designed to cut workers' pay and conditions and keep going with the long-term trends of weakening wage growth in our nation. I ask for this place to think about the frontline workers who risked their safety to serve their communities through the pandemic, who ensured Australians still had food on the supermarket shelves, hospitals which had been cleaned and a public transport system which kept running. While some Australians were fortunate enough to work from home, Many workers were not. Frontline workers put their families' safety at risk to support our communities. Frontline and casualised workers. Casualised workers who we see because they can't earn a living wage work in multiple locations, including multiple quarantine hotels during the course of the pandemic. Aged care to transport, work, transport workers. We have many Australians who put themselves on the line for low incomes to ensure that Australians are being looked after. But how does this government seek to thank them? By cutting, cutting their paying conditions. This pandemic has reminded us that our actions affect those around us, that we have a responsibility to keep our fellow Australians safe and looked after. But this government is not only ignoring this by allowing workers' paying conditions to be cut, leaving working families worse off and the economy worse off in its recovery, but it is also allowing frontline workers who have so courageously served our communities to be thanked by having their pay and conditions cut. I have to say this bill also allows wage cuts to be made, but it also makes it easier for wages to be stolen. Now, the government's placed much on its rhetorical uh, weight in here about increased penalties, etc. But the detail of this bill, in terms of how you get back stolen wages, leaves that recovery of stolen wages less likely, not more. I also uh, note a submission signed by nine public health experts from the Australian National University have called this bill a threat to public health. The submission notes that the bill uh, that Australia currently has one of the highest rates of indi individuals without leave entitlements in the OECD. Is uh, you know the new OECD chief Matthias Cormann going to fix this? This bill increases the casualisation of work, the growing number of workers without paid sick leave, and these experts state that their lack of sick leave is a threat to Australia's public health because casual workers, whether they've got the flu, COVID or whatever, they can't afford to take a day off. 62 per cent of all jobs created between May and November 2020 were casual. The majority of jobs 
were casual. Casuals have less rights, less entitlements and less security. The issue of casualisation is already an incredibly difficult and great issue in Australia. This bill doesn't fix it. This bill makes the problem worse. The bill is entitled The Fair Work Amendment, Supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery. Yet it's very clear the jobs it is supporting are casualised jobs, insecure jobs, jobs that make life more difficult for workers and our economic recovery. A recovery that is slow and will be inequitable with these changes. 23 Labor law experts across Australia signed a submission warning that this bill leaves workers worse off. They contradict very clearly the government's claim that it will not facilitate pay cuts. And once again, this government ignores academic experts. I don't have time today to go through all of the important detail in this bill, all of the examples, but the detail is there in the submissions from working people, from academics, from health experts, from people's lived experience, from unions, from the ACTU, from migrant workers and a great many. I want to, in closing, highlight some important issues in relation to Greenfields agreements. An ETU submission detailed a worker, Robert, an, an electrical fitter, mechanic and instrumentation technician. He worked on the Gorgon project on Barrow Island, a $53 billion project. He worked 29 days on, nine days off. It was tough and he saw his depression run wild. Uh, through himself and through his workmates. At one point, there was a run of suicides, including one worker who tried to take his own life on the return flight home. The roster was the root of these issues, but it was locked in by the Greenfields ag Agreement, which covered the job. Now, we know that the Gorgon Agreement Gorgon Project took a long time, but here, here we see an eight-year timeline for Greenfields projects. Mental health issues are rife, and it is simply immorally, and it is morally wrong to have Greenfields agreements with a lack of flexibility for eight, up to eight years, up to eight years. To prevent, excuse me, Madam President. I'm, I'm yep. Thank you, um, Senator McKim. You're almost contributing to the Hansard debate. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Please continue. Uh, mental health issues are rife. Suicide clusters happen. Fourteen suicides were reported in connection with the Inpex project alone. The Greenfield regime must. I implore this place must be flexible enough to adapt to the evolving needs of a site. The proposed amendments do the exact opposite to this, locking in life of agreement projects, uh, project agreements for the life of the project that I believe in all likelihood have the capacity to kill people. We strongly oppose this bill. The Labor Party is the party of working people. It always has been and it always will be. We will stand up to ensure that workers in our nation receive fair pay and conditions for the work that they do. We are the party of a safety net, of, of award safety nets, of leave entitlements and secure work. The coalition is the party of cutting penalty rates, delaying raises to super, rises to super and for entrenching insecure work. The coalition is the party of work choices, union busting bills and ensuring Australian workers do not get a fair go. And this bill is just the latest attempt by this government to hurt working families. 
It will ensure that recovery from the pandemic is slow and that the recovery is inequitable. It's a story we've heard before, a coalition wanting to hurt workers under the guise of economic improvement. The bill should not be passed in its current form. There are too many fundamental problems and all the risks, all of the risks fall one way into the lap of working people. The coalition says that this bill creates confidence for employers to employ. But I ask and I implore this chamber, the risks all fall in that regard into the laps of working people. We are here in this place defending workers from having their pay and conditions cut once again. The Labor Party will continue to fight to make sure that workers are treated fairly and that this bill does not pass. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Uh, and it's a pleasure to follow on some from Senator Pratt, who laid out the Labor Party arguments on this bill that have been consistent now for a number of months. And increasingly, those arguments have actually been taken across Australia, and I certainly know across regional Queensland as well, where a number of unions have been out uh, having meetings and talking to people and really giving people the opportunity to understand the damage that this bill will do to their ability to go about their life and their workplace. And it is a bill that says so much about this government. It sums up how they operate, what they stand for, and how they see life for Australians, workers and families into the future. And you can start with the name of the bill, Supporting Australian Jobs and Economic Recovery. It's always the cynical political messaging with this government. They never miss an opportunity. It's politics all the time, and we see that with the title of this bill. And we've also seen it in the way that they've negotiated on this as well in their positioning. Uh, they drop getting, the, getting rid of the better off overall test, the boot test, during a first effort to get the bill passed. But they're prepared to use that to play on the fears of Australians, knowing full well that that was brought in around work choices the first time. And then let's also think about this moment in time. Look at what the world has been dealing with over the last 12 months what it has been going through, and consider what Australians have been going through as well over this period of time. We know that there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of Australians who've lost their jobs. Many of those have been relying on JobKeeper that is due to expire in a couple of weeks. And we know that Australians have a newfound sense of what is an essential worker and what we went through last year and how Australians have appreciated those people who were able to provide that support so many of us could get through, uh, whether it is the frontline health workers, those people behind the scenes in the health service that have helped kept hospitals in shape and enabled us to deal with the pandemic, whether it's those that have been on the front line uh, dealing in supermarkets, and we know how under pressure they've been. Uh, it certainly has given Australians a new sense of what is an essential worker over the last 12 months. But this bill is the vision of this government, uh, and all it is is a series of ideological attacks, long-held beliefs that they've always wanted to pursue and wrapped up in the cover of dealing with the pandemic. So that is what says so much about this government, the fact that they're pursuing long-held beliefs, they're pursuing agendas that they always want to get on in terms of attacking workers, but they're wrapping it up in terms of dealing with the pandemic is their cynical way of trying to get this through. So given the challenges that all workers are facing across the country, and some of these were in place before the pandemic, increasing casualisation. We know that there's two million people unemployed or looking for more work. Record low, low wage growth that was well in place before the pandemic. And certainly from a Queensland point of view, the use of labour hire through many parts of Queensland and particularly through some industries that is being used to drive down wages and conditions. And then you add on to these existing conditions a pandemic, and that is what the Australian people have dealing with. And this is what is being presented today is this government's vision in terms of trying to provide a solution for those challenges that workers are facing. It is so lacking in vision. It is bereft 
of any creativity from this government, and they're incapable of offering up a better Australia. If this is the bill, the best they can put up, um, it is a sad indictment on this government that this is their vision for Australian workers. When we actually had a moment with what Australia have gone through over the last 12 months, where people did work together, uh, the opposition were prepared to work with the government to try and find solutions to these challenges. And yet here we are 12 months on, whilst Australia have got through the pandemic, the government don't have a vision for what the future looks like. They don't have a vision for a better Australia, and all we are seeing from this legislation is actually going to make things worse. It's going to make things worse for workers. It's going to make things worse for those families as a result of this. And those challenges that we, I spoke about before, about low wage growth, about casualisation, about those people looking for work, they were around before the pandemic. They've been accentuated now because of what we have been dealing with, but still the government shows no vision, no creativity. They just revert to the age-old attacks on workers that we've seen since the Howard days. And it really is a tragedy that this is the best they can do, given the opportunity that they have had. So what does this bill do to hurt Australians? It makes it easier for employers to casualise jobs that would have otherwise been permanent. It makes bargaining for better paying conditions more difficult than it already is. It allows for wage cuts and it weakens wage theft punishments in jurisdictions where it was already deemed a criminal act, like in my home state of Queensland, which has been something that the state government have been really proud on delivering on and was something that was seen as a significant factor uh, in recent election. So some of the evidence that was placed before the committee hearings, uh, and it was a truncated effort of the committee hearings because of the government's urgency on this, but it was a great job by the Labor senators and others to get some of this evidence on the record. And I know the committee did spend time in Townsville as well within Queensland. According to the Centre for Future of Work, Australians, they said, Australians has not experienced such a sustained deceleration of both nominal and real wages in its entire post-war history. So the LNP's plans to get wages growing again is to make it easier to casualise workers. The Senate Economic Committee looked into the government's bill and heard from workers and other groups. Including in this was the Centre for Future of Work, who said that weak, weakening, casual labour and definition, weakening casual labour definitions and increasing the employer control over these definitions will suppress wage growth and fuel insecure work, they said. The worrying expansion of insecure work in Australia is already associated with major economic and social consequences, including the slowest wage growth at any point since the Depression, undermined consumption spending, rising household financial instability and rising inequality. This was furthered by per capita, stating that the bill is likely to exacerbate rather than relieve the insecurity of hours and income experienced by too many workers in Australia. It suggested that, at its worst interpretation, the new definition and conversion clause could encourage employers to offer casual employment to all new employees, giving them a year of try before you buy employment for all employees, regardless of the eventual hours worked. This is particularly important given the growth in employment has been on the back of casual work. 60 per cent of all jobs created between May and November last year have been casual work. This is according to the Centre for Future of Work. In this period, casual employment grew by 400,000. Similarly, part-time work has also grown strong in the same period. Australia's COVID recovery can't be built on the back of more insecure work and this bill is actually going to make that worse. It won't improve the conditions for casuals. The government even overturned the federal court decision on what it means to be a casual, making it harder. Under these laws, if someone starts a job and agrees to be employed as a casual, then they remain a casual regardless of their actual work hours and pattern, as long as the employer employs them on the basis that they made no firm advanced commitment to continuing in indefinite work according to an agreed pattern of work. Even if a court finds that a casual workers should, be, should have been permanent, then any casual loading they have received is deducted from outstanding permanent entitlements. 
so they still find a way to punish workers. There are countless examples of workers who do the same job but are being paid less. It is being reported on average 30 to 40 per cent less than their permanent counterparts. And we've seen numerous examples of that in Queensland through the resourcing industry. So not only are they getting less than their full-time counterparts, they would not be able to get what is owed to them even if they are found to be permanent. This bill does very little to address the permanent casual problem, something that is rife throughout Queensland and regional Queensland. The provisions don't offer a realistic pathway to permanency. The loophole of potentially unlimited reasonable grounds that employees will not be able to challenge. The ACTU called the provisions essentially meaningless. Given that employers are not bound to offer permanency if they do not think it is reasonable and can also refuse to consent to arbitration of the Fair Work Commission. And I think this is a key part of this, particularly from a Queensland point of view, where we have seen this become prevalent throughout regional Queensland. And I've spoken about this in the chamber before because ultimately what this is doing is driving down the pay and conditions of all workers, but it's also changing the nature of many of these regional towns in terms of it being a good place to live and work and raise a family. If the only employment you can rely on is casual, you aren't able to make those decisions in life that others are who are on full-time or permanent work. And it is changing the nature of these places uh, and making them uh, less attractive for people to go uh, live, work and raise a family like they have been for generations of Queenslanders and indeed Australians. There is the simplified additional hours agreement. This provision means an employer and a part-time employee can agree with working additional hours at their normal pay route without paying overtime. The Queensland Nurses and Midwife Unions stated it had been a proliferation of part-time employees who are being treated as casual employees whilst negating the need to pay the 25 per cent loading required for casual employees. It argued that, effectively, the employee has limited control over hours worked and loses the benefits of part-time employment. Whilst the employer gains flexibility and reduced hourly rates, expansion of part-time employment practices by employers will further exacerbate insecurity and precarious employment. And that's coming from the Queensland Nurses and Midwives Union, which obviously cover so many vital workers, particularly given the health crisis that we have been dealing with over the last 12 months. The bill will also weaken wage theft laws in Queensland. The Queensland Council of Unions wrote in their evidence that the bill considers the penalty for stealing by a worker to be two and a half times worse than stealing by an employer. In contrast, wage theft in, Queen, uh, the wage theft in Queensland is set at the same corresponding penalty if the stealing is conducted by a clerk or servant in relation to the employer's property. The Queensland government has criticised the wage theft changes. Queensland has a maximum penalty of up to 10 years imprisonment, where the Commonwealth regime has a maximum of only four. The Queensland government said in their submission, the setting of a lower penalty at the Commonwealth level appears to signal that the Commonwealth government regards wage theft as a less serious act than, for example, the forgery of postage stamp, which also attracts a maximum penalty of 10 years imprisonment. I think that just shows you the attitude of this government, and it has been for years on wage theft, despite the overwhelming evidence uh, that is being presented and Australian workers being ripped off. Australia and Australia workers need an economic recovery that benefits all. Labor believes that we need to promote inclusive prosperity where we create wealth through improved job security and decent wages. Per capita summarised Australia's recovery well. Despite a strong recovery in asset prices and falling headline unemployment rate towards the end of 2020, the reality is that Australia's broader economic recovery threatens to take the shape of a K rather than a V. That is, some people will do very well having retained their jobs and saved money during the lockdowns last year while others will fall deeper into insecurity and poverty. And the reality of this bill that we are debating today is it will make that worse. Labor has been consistent now uh, since this bill was first introduced uh, that this is bad legislation and it needs to be voted down. And that is what Labor will do. But more than that, it is such a missed opportunity for the country at a time when Australians are actually looking for a better vision, looking for something to look forward to and offer hope for their future. 
the government have turned up and put this bill forward that is actually going to make the working lives of Australians and their families worse off. It is a sad indictment on this government that that is the best they can do, but they are so lacking in vision, uh, they are so lacking in creativity uh, that this bill has to be opposed. I encourage the crossbench to oppose it as well. There is nothing that can be done to improve this. Uh, it is something that needs to be voted down, and the Australian people need to punish this government at the next election. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Stirl. Yes, thanks, Madam De De Deputy President. I rise to make my contribution to this bill also this afternoon. And I have to say at the outset that it should be the first thing that should be in the front line of most of Australian people is when the LNP government set out to tell workers that they've got their back and in the best interest of Australian workers, this fantastic piece of legislation is going to improve your lifestyle. The warning bells and the alarms should be screaming at fever pitch. Because, Madam Deputy President, I remember sitting in this chamber back in 2005 when the day work choices went through, when the Howard government, the greed of the Howard government, won the numbers in the Senate in their own right to ram through any legislation they did. And weren't they proud? And I also remember watching a, a clap of lightning. A clap of lightning hit this place on true as I speak. And all I could see there was the sun shining, a little bit of light shining through on Senator Betts's head at the moment, at the time. And I thought, well, how long if that, 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 that shard of light will turn to a lightning bolt one day? Well, how did that end up for the coalition? What coalition member could stand proud and tell us during the work choices? legislation debates and the subsequent bill that hit the streets, that they were so proud of the Howard government for doing that. I even saw a couple of them doing high fives, slapping each other's hands. Well, here we are. You see, one thing about being in this place, history does repeat itself. And here we go again. Regards, take out regardless of the bad behaviour we've seen in this place and the cover-ups and the alleged offences in the last few years, which would make any decent Australian want to vomit. So what do they do as soon as there's a pandemic? They can't help themselves. It's in their DNA, their ideological DNA. And I heard the contribution from a couple of senators yesterday. Uh, one of them was Senator Small from WA, and I did read some of the comments on Facebook, and I'm not going to be that rude to mention anything about his name and his capability. I wouldn't dare do that, to tell us that this is not ideological. Bulldust. This is ideological. And I'll tell you why. If this government over there, if any of these LNP senators had a shred of decency in them, okay, they, would, they would be down here and they would be telling the Australian people, while they're doing a magnificent job to look after people on this piece of legislation, what have you done for Australian workers in the last seven years you've been in government? And I'll make it easy for you. Name three things. Just name three things where the Australian workers would be standing up there saying what a magnificent job the LNP has done. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm going to tell you now, not one of them can come down here and do that because they would get torn to shreds. What have they done for their mates in big business? Oh, well, that would read like a funk and wagnalls. That would be 26, 27 volumes. And here we go again. Before we get to this, and while we're talking about history, I want to send a message out to my crossbench colleagues, and I say this with the greatest respect, I do respect the crossbench. I'm one of those that absolutely respects the crossbench, even though we have differences of opinions, but they are elected in their own right, and they've faced the people and they've been sent by their respective states to represent their states and the good people of those states. But I appeal to Senator Lambie and I appeal to Senator Patrick and I appeal to Senator Griff, Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts that the last time we saw a wonderful, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I've got my tongue in my cheek, a wonderful piece of legislation to help working men and, men and women in Western Australia, well, the cross, uh, in Australia, the crossbench senators who supported that bill are no longer here. Now, there could be a myriad of reasons why, but I've got to tell you, the biggest thing going into the 2007 election was work choices. And the Howard government, with all the lemmings on the other side and the crossbenchers that supported them, couldn't wait to put it in. Well, they all went out the exit door, not here anymore. 
Now, I just appeal to my crossbench senators. Whatever way they fluff it up, how many hundreds and thousands they want to sprinkle on this horrible sandwich, I know you're not going to fall for it, and I plead with you because the Australian people, the Australian people will not be taken for mugs. We know in this nation one of the greatest issues faced in this nation is wage theft. Now, this is not new to me. I've been talking about wage theft for many, many, many years. I'm just really happy now that the media are actually talking about wage theft. I want to congratulate those two magnificent Labor state governments in Queensland and Victoria, who not only just talked about wage theft, actually moved heaven and earth to bring in legislation to address the issue. When will it ever happen in this place? Never. I shouldn't ask myself the same questions. It's never going to happen because, you see, I have been running around the great nation of Australia talking to truck drivers left, right and centre. Not just the suits, not just the representatives of transport associations and, and senators opposite. If you want to have a bubble, bring it up now. Give me examples where I might be wrong. And all they want to talk about, well, they want to talk about it, many, many things. But the biggest issue is wage theft. You see, because this is what really irks me with that mob over there. They pertain to be the friend of small business. And this is the, the, the nonsense you'll hear from the LNP. We're the party of small business. Well, if you were the party of small business, please explain to me how we have small businesses in this day and age that get the living daylight screwed out of them by the top of the supply chain. Nothing in this bill goes to address that. What about all those magnificent, hard-working small businesses in, the, in every industry you could think of who are being told to sharpen your pencil every time they put a quote in, who are being told, we can't pay you 30 days, we might pay you 45, we might even pay you 60. I've got examples of 120, I've got examples of 150, but that was one of the multinationals. So, to the LNP senators, tell me what you've done for small business in terms of getting them remunerated on time or in a reasonable time. Now, in this nation, LNP senators, it's crickets over there, not a thing. Where in this nation also is it that we have a body called the Fair Work Ombudsman? And the Fair Work Ombudsman is charged with a number of things, but one is to seek out those people who aren't doing the right thing and paying their wages. Where in this bill, please point me to it, does it say that thou shall even fund the Fair Work Ombudsman even more to get off and get out there and prosecute and put people in behind bars if they have to, whatever they need to do, recuperate hard-earned monies for people who have not been paid properly. And I gave examples of that in this place two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And please tell me, where in that bill does it tell me that you're going to address this to look after workers? As expected. Not a thing. I'm giving you the opportunity. Where is it where we have examples of high-profile businesses self-reporting and good on them? They've self-reported. They've come out and said, look, we haven't paid our people properly. And I can understand sometimes there could be, you know, there could be bogies in computers and all that. I get all that. We have celebrity chefs and we have Bunnings. I mean, people that are normally not the celebrity chef, but the likes of Bunnings and co who are paying, but there was a slip up. They fixed it. That's fine. That's great. We've heard of Morris Blackburn's done it, got out there and fixed it. Where is it in this bill that the grand party of the small business is going to stand up and say, you know what? Every time we give the opportunity for an employer to do the wrong thing and not get pinged, where is it in your psyche that you think to yourselves, but what about the poor people that are doing the right thing? Point me to the clause in this bill that says that you will do your best to look after the people who are paying the correct wages but are losing contracts to people who absolutely engage in wage theft and in superannuation theft. Anything there? No. No, I didn't think so. Can't point me to it. And, why, and, and you know, I listened intently to a number of contributions today. And one of, one of the best contributions I heard was from Senator O'Neill, who was, I believe, or well, I believe she was, on the committee. So a committee looked into this bill, a legislation committee. Now, I've done a few committees myself over the years. And I, I heard very clearly Senator O'Neill tell me the government, the government, not the opposition and the crossbench and the Greens, the government only let them have three inquiries. 
a massive bill that is going to be so fantastic for Australian businesses, so fantastic for Australian workers, so fantastic for casuals, so fantastic for those that have insecure employment now. Three days? I made a comment, I made a couple of contributions in here in the last couple of weeks of how disgusted I was in the opposite uh, the modus operandi of this LNP government in the last seven years of doing everything they can to not answer questions in inquiries from get the departments not to answer. And, and lo and behold, it happened again to me last, uh, last week when I was in conducting the Transport Security Amendment Bill. Same old, same old, we'll insult the Senate, we'll insult the senators. And that's fine, you'll get away with that for a while. But you insulted the witnesses who had travelled, who wanted to come and present their cases. You, the LNP Morrison government, you're all guilty, the whole lot of you together, to sit back and think that you could control that there would only be three inquiries, three hearings. Last time I looked, there was about six or seven capital cities that, that, that we normally go to to seek that information from the people. And then to hear the example from Senator O'Neill of the nurses, the nurses who had travelled, and it might have been one nurse, might have been a couple of nurses, I apologise if I got that wrong, who, who was most upset that they couldn't get to present their take on insecure employment and their take on the bill. And as Senator O'Neill said very, very, very clearly, our frontline workers, the ones that ministers and the Prime Minister couldn't wait to get photos of, standing next to the nurses, standing next to the healthcare workers, our essential workers fighting the pandemic, when the nurse, quoting Senator O'Neill's um, um, words, was actually saying to her husband and kids, if it breaks out, I might not be able to come home for a month. And the LNP senators, and I don't know who the LNP senators are or were on the inquiry, I'm blaming the whole damn lot of them, because they're all guilty for association. Where in your psyche do you think that this is fantastic, that you can snub the Australian people while in the one hand while you're telling them you're doing everything you can to look after them? I know no one's going to answer that. I know. I know. I know there's Labor senators that can answer that. And there's Green senators and crossbenchers that can answer that. But here's another one. Casualisation. Now before they all start jumping off like a pack of cockies carrying on, casual suits certain employees. But I've got to tell you, as someone that didn't have to snivel my way through university while I was trying to be a senator, trying to figure out how can I work for someone and get a job as an, in the Senate or as a member of parliament without actually going off to work and doing things. When you are casual, there is no way known you can seek a loan. You cannot go get a loan for a car. You can't do it. You certainly can't go, go and get a loan for a house. How do I know? Because I had spent many, many years. I broke every industrial law in the land I could find. I am proud of it. To march truck drivers and forklift drivers and loaders off the job in the good old days when workers could collectively bargain before Howard got his claws in there with the support of all the lemmings behind him. To proudly stand on picket lines and proudly make it known to anyone around, we ain't moving until our brothers and sisters have got a permanent job. And I'm so proud of my history there. I just wish I could have spent the last 15 years doing it as well. But I've been in here trying to fight the good fight for workers. So you tell me in this bill, in this bill point, me to where, point me to where any worker can say, well, thank you, LNP, thank you, Mr Morrison and the Lemmings, that you have got my back. What a load of bull. Now, there's another part here I want to find out. One of my greatest hatreds in the, in, in the transport industry, but I'll let other senators talk about this, is and was and still is labour hire. Now, I might be wrong. See, labour hire may now have a conscience, but back in the great old days when I had the steel cap boots and the jeans on, there was not one decent word that I could put my tongue around to describe or link to labour hire. Labour hire were the parasites of the road transport industry. If it's changed, come and see me. Labour hire, the preferred option for the multinationals and everyone else who wanted to screw down wages and conditions. You know why? They never invested one single cent into the welfare of the workforce. Tell me one single cent in the transport industry where labour hire put it to training and skills development. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. 
Never happened. Tell me, what, just give me one example where Labor hires said, gee whiz, you know, we're making a mozza, so how can we pay our Labor hire people on a multinational site the EBA rates of pay that the permanent employees get on those, rates of, uh, on those sites or the casuals? <laughs> Guess what? Chameleons. This mob Labor hire could blend in with the jungle because they were never responsible, never did anything for anyone except themselves and helping bosses screw down the working conditions and wages of their permanent and their casual staff. Please point me to the direction on what page, on what paragraph can I be proven wrong where this bill is so darn good for working men and women in Australia. Senator McKim. Well, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, here we go again. Under the cover of a pandemic, the ideologically driven neoliberals in this place come in here once again to do the bidding of their corporate masters at the expense of ordinary Australian people. And let's just take pause as we debate this legislation and, and reflect on where neoliberalism has brought us to today. The planet is cooking. We are in the sixth mass extinction event in the history of the earth. We are pricing an entire generation of young people out of the great Australian dream of owning their own home. We have millions of Australians unemployed or underemployed with women, young people and Senator migrant McKim, workers bearing Senator McKim, I'm very sorry oh, about this, but we need to move to Senator's just statement. Warming up, so you'll be, uh, yes, uh, you'll be in continuation. Thank you, Senator McKim. I shall now proceed to Senator's statements and I call Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. The defamatory abuse, denigration and harassment which is being posted every second of every minute of every day on social media in this country, particularly on Facebook and the extremely toxic Twitter, must stop. This is one of the principal reasons why political discourse in this country has degenerated to such appallingly low standards. This must change. We Australians are better than this. Last night I posted on Twitter the powerful emotional speech by the member for Boothby, Nicole Flint, who has called out the Labor Party, Get Up and the unions over the most disgusting campaign against her at the last federal election. Much of this was facilitated through an unceasing barrage of false, misogynistic, abusive and, of course, defamatory publications on Twitter, cowardly, anonymous posts which are beyond the reach of Australian law. Even my post last night was, was met with more abusive and defamatory comments. The loss of the member for Boothby, my good friend and a warrior for Liberal values, is a great loss to this parliament, to the people of Boothby and to the Liberal Party. The Leader of the Opposition said this morning on ABC Radio that he stood by Ms Flint at this time, and yet it was Senator Wong who was leading the charge on behalf of Labor in its campaign against Ms Flint. These are weasel words from the Leader of the Opposition and from Labor. This is an issue above politics. Every woman deserves to feel safe when she goes to work, no matter where she works. The Morrison government's response to the distressing allegations by Brittany Higgins, including the commissioning of an independent review into Commonwealth workplaces by Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins, is well underway. In recent days, I've spoken a lot about the need for urgent change, including reform of state and territory criminal justice systems to ensure that more victims of sexual assault receive justice when their case goes to court. However, in this contribution, I want to focus on the urgent need for social media defamation law reform in Australia. Every Australian deserves to feel safe online, no matter how they engage, whether it be connected with work, family, friends, shopping or leisure. The global digital platforms have an ugly history of showing scant regard for the material they publish. Currently, social media companies cannot be held responsible for content they publish because under Section 5, Schedule 5 of the Broadcasting Services Act, 
they are not considered as hosting the content in Australia. This is purely because their web servers are located overseas. Uh, this is untenable. It is a matter of common sense and law that these companies publish content in Australia, but because their web servers are located overseas, uh, they currently cannot be held liable for what they publish, no matter how defamatory it is. In the meantime, people's reputations can be ruined by a single viral post, a barrage of online abuse, a misleading photo, or a quote taken out of context. And all of these continue to be published in Australia by companies like Facebook and Twitter without any legal repercussions for this defamation. It is unacceptable that social media giants have for so long evaded responsibility for the content they publish. This cavalier approach to the lives and reputations of ordinary Australians must be stopped. It is time to reform defamation law in this country. Such reform would build on the Morrison government's strong commitment to combating online abuse, such as our children's online safety reforms and the Online Safety Act, which combats violent, abusive and other similar material. This government has also passed world-leading legislation to ensure Google and Facebook pay for the Australian news content that they use in this country. However, it is clear that if left to their own devices, these global giants will do everything they can to escape liability for content they publish, even if it means recklessly exposing Australians to the ravages of online defamation. The hypocrisy of these companies is galling. Facebook and Twitter routinely block or take down posts which they consider to be politically controversial or offensive, but will continue to publish defamatory posts long after the affected person has notified them and lodged a complaint, or after a court has issued a warrant for the post to be taken down. Last May, I informed the Senate about two anonymous Twitter accounts which over three years posted vile, abusive and defamatory content about me. I detailed how I believed that the current member for Corangamite had some direct or indirect control over one of those accounts and her subsequent denials are simply not credible. Uh, excuse me. These Senator posts Henderson. included Senator false Urquhart. and defamatory Senator, claims. Uh, Senator I was Urquhart guilty on of the point of order. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, I would remind the um, senator opposite, uh, in accordance with standing 193, that uh, improper motives or personal reflections on other people in these houses is not appropriate. And I would ask her to withdraw that. Uh, Senator Henderson, you made some uh, comments uh, as I was listening in relation to uh, the member for Corangamite in the other place, and I'd asked you to uh, consider your statements, consider withdrawing those statements. Oh, well, I don't believe that they um, are warranted a withdrawal, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I've previously put these on the record. Um, and I am simply saying that I am concerned about the, um, the current member for Corangamite and, and the direct Senator, or indirect control. Senator, Senator Urquhart on the point of order. It, it is an imputa a direct imputation on a member in the other place, and I would ask the senator to withdraw. Senator Payne. Madam Acting Deputy President, further to the point of order, I understood Senator Henderson to say that the matters that she has raised this morning uh, are already on the record uh, and whether that has a, uh, a reflection, whether that has, a, um, has relevance to uh, your ruling and to the advice from the clerk, uh, I would seek you to consider that as well. concerned that some imputations were made on uh, the member in the other place, the member for Karangamite, and I'd ask you again 
to consider withdrawing those statements. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, the concerns I raised in relation to the member for Karangamite were detailed extensively in a contribution I made in May last year. And th there was no objection raised by Labor, and I spoke extensively about uh, the, the matter and, the, and, the, and what actually um, happened in relation to these anonymous Twitter accounts. These are detailed in that speech, and there was no objection by Labor in relation to that matter. Uh, Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, I would say to the Senator the fact that an objection was not made previously is no answer to a ruling now. The second I would say, and I would say this to the Minister too, uh, regardless of who is in the chair, if a Senator is asked to withdraw, the convention is that the Senator comply. And I would invite the government um, minister to encourage the senator to comply. If the senator fails to comply, the op op obviously the op option for the acting um, deputy president is to report the matter to the president. Uh, but I would really encourage uh, gov the government senator, Senator Henderson, to not go down this path. We all have to withdraw at times. I've withdrawn lots of things over many years. Uh, Senator Stell, I reckon you might you might even have done, had to do more. So it's, you know, I understand um, uh, you know there is a political contest, but uh, I would encourage Senator Henderson to comply with the request of the acting deputy president. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, uh, acting. Deputy President, I withdraw, but I uh, want to draw to the Senate tenant's attention my contribution on this matter, which where I extensively canvassed these matters in my speech of last May. And when I spoke, I spoke about the false and defamatory claims made into uh, anonymous Senator, Twitter accounts. Senator, Senator Wong, on the point of order. Uh, the, the senator can't then repeat the very remarks, the content of the remarks that she's been asked to withdraw. Sorry. Oh, just was just, she's taking advice. Yeah. Uh, senator Henderson, I note that you uh, agreed to withdraw the. Co I noted that you agreed to withdraw the comments, and I thank you for that, but you can't then repeat the comments. So your, your withdrawal has to be unconditional. So I would ask you to continue on that basis, please. Um, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I did not repeat those comments. I simply um, made reference Sen to— Sen Senator uh, Henderson, I'd ask that your withdrawal is unconditional. Yes, and I, I withdraw, on. and I simply say that I'm referring to false and defamatory claims in relation to two anonymous Twitter accounts, including that I was um, claims that I was guilty of embezzlement and going to jail. Uh, in these Twitter accounts, there was a doctored image of a mugshot, which was of a woman bearing the same name, name as me, with my face, who had shot dead her children in Texas. And these are my political opponents at work, and it was absolutely sick and disgusting. Victoria Police is investigating this matter on the basis that these anonymous Twitter accounts constitute stalking under the Crimes Act, but to date police have been unable to access any identifying material about these accounts because Twitter refuses to cooperate. On application by Geelong detectives, the Geelong Magistrates Court issued a warrant on 10 July 2020 demanding Twitter hand over relevant documents. On 2 September, Twitter declined to accept the warrant, saying police must seek information through the International Crime Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty process in the courts of Ireland and the United States, but Twitter refuses to uh, cooperate. This makes a mockery of Twitter's assurances to me by Australian Representative Cara Hinesley 
that it would cooperate if a court or legal order was obtained. This makes justice for ordinary Australians impossible. These companies don't care about publishing defamatory content, which may also be in breach of the criminal law, because it usually affects individuals who either neither have the time nor the money to contest the matter in court, let alone in an international court, and the companies know that under Australian law they cannot be held liable for the publication of the defamatory content anyway. And that's why regulatory reform is needed to restore fairness and justice online for ordinary Australians. Reform will be difficult and complex because Australian law is limited in its capacity to bind foreign corporations operating overseas. But this reform is possible and must happen, as we have done with abusive and harmful content, content published online. Some may argue that stronger regulation of these companies' online publishing undermines free speech. But our right to free speech does not justify the publication of defamatory material. No one thinks it's a fair concession to free speech to allow the social media giants to escape liability, having actively participated in the ruination of someone's life and reputation. Some may argue that social media companies really don't host content in Australia because the internet is a global phenomenon that transcends national borders. If that's the case, why is it that whenever they are brought before the courts, Twitter says its servers are all in California and Facebook maintains that its data centre is in Dublin? It seems these companies are very eager to confine the internet within national borders whenever it suits them. The fact is that companies like Facebook and Twitter publish content in Australia. They run advertising in Australia. They conduct business in Australia, and they derive significant income in Australia. They also take advantage of legal loopholes in Australia. These loopholes should and must be eliminated. The great Roman statesman Marcus Tullius Cicero said that the precepts of the law are to live honestly, to injure no one, and to give everyone their due. Social media giants like Facebook and Twitter continue to publish dishonest and injurious defamatory content online. It is time to give Australians their due and hold these companies responsible for the damage they cause. Thank you. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I've got a good news story, so I'm uh, looking forward to my own contribution. Uh, and I want to talk about I'm so, sorry I've only got 10 minutes because I could go all day on this. I want to talk about a magnificent project that's come, uh, come out of Voice in Australia. And there are amazing things that happen when industry and employer groups get together and start talking in one voice and singing from the same hymn sheet. But so is the case with two very good close friends of mine. Firstly, Timmy Dawson, alias Smokey, from the Transport Workers Union. Alias is not, his nickname is Smokey, like most Dawsons. Secretary of the TW in Perth, and WA. And of course, my other very, very close friend, Cam Dumnancy, the CEO of Western Roads Federation. Now, uh, going back sometime last year, just after COVID bans were lifted, we could actually start travelling back through Western Australia again. Smokey and I jumped on, uh, in the car and we headed up north because there's been a lot of reports about the poor quality of uh, rest areas for our heavy vehicle drivers, but mainly the, the one I wanted to see was what they colloquially termed the road train assembly area in Newman, which is code for an absolute pigsty and should be condemned. Anyway, that was my view. So I took up the, we went up and we had a look. What came out of that is we spoke to a lot of truck drivers. It had been many, 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 many years since I pulled into a rest area up north to have to sleep the night. But I go back to the days when I was on the road and my mates, it was not uncommon to pull into a dirt truck bay. Uh, if it was raining, well, you'd be guaranteed you'd lose a thong, not a snap one off, or uh, uh, you'd be uh, up your ankles in mud. If you wanted to go to the toilet, you had to make sure it was in between showers. Not a nice, pleasant conversation there, but it's the truth. And uh, whack a torch on your, under your arm and a roll of toilet paper and go off in the bush and hope the crikey that you came out all right. And we wonder why we couldn't attract women into the, into the transport area. Since then, into the transport industry, since then, there's been a lot, a lot of work being done now to start become, get these rest areas and these truck bays equivalent to how they should be, fit for purpose, in 2021, where we can actually be treated like humans, the truckies, when we have to pull up and have a rest or relieve ourselves. But more importantly, we want to, be, we want to have the best working conditions to get women into the industry. 
So um, I wrote off to the Premier Mark McGowan in Western Australia at the time and strongly advised the Premier that the, the worst he could do is sit down and talk with the industry and sit down and talk with uh, Timmy Dawson and Cam Dumancy, and to his credit, he did. So what's come out of that is a magnificent project where 17 um, uh, targeted locations have been identified. And I commend uh, Minister Rita Safiotti, the Minister for Transport and Planning, in working with the industry and with Main Roads, her department. And of those 17 uh, areas, I think, uh, I, look, I also have to, oh, sorry, I apologise, I want to congratulate David Fife from the uh, Australian Livestock Transporters Association as well, who's a magnificent representative for his members in the transport industry. And they identified these projects and they've come to the conclusion that there is a pocket of money or a bucket of money, and I will give credit to the Commonwealth Government that provides that bucket of money back to the states where they can actually go and upgrade these areas, which is fantastic. Now, um, the ones that I want to talk about, and for those of us from WA, we should be excited about it because it's a long time coming, but it's coming. So this package, this, uh, 17, this uh, $14 million, will provide ablution facilities at 10 locations on key freight routes near Bunbury, which is down south, northern to the east, Port Hedland in the north, Northampton in the north, Exmouth in the north, Woburn in the north, or just north of Perth, which is the massive road train assembly area, which takes me back about 20 years when we when I was leading the campaign, maybe longer to get it bitumenised so our truckies didn't have to run around in mud while they were dropping their trailers or picking up their third or, or, or backing dollies up. And anyway, that's now going to be targeted. It's long overdue for expansion. It's actually got toilets and showers, um, and it's just great to hear that they're going to get more. Uh, uh, Marble Bar as well, because as those of us from WA would know, why Marble Bar? Marble Bar is a hot pot uh, of uh, activity with the mines. Anything north of uh, Newman in Western Australia and out in the gold fields, especially, it's not uncommon. One of the one of the most popular, or well, the two most popular configurations we see there are triple road trains and quads. And quads, these monsters, they're pulling the iron ore off the uh, off the mines into the ports. Uh, they're running along with four trailers, and that's serious weight. I think they're up around about 220, 230 ton. You wouldn't want one of them running over your foot with a thong on. So that is good news. Uh, there's also the expansion, thank goodness, to the, no the Newman Road Train Assembly area and new ablution facilities of $6 million. But I will say this. Congratulations to those um, uh, uh, industry bodies. Congratulations to the West Australian Government. And thank you to the Commonwealth Government for giving us that bucket of money. But a little bit of shame here to BHP. And I never let an opportunity go by. And we talk about Newman. So for those who don't know, Newman used to be called Mount Newman. And this is where iron all kicked off one of the first places, huge Mount Whaleback, huge exporter of our rock, our, our, you know, our, um, 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 our minerals, the Australian people's minerals, and there's a lot of money that comes in and out of Newman, a heck of a lot of money. The sad part is I didn't see BHP put their hand in their pocket. I did ask them, but that was like talking to a brick wall. So no kudos to BHP. You talk about the big Australian, you're not Australian. You talk about how much employment opportunities you give, well, that's great. It's tremendous that you do give those employment opportunities to a lot of Australians, and particularly in my own state where a lot of the wealth comes from. But you don't make the top of the box, in my view. You, you, know, you don't go past your gates. Your truckies can live like they did in the 60s, 70s, 50s, whatever, walking around in dirt and all that with no toilets. You don't give a damn. Anyway, well done to the others. Um, also, sealing extension of parking at Leonora and provision of toilet facilities at the tune of one and a half million. Fantastic. And then sealing of an existing parking area near Karangini uh, to separate heavy vehicle and light vehicles. That is tremendous because we encourage people in Western Australia get out, get out and about, have a look around. Um, but while we're also saying that, we're asking people to hook up the, uh, the caravan, hook up the camper trailer, go hire a uh, Winnebago. But we've got to remember that, that out there on these highways that these tourists are mixing with some big kit. And when you see a lot of the movements around through the north, eight metre wide loads are, are, are the norm. There's no doubt about that. And you look at the width of the road, and I think last time I looked at the width of the road, it's about five metres. That's both lanes, Madam Acting Deputy Chair, so you can understand we need to increase these, these, uh, these facilities. We need to do all our best to increase the infrastructure up there. What also gives me a bit of excitement is the one roadhouse between Newman and uh, Port Hedland. And 
Oh, for memory, it's about 440, 450k, I think. Don't hang, hold me to it. Just the one roadhouse, Oski. Oski is the place where the truckies and the tourists all pull up. Well, not all the truckies. A lot of the truckies pull up, and you can get a good feed at the Oski. I know because I've been there a number of times. You can get a shower. From good on Oski. They supply some facilities. They ask for a gold coin donation. Don't have to. That's great for the truckies. The only pitfall is they've got this massive parking area for the triples and the big stuff and the overwidth stuff coming in. Dirts, potholes you could fall in, you could lose a prime mover in. Well, that's going to be sealed as part of this deal. So that is a magnificent thing. Also, while I'm on it too, and I encourage anything, any program that also not only for our freight, you know, on our freight routes, but for our for our drivers, but also to make them as friendly as possible and as welcoming as possible for families, because we do know into a lot of these areas there's only one route, well, one road in and out. You may have two if you're lucky, and we want to encourage Australians to come over and see Western Australia. And I encourage every Australian, if not, if you get the opportunity, and we all love jumping on a plane and heading off to Bali or somewhere else, go and see Australia. Absolutely, come up to the west, come up to the northwest. What a magnificent part of the world it is! God's country. But remember, you are mixing with with some big gear up there. So if we can provide facilities that have decent roadhouses for tourists as well. For fueling facilities, playgrounds at these roadhouses, even better. The truckies are welcome, everyone's welcome in the West, and we, we just want everyone to be safe. Now, I'm going on saying that, that I do say this with the greatest respect. I, I sincerely thank the both governments, Commonwealth and State. I thank Minister Safiotti for listening, and not only listening, but doing something. Once again, to Timmy Dawson and to Cam Dunnancy and David Fife, you really are champions for the industry. Thank you, guys. But we can't stop there. There is a lot more that needs to be done, and we should not be looking in the prism of this great project for now as a one-off. This is something that needs to be an ongoing thing. You see, the trucking industry is, is a great cash cow for any government. And they take a lot of money out of the truckies' pockets in all forms of taxation. But I want to encourage senators and members, if you have the opportunity— oh, while well, I'm at it too, Tasmania. The Tasmanians done a great job down there talking to industry. I thought I'd just throw it on in because I saw when it said in the Wish Wilson. And they've listened to truckies, they've listened to the transport industry, and congratulations down there. That's brilliant. But as for the other states, Queensland, Queens Oh, sorry, and all the other Tasmanians. Sorry, and you've all got different surnames, if you confuse me. Um, I'm not going to get out of this one. That's going to give me some grief. But I also want to congratulate the Queensland government. They've, they're doing something similar to our other state governments. You've got a long way to go, and I encourage senators and members to speak up. Let's get these roads safer, as, as safe as we possibly can. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson. Acting Deputy President, I'm standing in the Australian Senate today, and I'm doing a shout out to the King Island District High School Green Team, Little Busters, and Power Rangers. I love you guys. Your absolute legends keep changing the world. Now, these guys, the King Island District High School team and their teacher, Duncan McPhee, who I think has been a power behind a number of these initiatives, is a student-based, staff-supported organisation with the aspiration to make a difference in our world by inspiring a greener and more sustainable way of life. Now, their role is to educate current and future generations on their island and promote change and develop ideas. They enjoy collaborating with staff, members of the council and other community organisations. And at the start of 2019, all used bottles and glass in King Island were going to landfill. So the Green team got together and focused on the question, how is waste managed on King Island and how can it be better managed? They began a quest with a fact-finding mission at local waste management sites. After a group meeting, the team visited the council and presented their thoughts and ideas to senior council staff and later to a full council meeting. Following this meeting, with the assistance of the council, the Green team developed a sticker to be placed on bins and developed a campaign aimed at getting the community to separate glass at home and then drop it at the transfer centre. Now, at this meeting, the council agreed to purchase glass collection bins and continue to collaborate with the Green team. The end result of this is that King Island glass is now being crushed and used in local collection bins uh, and to continue to collaborate with King Island. I might start that bit again, uh, Acting Deputy President. King Island glass is now being crushed uh, and uh, is being used uh, on the island. As of June 2020, uh, over 83,000 bottles had been crushed. Uh, the King Island Green team have also placed radio advertisements 
on um, the initiatives they're doing and the need for better waste initiatives. Um, Little Busters, just quickly, uh, was a campaign set up to educate students and their parents about the importance of reducing litter in the environment. Uh, and their first campaign is up and running, including beach cleanups up and down the coast. And lastly, Power Rangers, a program aimed to educate students about the importance of reducing power consumption at home and, of course, uh, educating their parents and uh, running with this initiative to help their parents pay lower power bills. So here's an example of one primary school that's changing the world. I know kids do great jobs all around this country, acting deputy president, but they are change agents. They can change their parents uh, and they can change the world. So well done, guys. Really proud of you. Unfortunately, the second story that I want to talk about today uh, is not a positive story, uh, Acting Deputy President. It's been brought to my attention uh, in recent weeks uh, by very distraught and desperate community measures on the northwest coast of Tasmania, uh, particularly around Smithton and Montague and Marawa, about a totally shocking and unacceptable deaths of Tasmanian devils. Um, in the last three days, three more devils have been found dead on the roads around the Wall North property. Now, it's really important to put this in perspective. Tasmanian devil populations have declined 80 per cent in the last two decades. And the last healthy devil population that's tumour-free uh, is in the northwest at, at this area. There's been 14 devils found on the roads dead in just the last week in this area, and nearly 30 Tasmanian devils since January. Uh, this population can't afford to lose these numbers, and the community are getting desperate and, of course, are desperately sad, because they are the ones who collect the devils and hand the devils in, in, to, in for pathology uh, to the local, uh, say, the Tasmanian devil program. Um, uh, this is very confronting, uh, Acting Deputy President, but I feel like I have to do this. I have a number of photographs here of dead Tasmanian devils, each and every one of them uh, individuals in a healthy population. Um, they can't be replaced, and they can't speak for themselves. We have to speak for them. Uh, and I would seek leave the Senate's leave to table these seven photographs of these Tasmanian devils, please. Um, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, it's no good just coming into the Senate and making a statement that this is, this is horrific uh, without providing a way of changing this, without providing a way to go forward. Thank you. The Tave the Tasmanian Devil program is a joint initiative between state and federal government. Unfortunately, the federal government pulled its funding for this initiative in 2017. Uh, no money is going from the federal government towards a species that is listed under EPBC law as threatened, endangered and protected. It's simply not good enough, Acting Deputy President. In this area, in this community, there is no mitigation measures to help protect devils from roadkill. Obvious, simple measures could be taken. I've talked to the local government. I've written to uh, Tasmanian agencies and I'll be writing to our Federal Environment Minister, urging her to put money into the Save the Tasmanian Devil program. This area in Woolnorth doesn't even have uh, signs letting tourists or locals or people travelling through there know that it is a critical area of Tasmanian devil habitat. Now, the devils face enormous pressure in this area from illegal land clearing. Uh, as well as pollution, on-farm pollution and a whole range of other predations. But to have nearly 40 killed in a short space of time on the roads when we know there's things we can do is unacceptable. Just on the other side of the Arthur River in the northwest is the Tarkine Drive. Now, when that area was, uh, was built and paved uh, for the road uh, just over a decade ago, a number of mitigation measures were put in place to help protect the devil, based on extensive studies of devil populations in the area. Uh, speed signs slowing down to 30 km an hour in areas where devils are known. Um, corrugations on the road to make noise to alert devils, as well as white areas so uh, motorists could see the devils. There's devil-proof fencing in that area. There's a whole range of other initiatives that were taken to protect the devil. And even a mine site that was approved in that area by the federal government let the mine know that for every dead devil that was found to be killed by their trucks, 
um, it was going to cost them $58,000. Now, I personally don't think you can put a life on a, Tasma a price on the life of a Tasmanian devil acting deputy president, but at least the company knew there was an incentive there uh, to be very careful and to make sure their workers were educated about the need to drive slowly and be very careful about the Tasmanian devils. But just a few kilometres away, on the other side of the river, there is nothing. There's a gravel road and a sealed road, and there's no mitigation measures at all. And it's not acceptable and it has to change. Now, I know the local government wants to put in, proof devil, put in place more devil-proof fencing, uh, and I know that the community is happy to help with removing roadkill from the roads, another thing that's very important so devils don't go onto the road and get hit by trucks. But I wanted to finish by saying the, large, the largest farm, in fact the largest dairy farm in Australia is Van Diemen's land in that area. The road where all these dead devils are found surrounds Van Derry and their properties. When this property was purchased by a foreign investor in 2016-17, as part of their undertakings to the federal government, our prime minister at the time, they said they would take measure, put money into measures to mitigate the risks of Tasmanian devils. And they haven't. In fact, I'd like to read from their statement. Van Derry, from their website, Van Derry has a thriving and healthy population of endangered Tasmanian devils. And our properties also include some nesting sites for the magnificent wedge-tailed eagle. We are working actively with the Tasmanian government to protect these and other native animals that we share on our land. Now, I've got to know the locals very well in this area, Acting Deputy President, and they tell me there has been no mitigation measures taken at all. And that doesn't surprise me because Van Derry also pledged the Australian people that they would invest $100 million to upgrade uh, infrastructure on their farms, better effluent system to deal with untreated effluent that I also understand and have commented on recently uh, in, the, in the Tasmanian newspapers uh, is causing pollution issues in this sensitive area, this area of sensitive devil habitat, just a kilometre away from a IUCN recognised uh, with recognised IUCN values, wetland, uh, the Bollinger Bay, Robins Passage, uh, the most important shorebird habitat in Tasmania. These areas are very sensitive and we've got to do better at managing developments in these areas and activity such as we see on Van Derry. And I would ask the owner of Van Derry to put their money where their mouth is, put money into the Save the Tasmanian Devil program and start helping out like you promised the Tasmanian and Australian people, you would do. Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Recently, I spoke about Tasmania's first power couple, Joe and Dame Enid Lyons. Today, I want to acknowledge another Tasmanian family who have also contributed an enormous amount to our political history, the Hodgman family. Initially, I'll focus on the two most prominent members of that family, both political leaders in their own right, who made significant contributions to my home state. At one time, not that long ago, Michael and Will Hodgman served together in the Tasmanian State Parliament. However, in their own right, this father-son duo will be remembered mostly as champions for Tasmania. Noted as one of the most colourful figures in modern Australian politics by former Prime Minister Julia Gillard, and as one of the greatest characters in Australian politics by Senator David Bushby, Michael Hodgman left a lasting legacy. He was a passionate advocate for Tasmania at a state and federal level and a vocal supporter of Australia's constitutional monarchy. In 2018, Will Hodgman received the highest number of votes for any candidate in a Tasmanian state election. I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Will over many years and have always valued his counsel and support. He was a long-standing member of the Tasmanian Parliament and the state grew in national and international standing under his stewardship. William Michael Hodgman, AMQC, was born in Hobart in 1938 and enjoyed a successful legal career before moving into politics. He graduated with a Bachelor of Law degree from the University of Tasmania in 1962, serving as Vice President of the Tasmania University Law Society and editor of the university newspaper, Togatus, while studying in Hobart. Michael was admitted to the Supreme Court of Tasmania and served as associate to the Right Honourable Sir Victor Windayer of the High Court of Australia from 1962 to 63. 
He worked as a legal officer for Hydro Tasmania in 1965 and 66 and served as a committee member of the Tasmanian Bar Council between 1969 and 74. Michael was appointed a Queen's Counsel in 1984. But one of the aspects outside politics that he will be re remembered most for is his high-profile clients, including the infamous Mark Chopper Reed. Michael's introduction to politics came in 1966 when he won the seat of Hewan as an independent member of Tasmania's Le Legislative Council. He held this position until December 1975 when he was elected to the federal parliament. As a federal MP for Denison between 1975 and July 1987, Michael served as the Minister for the Capital Territory and the Minister assisting the Minister for Industry and Commerce. After losing his federal seat at the 1987 election, Michael re-entered the Tasmanian Parliament in 1992, becoming the member for Denison in the House of Assembly. He held this seat until 1998 and then again between 2002 and 2010 which is where his political service coincided with his son Will's. In fact, Michael was in the party room when Will was elected unopposed as the new Liberal leader in 2006. By the time Michael retired from politics in 2010, he had spent 44 years serving Tasmanians and Australians, with 35 of those years in Parliament. My brother, Senator Bushby, paid tribute to this service in Federal Parliament, affectionately calling Michael the mouth from the south, a term commonly used to describe him. In his speech, David explained, there is much that can be said of Michael, his time in public office, his passion for Tasmania, for Hobart, for regional Australia, for the law, his antics, his stunts, his legendary rhetoric and his loyalty to our sovereign, Her Majesty the Queen of Australia. After Michael's death in 2013, a state memorial service was held in Hobart. Julia Gillard paid tribute to Michael, placing Parliament's appreciation for his long and meritorious public service on the record. She said all members would mourn his loss. Will Hodgman followed in his father's footsteps in wanting to serve Tasmanians and Australians. Now Australia's High Commissioner to Singapore, Will was Tasmania's 45th Premier until he resigned in January last year. William Edward Felix, Will Hodgman, was born in 1969 in Hobart and, like his father, was educated at the Hutchins School and attended the University of Tasmania. Will graduated with a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Law in 1993 and was admitted to the Supreme Court of Tasmania in 1994. Will was initially an associate of Hobart law firm Wallace, Wilkinson and Webster before travelling to the UK and working as a solicitor for the Wiltshire County Council. In this role, he acted as prosecutor and advocate for the council in the county courts and the High Court of Justice. Returning to Tasmania and his work at Wallace, Wilkinson and Webster in 1998, Will practised criminal and personal injury law until he was elected to the Tasmanian Parliament in 2002. He served as the member for Franklin in the House of Assembly until 2020. Will took up the mantle of opposition leader in 2006 and became Tasmanian Premier following the 2014 state election. Winning 23,589 first preference votes, which equated to 35 per cent of the vote, Will topped the poll in Franklin in 2014, despite competing against both Labor Premier Lara Giddings and Greens leader, now Senator Nick McKim. He became the fifth non-Labor Premier in 80 years and only the third Tasmanian Premier to govern in majority. Will Hodgman was re-elected to a second term in government following victory in the 2018 state election, succeeding, succeeding Angus Bethune as Tasmania's longest serving Liberal leader in the process. He received 27,184 first preference votes, extending his support from 2014. After 18 years in the Tasmanian Parliament, Will resigned as Premier, the Tasmanian Liberals' leader and as an MP on the 20th of June 2020. During his time in Parliament, Will's portfolios included Attorney General, Justice, Tourism, Hospitality and Events, Trade, Parks, Heritage, Aboriginal Affairs, Arts, Sport and Recreation, Prevention of Family Violence and Advanced Manufacturing and Defence Industries. In April 2020, Will was appointed as the inaugural chair to oversee the establishment and launch of the Australian Business Growth Fund before taking up his current diplomatic post late last year. Michael and Will Hodgman make up two of the four generations of Hodgman family politicians. This family commitment to political service to Tasmanians and Australians started with Timoth Thomas 
Christopher Hodgman, who was a member of the Tasmanian House of Assembly between 1900 and 1912. Thomas was born in Kent and came to Tasmania with his parents as a young boy. He became a farmer at Tea Tree and was a well-known stock agent with Roberts & Co for more than 30 years. Thomas was elected to the Tasmanian Parliament in 1900 as the member for Brighton in the House of Assembly, transferring to the seat of Monmouth in 1903. When proportional representation was introduced in 1909, Thomas was elected as an anti-socialist member for Franklin, retiring in 1912 when his seat was abolished. Thomas's brother Wilfred Hodgman was a lawyer with Page, Hodgman and Seeger in Hobart. His son Bill, Michael's father and Will's grandfather, was the next Hodgman to enter the law and Tasmanian politics. William Clark, Bill Hodgman, OBE, QC, was born in Hobart in 1909 and attended the Hutchins School and University of Tasmania. A definite trend here, he was the first of the three generations to do so. Bill worked in Melbourne before being admitted to the Supreme Court of Tasmania in 1938. Working with Hobart law firm Crispin Wright, Bill became a leading criminal barrister and was made of Queen's Counsel in 1957. Bill was elected to the Tasmanian Parliament in 1955 as a Liberal member for Denison in the House of Assembly, but became an independent in 1960. He lost his seat in 1964, but was re-elected in 1971 as a member of the Legislative Council for Queenborough. Bill was president of the Legislative Council from June 1981 until his retirement from Parliament in May 1983. Bill was made an officer in the Order of the British Empire in 1979 for service to the community. He died in Hobart in 1997 and was given a state funeral. And like Michael and Will were to do later, Bill served in the Tasmanian Parliament at different times with two of his sons, Michael and Peter, during their political careers. Peter Curtis Lee Hodgman was born in Hobart in 1946 and was elected to the Legislative Council in 1974 as an independent member for Hewan. In 1986, he resigned his seat and successfully contested the House of Assembly seat of Franklin as a Liberal Party member. Between 1986 and 1996, Peter held a number of ministerial portfolios in Robin Gray's Liberal government. These included construction, administrative services, environment, inland fisheries, women, sport and recreation, Antarctic affairs and multicultural and ethnic affairs, where he was assisting the Premier. Peter resigned his state seat in October 2001. As you can see, the Hodgman family, or perhaps I should say dynasty, has made important contributions to both Tasmanian and Australian politics, with this influence continuing today through Will Hodgman's diplomatic efforts on behalf of Australia. We owe a debt of thanks to them for their service. Thank you. Senator Chisholm. Thanks very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about my travel through central Queensland last week with Chris Bowen, Labor's Shadow Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Uh, it was a great opportunity to get out and about with Chris, uh, following him taking over that portfolio of climate change and energy. And obviously, it's an important issue to uh, all Australians, but I think particularly for those uh, through central Queensland, uh, which obviously have a long history and tradition of working in that space. We began the trip in Emerald, where we visited the reopened Gregory Mine, which was shut down a couple of years ago by a BMA, but has been reopened recently by Sodgets. Uh, the day we visited, they had also just been approved to restart their underground operations, um, which had been shut down. So they've got both an open cut operation going, uh, and soon they will also have the underground mine reopened as well. It's a really positive story for the local community in Emerald. Uh, there's more jobs and investment in the region as a result. And the great thing about the Sojitz mine and Gregory mine is that the majority of the workforce, uh, it's up about 85 per cent, uh, come from the local communities. So they live in Emerald or Capella or surrounding areas. So it really was great to meet with Cameron, Ben, Jake and others uh, to hear about the jobs that are being created, uh, the long-term planning for the mine uh, and what the future holds for that community and those workers. Uh, we were able to get out and about and do a tour of the mine. Uh, it was particularly interesting and I've, I've been to a lot of mines now and observed the rehabilitation efforts that are basically continuous as those mines operate. Uh, and the efforts that they are undertaking in this area, including the potential down the track for solar to be used on part of the rehabilitated land. So it shows you uh, the world in which we are living in and what is possible at coal mines into the future. 
Obviously, it's a mine that uses a large, uh, has a large power need, uh, and there is plenty of infrastructure in place uh, to feed those potential solar uh, park back into the grid as well. Uh, we had the opportunity to get up on the drag line and see the sheer volume of material that can be moved. Uh, apparently, this was only a medium-sized drag line, uh, but it was moving something like 100 tonne uh, effortlessly. So I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to go and visit. I thank the workers for taking the time out of their day uh, to enable Chris Bowen and I to learn about their mine, what they do for work and their future as well. Uh, following the mine visit, we drove back into Emerald and we visited uh, the Emerald Solar Park, where Kevin showed us around his site. So it's been operating now for a couple of years. They've got 260,000 panels, producing around 72 megawatts of energy. Uh, and all of that is sold directly to Telstra. Uh, so they use the solar that is being produced in Emerald. Uh, this, this, is, this site is one of many renewable energy projects in the region. Uh, and there is a number of proposed projects which will continue to create jobs as well. Uh, particularly at the moment, there are a number of uh, wind farms that are uh, being pursued uh, throughout regional Queensland and this part of the world. Following the visit to em Emerald Solar Park, uh, we visited uh, the Central Highlands Development Corporation where we met with Councillor Daniel and Peter. And they were able to brief us about their focus on job creation for the region, particularly given Chris Bowen was there, they had a focus on energy as well. Uh, and that was a great opportunity. We had limited time, but it was great just to hear firsthand and certainly a council and a, and a region that uh, are, uh, have good, strong, bold plans for the future and understand the reality of what is happening uh, in regional places like Emerald. Uh, ending the day in Emerald, uh, we met with some of the local mine workers from mines like Encham and Kestrel, uh, and it was great to catch up with uh, these people over a beer and just have a bit of a chat about what is happening in their workplaces, what is happening in the region, uh, and get a general sense of uh, the uh, mood of these communities uh, that has been such a significant part of Powering Australia for years and will continue to do so for many years to come. Uh, the next morning we got up early and headed uh, drove 320 kilometres to Biloela. Uh, so it took us about three and a half hours. Uh, we had a stop in Blackwater on the way and we visited Calide B coal-fired coal power station. Uh, the Calide power station employs around 260 workers. The adjoining mine employs approximately 200 as well. It was first commissioned in 1988 and Calide C, which is the um, adjoining uh, power um, station, was commissioned in 2001. Together they produce around 1,525 megawatts of energy, which is about 20 per cent of Queensland's energy needs. I wanted to thank uh, CS Energy and particularly Lee, Dan, Dave, Scott and Stacey for showing us around the power station. Uh, it was a valuable opportunity to get in and be able to uh, get around, talk to workers, see how it operates and also get a sense of the challenges that are confronting a coal-fired power station that is as old as that one is. Uh, so we, we do understand um, the ageing nature of this. Uh, following the tour, we were able to have uh, morning tea with the workers, so they just issued a general invite to anyone who wanted to come along. And about 30 or 40 of the workers took time to come and have a chat to Chris and myself. And I found that really invaluable, just being able to have uh, quiet conversations with those workers, uh, get a sense of uh, their um, knowledge of what is going on in their industry, but also their understanding of what their future looks like and the type of, of decisions that they have to make about their long-term uh, future, whether it is uh, in a place like Biloela and uh, what the future job opportunities are there, uh, or if it's something that they need to look at. And talking to parents who are making decisions about where their uh, children go to high school and those sorts of things uh, really give you a sense that the decisions we make in this place uh, have such an impact on those people as they go about planning their life. Uh, so we heard some frank views about those ongoing operations and what the future energy generation looks like in that area. Uh, finally, uh, we caught up with the Central Queensland Regional Organisation of Councils, uh, who just happened to be meeting in Bilawila that day as well. Uh, so they were from Rocky, Central Highlands, Banana and Gladstoneshire. And we got to hear from them about uh, their needs for the communities and the importance of local jobs being created, uh, with a particular focus on energy, uh, but they didn't miss the opportunity to talk about inland rail with Gladstone as well. And one of the key messages from this trip that I took out, and this was consistent 
no matter what industry, uh, whether it be council, uh, whether it be workers as well. And that is the government needs to have a plan. And that is what is sadly lacking from this government. Uh, they, these people don't have their heads buried in the sand. Uh, they understand what the future holds, but they also want to ensure they can continue to live and enjoy life in these parts of the state. Uh, they want to ensure that businesses continue to invest and create jobs and create the future uncertainty that comes with that. Uh, we know that the energy market changes. Uh, demand for power will actually continue to increase as we see things like more electric cars being bought and driven, uh, and there will be more demand for electricity as a result. Uh, we need to invest in grid and in new projects um, to meet this demand, and I have no doubt that this will create jobs and investment in regional Queensland. And I think the contrast couldn't have been more clear last week uh, when we saw the closure of the Yalorn power station or the announcement of the closure of the Yalorn power station. And instead of the federal minister actually working constructively with the state counterparts, uh, all we saw from the federal minister was him having pot shots at the state of Victoria in terms of how that uh, closure is managed and transitioned. And it is so frustrating because you go to these parts of Queensland um, that do have significant workforce in this region. And you just know that it would be so important and so valuable if you actually had a federal and state government working together on these challenges. But instead, all we see from the federal government in relation to this uh, is an opportunity to take pot shots, an opportunity to create division, an opportunity to run scare campaigns, uh, rather than dealing with the reality of what uh, Queenslanders and Australians are confronting in regional communities. So I really thank Chris Bowen for uh, his time in regional Queensland. Uh, he has, over a long period of time, no matter what portfolio he's been in, always been someone who's been willing to get out, travel, uh, listen and learn. Uh, it was a great first step for his first visit to regional Queensland. I'm confident over the course of the next 12 months that he will be a regular visitor as Labor starts to talk more about what our plans are. Uh, we will be up front with these communities. Uh, we will engage them in discussion and it will only be a Labor government that can offer those regional communities a better vision and opportunity for the future. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy Madam, Madam President. Okay, I've had it up to here with DVA. I've absolutely had it. I don't know how the veterans out there are able to take it, because I'm not far from breaking point myself. And as for the guys working in my office, how they have not got Comcare claims in yet is beyond me. And I can tell you, I'm at a point where I don't know what else to do. You can keep fighting and fighting, and the Department of Veterans Affairs still will not admit it has a massive problem. It is completely in chaos. There are veterans out there who are dying before they can get help from the department that's supposed to be looking after them. There are veterans who are being cut out from help and off. They have nowhere else to go. We are beyond crisis point. We are absolutely beyond crisis point. And to be honest, I'm scared, I'm angry and I'm frustrated, but underneath it all, I'm terribly afraid. I don't like to show it and it doesn't come naturally to me, but I am frightened. I'm frightened for my mate, Brad Fusen. I've told you guys in here before about Brad. Brad served, served 10 years in the Australian Army, including in East Timor. He's a 41-year-old national hero. He's put his body on the line for our country. He's saved a life and limb for people and children who couldn't protect themselves. But his time in service has broken his body. The ADF broke his body. Repetitive shockwaves to his head have given him brain damage and Parkinson's. His brain no longer commutes effectively with his heart. His body will suddenly slump over, he gets feverish and he fatigues easily. And two or three times a day he has what he calls an episode where he freezes and cannot speak or move. God love his wife, Laura, and their young boys who have to resuscitate him frequently because delays in his treatment have made his brain injuries worse. All of this has left him with Parkinson's disease, early onset dementia, respiratory failure and full autonomic dysfunction. His condition is terminal. Not only that, his mental health is absolutely busted. 
He's the kind of guy who stops 40 metres behind a car at Macca's drive through because his road will blow up. And he's not the only veteran. Like so many other veterans, he carries a shadow of war around with him everywhere he goes. Laura keeps him going. She's his rock. She gives him the strength he needs to carry on. She does everything she can to keep him here. But his situation is getting so bad and there's only so much she can do. My heart breaks for both of them and their children. And I can't tell you enough just how worried I am about what's about to happen to Mr Fewson. I don't want to have to attend this man's coronial inquest. I've seen too many veterans die and I can't watch him go as well. I just can't. It's way too many. I am begging, at begging point, and if you need me to get down on my hands and knees, God, and I will, the Department of Veterans Affairs, please help this man. Please help him. Please help him. You know what needs to be done. I know what needs to be done. We all know what works. We just need the people in leadership to have the will and the courage to get it done. It's all there on paper for you. Brad is one of the first veterans in Australia to get hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It absolutely transforms him. It keeps him alive. It gives him the oxygen it needs to keep him alive. He's gone completely from being out of it to being back to himself again. He can talk again with it. He can write again with it. He can speak words. He can say to his wife, I love you. And speaking those words, I love you, that's what the therapy gave him the strength to do. But Department of Veterans Affairs are not going to pay for him to get that therapy anymore. They won't pay for him to get to Melbourne so he can have the therapy he needs to take his next breath of oxygen. They won't pay for his accommodation while he gets the therapy he needs. They've basically cut Brad off, waiting for him to die. All because of some paper pusher in Canberra says he doesn't have a referral for the therapy he needs to keep him alive. Well, you've had this for 16 months, Department of Veterans Affairs. You've had it for 16 months. It's sitting in his medical file. Get yourselves an appointment to spec savers and get it sorted. Wake up. Because without this treatment, you know and I know he's going to die and we're all going to a coronial inquest. And by God, I will not hold back on your department. I'll bring the minister in. I'll bring the secretary in. I'll bring the MO in. You're all coming in. I've got all the evidence. What you have done to this man and his family is beyond disgusting. It is incompetent. Absolutely incompetent. You're killing him. You're killing him. Typical delay, deny, die, isn't it? Nothing goes away. Still branded the department, delay, deny, die. This is what you are doing to our veterans. This is what you are doing. And it's not just the veterans who suffer, it's their families too. And by God, are they suffering. Brad's wife, Laura, is all of about 28 kilos. That is where she is at. The stress is killing her. She's his full-time carer because you can't even get his carers right. You can't even get 24-hour carers right for him. You are so incompetent. You are so incompetent. She's on her own and she's exhausted. How many times do I need to tell you people that? How many times do I need to tell the minister? How many times do I need to tell the hierarchy of the Department of Veterans Affairs? When are one of you going to do something? Because when he dies, it is too late. Absolutely too late. I can tell you now, she can't hold much longer. And you cannot expect her to. Both of these people are extremely strong, Brad and Laura, but her strength will only go so far before there is nothing left. The full weight of, the, of a lying department, an uncaring department, and a covering up department, because that's all you do, cover up your incompetence, is a heavy burden to bear. And it's too much for a sick man to carry on his shoulders. 
a dying man at that. Getting them to sit up and take notice is taking everything I've got. And I'm exhausted. They're exhausted. And there are other veterans out there who are exhausted with dealing with your incompetent bureaucracy in that department. You are finished. You are gone. You might as well just shut the door. It's over. How many more are you going to kill? How many more? These people, they're human beings. They're not numbers. They're not numbers. They're human beings. Where are you, Minister Chester? Where are you, Minister? Six weeks ago, I sat down with you for 45 minutes and went about Brad Fuston's issues. What was going on? What was going on? What have you done? What have you done? What have you done, Darren? Absolutely nothing. You got a dying man there, big boy. Fix it. I've spoken to Liz Cousins. Absolutely waste of space. And in desperation, I even called the cut rate commissioner this morning because I'm at my wit's end. I'm done. I've been on this for 15, 16 months and nothing's changed. Their kids are going through hell and God knows how Brad keeps breathing every morning. This is the state our veterans are in. I hear it every day. In my office, I have Karen, who works on veteran cases every single day. There have been 1,200 of them come through our books since I've been back in parliament. And they've come for help. And the government and the department can pat themselves on the back all they like, but me and my team, we know what's going on on the ground. And so does everyone else out there. You are not fit for purpose. You are finished. For goodness sake, stop mucking around with their lives and call a royal commission. It is enough. And God help you. God help you if you do not help Brad and his family in the next 24 hours. Because I swear to God, it'll be the biggest coronial inquest you'll ever see. Because I'll be there on the stand. I'll be there with all your cover up, your material and your lies on what you have done to this man and his family. God help you! Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I recently had the uh, great pleasure of attending the 200th anniversary Mass uh, of, to celebrate Catholic education uh, in Australia. Uh, and it, was, it took place just down the road from here at St Christopher's Cathedral in Manuka. And it was fantastic to join uh, with my local Archdiocese of Canberra and Goulburn and celebrate the very substantial contribution uh, made by Catholic schools to Australian education. It's often overlooked, but many of us in this place enjoyed the education provided to us by a local Catholic school. Now, it was 107 years after the first Catholic school in Australia was established that Canberra established its first Catholic school, although uh, if we go to the broader diocese, there were a number of Catholic schools in the region, I think, from around the mid-19th century. But in terms of Canberra, uh, it was 1927, uh, and St Christopher's School and Convent was established by the local archdiocese. Uh, this school would later fold and is now the site of the Catholic Education Office adjacent to the cathedral. Understanding the history of the Catholic school system is crucial to understanding the broader development of Australia uh, and indeed uh, here in the ACT. Uh, it is of course no lie that without this private investment that our education system would look very different. And in fact, um, I'm reminded that it's in our region that it was the Goulburn strike uh, that famously led to a change in education policy at a national level, uh, a change which I think has been very positive. Now, the 1,746 Catholic schools in Australia underpin the high quality learning and education of more than 764,100 students and support 77,035 staff and their families. Uh, there can be no doubt that this contribution has taken pressure off the public education system as we meet our growing population's education needs. Uh, it's also a major theme of Catholic education to not only contribute to parish life uh, but to also serve all facets of secular Australian life. 
While at the anniversary mass, I was reminded of my own uh, education uh, here at St Thomas the Apostle in Canberra, followed by uh, Padua Catholic High School in St Peter's. Uh, they've now merged to become uh, St Mary MacKillop College, a great local school uh, with a campus in Waniassa and a campus in Isabella Plains. And I always valued uh, that education. I was encouraged to explore academic and other goals. Um, uh, but the education was also infused uh, in the Catholic faith, and this was a point made uh, by, very eloquently by Archbishop Christopher Prouse uh, during his homily on the day. An education system uh, founded on Catholic values and principles uh, will help to instil an enduring and positive legacy for future generations to come. As a parent, the Catholic and broader non-government school sector offers choice for parents in their children's education alongside a very strong and well-resourced public education system. Choice is incredibly important in any sector, but none is more important than in the choice parents have in terms of their children's education. So I wanted to take the opportunity to thank the Catholic Education Office on hosting uh, a wonderful Mass, uh, congratulate them uh, and more broadly uh, the system for the 200 years of contribution to Australian life and, uh, and education. And I wanted to particularly thank all of the teachers, uh, all of the staff and all of those who have contributed uh, over that time. I wanted to also uh, today speak about some of the great infrastructure initiatives uh, that the federal government, the Liberal National Government, has committed to uh, right here in Canberra and in our region. And this increased infrastructure funding uh, through the local roads and community infrastructure program is a direct product and is part of our government's infrastructure bonanza for Canberra. It has been an absolute bonanza. And as part of this program, I was pleased to join with Deputy Prime Minister Michael McCormick to announce the Commonwealth's plan to fund restoration work on the Commonwealth Avenue Bridge. And for those who have had the pleasure of visiting our great city, the Commonwealth Avenue Bridge is always a major feature along the drive uh, to, uh, between north and south. Uh, now, the upgrade, which will be delivered by the National Capital Authority, will strengthen the bridge to prevent structural damage, widen the pedestrian pathways and replace the vehicle safety barriers to improve road safety and uh, you know this comes uh, on, on the back of that we had an announcement for uh, a contribution of 132 million dollars uh, for the light rail for stage 2a of the light rail uh, and and the, the bonanza goes on uh, the federal government is also committed to funding new security landscaping scoreboard repairs as well as thermal and smoke detectors throughout Monica Oval and GIO Stadium four million dollars in extra funding for surge road maintenance including hot asphalt patching and resealing to repair recent rain damage and prevent future damage. A million dollars to purchase 3,000 plants to enhance Canberra's living infrastructure in areas of low canopy cover and to replace ageing trees. It goes on, 1.26 million to install new shade sails and fencing at priority playgrounds to make these spaces cooler and safer. A new competition standard halfpipe at Belcon Skate Park on Emu Bank. Uh, and of course, I mentioned uh, the overall investments in infrastructure, and of course, that is underpinned by the $500 million that we are investing in the expansion of the Australian War Memorial, something that will be a legacy for future generations as we uh, more fully honour our veterans, uh, but of course, will be very important here in Canberra as we see not just those construction jobs. Uh, but also we see the uplift for tourism as our most loved and most visited attraction uh, gets a major expansion. We'll see more visitors coming to the city from uh, our region, uh, from around Australia and indeed from around the world. And as I said, this is part of a bonanza for Canberra, $1.4 billion that has been committed to infrastructure projects across the Territory in recent years. Uh, this includes the Monero Highway, the Tuggeranong Parkway, the Malonglo Valley Bridge, uh, the duplication of Gundaroo Drive, uh, the, um, the Kings Highway, the Barton Highway. We are seeing huge investments uh, right around the ACT. And finally, uh, Mr President, I'd love to uh, talk a little bit about the Ricky Stewart Foundation. Uh, now, now, for my fellow NRL lovers, Ricky Stewart has been, of course, a huge name in the game for many years, a great player and now, indeed, a great coach for our, uh, our local Canberra Raiders. Uh, and I would like to also, though, point out some of his work off the field. 
So the Ricky Stewart Foundation was established in 2011 to support Ricky in raising awareness for autism, as well as to raise funds to directly support the aftercare of autism spectrum, spectrum disorders and help family members who may struggle to cope. Aftercare is critical to ensuring that families and those with autism can carry on with their lives in the most positive way possible once a diagnosis has been given. Together with the help of the government's National Disability Insurance Scheme, foundations like the Ricky Stewart Foundation provide short-term respite right here in Canberra for families struggling with disabilities. Over the past 10 years, the foundation has built and run $3.5 million in respite facilities for Canberra families to use. With Ricky Stewart House in Chifley and Emma Ruby House in Cook already in operation, it was exciting to hear that a third the John Fordham House will begin construction shortly. Now, while this facility will be built just over the border in Queanbeyan, it will add to the tremendous work the Foundation has done so far. John Fordham House will, be, will aim to be a facility where disabled young adults can learn to achieve full independence. The facility will be individual living, village atmosphere for people with disabilities to be able to live on their own while having support available for when it's required. I want to again reiterate my thanks to Ricky and the Ricky Stewart Foundation and commend them on their outstanding work. Anyone? Oh, we're about to. We're not quite. If any, we've got a minute left. If anyone. Well, I'll take that minute. Like, I think I'm next on the please. list. Sorry, There's no there. substitute for JobKeeper, and the aviation plan that the government announced will not guarantee jobs in Cairns jobs in tourism destinations. It's hopeless, it's hapless, it's friendless, and it will not do the job of guaranteeing that people on the ground who have been hardest hit by the closure of international borders will have their jobs. Every single job that is lost because JobKeeper is cut is on this government. They are responsible. They need to step in. And there is no substitute for JobKeeper. The flight announcement that this government made is Order. not enough. Senator Green, it is not thank good you. enough. We'll move to questions without notice. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My uh, question is to the minister representing the, min uh, the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. The Morrison government promised uh, 4 million cor uh, coronavirus vaccines would be administered by the end of March. How many vaccines have been administered to date and how many will be administered by the 31st of March? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and uh, thanks, Senator Dodson, for the question. Mr President, the um, Senator is right. The government laid out a plan to roll out vaccination to Australians across the country um, to protect them against COVID-19 and to, of course, allow the Australian economy to re return to normal. Well, Mr. President, I'll take the interjection, and, and, and I think it is actually is going quite well, Mr. President. We've had some Order. we've had some interruption to our supply from international sources, and Mr. President, everybody would understand that, Mr. President. And so, to date, over 200,000 Australians have received their uh, vaccination uh, across the country, and that. Number continues, that, that number continues to ramp up as we extend the, uh, the rollout of vaccination. And Mr President, uh, today we have announced that um, the, the facilities, the GP services, that will start vaccinating Australians over a thousand sites around the country in phase 1B as of next week. We continue to build and grow the vaccination process for Australia. As, vaccination, uh, as vaccines become available uh, and as the capacity of the system is built, Mr. President. So we have today vaccinated over 200,000 Australians and we continue to grow that. We continue to build the capacity of the, of the system in Australia to do that through uh, GPs, as of next week, through uh, Commonwealth vaccination clinics, uh, through um, through, through those processes, and of course, the states are currently rolling out their vaccines at varying rates. I must, I must admit, Mr. President, but the states are rolling out their vaccines to their frontline health workers as a part of Phase 1A, Mr. President. Order, so Senator the Colbeck. Time for the order on my left. 
Senator Dodson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Prime Minister has told uh, this Parliament that economic confidence will be, and I quote, reinforced by the rollout of the vaccination program. What impact will the Morrison government's failure to deliver on its promise to administer 4,000 vaccines by the end of March have on the economy and jobs? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm glad someone else has trouble with numbers. Uh, Mr. President, and I accept that the, the, the number that uh, Senator Dodson was talking about was 4 million, not 4,000. Uh, so, Mr. President, uh, I, I, re I reject the base premise of the question that Senator Dodson put um, in the context of uh, where the government's situation sits. He's right, though, in the context of the confidence that it will give to Australians uh, as, the, as the vaccine rolls out, Mr. President. But as we all know, as we all order. know, we have had some order. constraint in supply from overseas, Mr. President. We we have had some order. constraint in, in supply from overseas, Mr. President. And and the opposition might like try, to try and downplay that, but that is a reality. We've always order accepted on my that, that was, an, uh, was was an issue that we might confront. But we are Senator in a very Gallagher. fortunate position, Mr. President, to have sovereign supply in this country, and we will continue to roll that in the uh, order. That Senator Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. Order. Senator Dodson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, given the effect of the slow rollout of the vaccination program on the economy and jobs. Is the Morrison government reconsidering ending JobKeeper in just 11 days? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, the government's position with respect to JobKeeper I think is very well understood. That has been made public uh, on a number of occasions, and so that's, that, that, is, that is exceptionally well understood, Mr President. Uh, but we will continue to, to build and grow the rollout of the vaccine with the objective of having Australians have their first dose of the vaccine by the end of October, which was always our, always our target, Mr. President. Order. We said that we would start the vaccination process in, in February, and we've done that. We've said that we would start the rollout of Phase 1B in, uh, in March, and we are doing that, Mr. President. And we will continue to build and develop the rollout of vaccines across, across the country to ensure that. Uh, Australians can be protected from coronavirus and, Mr President, that the Australian economy can continue to recover from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Order. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the Minister update the Senate on the impact of COVID-19 on Papua New Guinea and advise how Australia is supporting our close friend and neighbour? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Macdonald for her very important question. Uh, Mr. President, as the Prime Minister and I uh, announced this morning, Australia is standing with Papua New Guinea as they respond to a serious and widespread outbreak in COVID cases. The Prime Minister, the Minister for International Development in the Pacific, and I and our High Commissioner in uh, Port Moresby have been in regular contact with our Papua New Guinea colleagues uh, and the Papua New Guinea government on how we can partner to assist in the response effort. Mr President, 2,479 cases have been officially reported, which is a surge of over 1,180 since the 27th of February. While the outbreak is concentrated in Port Moresby, there are cases in provinces across Papua New Guinea, and sadly there have been 31 recorded deaths. Australia has responded to our nearest neighbour and our Pacific family, uh, indeed through the pivot of our aid program under our Partnerships for Recovery and our COVID-19 response plans. The work that we've announced today is in strong partnership with Papua New Guinea based on their priorities and their needs. I noted earlier that our High Commissioner has been working closely with the Papua New Guinea government uh, to ensure our support is well targeted to Papua New Guinea's needs. Uh, indeed, his team are also part of Papua New Guinea's national COVID-19 technical working group. Uh, over the last week, Australia has assisted to increase the number of beds available for COVID patients uh, and funded St John's Ambulance Service Papua New Guinea to increase its capacity. That's for patient transport, for COVID testing, for PPE distribution to clinics. Uh, Australia has also added ballast to Papua New Guinea's National Control Centre. Uh, from our own experience, we know that communications, that risk and quarantine management are absolutely critical. 
We'll work closely with our partners in Papua New Guinea, uh, Mr. President, particularly the health authorities and the National Control Centre, in addressing this crisis. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. Will the minister advise what further support Australia can provide to Papua New Guinea? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. With the agreement of Papua New Guinea, uh, Australia will provide 8,000 vaccine doses from our stocks to fill a critical gap, while the COVAX facility, to which Australia has also contributed, uh, prepares to deliver vaccines to Papua New Guinea. That focus will be for frontline workers who are very exposed uh, at the moment. We're also providing $144 million to support Papua New Guinea's priorities and planning in their own vaccine program. With the agreement of Papua New Guinea, Australia is also asking AstraZeneca and European authorities to access one million doses of our contracted supplies for Papua New Guinea. Uh, today, Mr. President, Defence will transport uh, 2,000 tents for safe triaging, referral and transfer of patients outside Port Moresby General Hospital. We'll provide surgical masks, uh, P295 respirator masks, protective gowns and goggles, gloves, sanitizer and face shields. And our OSMAT team, which arrives on Monday, will work with Papua Order. New Guinea authorities on infection control, Senator triage and McDonald's, public health measures. A final supplementary question. Will the Administrator advise how keeping Australians safe from COVID-19 requires us to also provide assistance to our close neighbours and also to keep our borders strong in far north Queensland? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, as the government has announced, from tonight we will suspend passenger flights from Papua New Guinea to Cairns for a two-week period. Uh, I want to assure, that, uh, assure colleagues and assure the Senate that freight will continue uh, to make sure that the movement of essential and humanitarian supplies uh, is available and continues for Papua New Guinea. We will also suspend charter flights from Papua New Guinea with limited exemptions. Uh, we will reduce passenger caps from Port Moresby to Brisbane. Uh, we will suspend outbound travel exemptions to Papua New Guinea other than for essential workers. Australia and Papua New Guinea are working in partnership to prevent cross-border transmission, including in the Torres Strait, where of course family and cultural cross-border connections are strong. Our vaccine support will also include Papua New Guinea's western province. Non-government organisations will play an important role in community engagement and mobilisation activities for these programs. I also want to acknowledge the uh, support of Warren Edge, the member for Leichhardt, Payne, and Queensland Health, which is cooperating in the vaccination. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In my home state of New South Wales, more than 350,000 workers will be affected by the Morrison government ending JobKeeper in just 11 days. How many of the more than 350,000 workers will lose their jobs? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. And, uh, well, indeed, I, I reject uh, uh, the interjection that was made before I'd even started, uh, started my response there from Senator Watt. Uh, what, uh, what our government is confident of, and indeed, and indeed the advice that has been received uh, from and made public in various statements by the Governor of the Reserve Bank, uh, by the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, is to expect to continue to see jobs growth and jobs recovery as a result uh, of the continued stimulus and activity going in across the Australian economy. JobKeeper has absolutely saved many jobs. JobKeeper, in fact, has saved more than 700,000 jobs on the estimates, of, Order, on the estimates of experts. Other measures we've put in place, for example, the tax cuts that I was talking in this chamber about yesterday, putting an extra $1 billion a month into the pockets of Australian households, are continuing to drive extra economic activity and extra support. The $1.2 billion package announced in recent weeks in relation to support the aviation, travel and tourism sectors will again provide additional activity job support across the Australian economy. The fact that the investment incentive measures we put in place and the loss carryback measures that are there provide additional support for businesses across the Australian economy and continue to underpin jobs. Now, JobKeeper was, as we always said, intended to be temporary, Mr President, a temporary targeted measure. And what those opposite seem to forget is that's also what the Labor Party also called for. Order, Mr. Sorry, Albanese, Senator, Senator Mr. Birmingham, Albanese, I have Senator O'Neill on a point of order. 
Senator O'Neill. There was only one question, so my point is with regard to relevance. I know that um, Senator, uh, Senator Birmingham will roll out the list, but the question is on behalf of workers, 350,000 of them affected by the, sh the shutdown of JobKeeper in 11 days. And my question asked one thing. How many of the more than 350,000 workers will lose their jobs? They want to know this Senator information, Senator I've, I've allowed you to restate your question. I, it, the minister was directly talking about the subject matter, which was about the employment impact of that particular policy, so I believe he has been directly relevant, as I can't instruct him how to answer a question nor to accept the terms of a question. Senator Birmingham, to continue. Thanks, Mr. President. So we know plenty of jobs have been saved. We know we've seen growth month after month in terms of new jobs across the Australian economy. And we also know that Mr. Albanese said that JobKeeper will need a tapering off. He said that back in May last year. Back in May last year, he said it would need a tapering Order, off. Senator Birmingham, and that is precisely what this government has done. Has expired. Order. 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 I'll call Senator O'Neill when there's order. Senator Watt, always not good to be the last voice heard. Always, Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. President. More than 110,000 businesses in New South Wales will be impacted by the JobKeeper ending in just 11 days with $345 million withdrawn from the local economy each fortnight. How many of the more than 110,000 New, New South Wales businesses will close? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, 813,600. That's the number of jobs created in the last eight months. 813,600 jobs added back into the Australian economy. 93 per cent of those who had lost work at the height of the pandemic back in work, and the government delivering on its policies as we had always outlined and promised. We always said that our, target, that our policies in response to this would be targeted and they'd be proportionate. We always said that JobKeeper would taper, would taper off as indeed the opposition had called for. We also always said that it would come to an end at the appropriate time, as also the opposition called for, because Mr Albanese said that we need a sensible, pragmatic transition out of the order. process. Senator, out of the well, process. Senator Birmingham, I have Senator Watt on a point of order. Senator Birmingham had eight, eight seconds left, I believe. Senator Watt? On relevance, in the remaining eight seconds, perhaps the minister would care to answer the question, which is how many more of the more than 110,000 businesses will close? I was listening carefully to the ministers. I, I, Senator Watt, I'm ruling. Miss Senator Watt, I, I, I can't. In a point of, I allow points of order to emphasise the point of a question, but with respect, I believe the minister was being directly relevant. You're asking me to instruct him to answer in certain terms. He was specifically talking about the policy raise. Um, you've made your point, and there's an opportunity to debate the merits of answers after question time. Senator Birmingham, have you concluded, or do you have eight, you have eight seconds remaining? Order. Mr President, we're simply doing what the Labor Party used to call for, but of course, once again, they've changed their position for political expediency. Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Order on my right and my left. Order. I'm calling Senator O'Neill for it. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. Kerry Glassick. Kerry Glassick, founding director of Venue 505 and the old 505 Theatre, the very venue Minister Fletcher used to launch the details of his Live Music Australia program, has said, and I quote, We have no future in New South Wales without JobKeeper. Venue 505 is closing at the end of March. What does the minister have to say to Kerry? Senator Birmingham. Mr. Mr. President, we have faced— Order on my left. We have faced— a global economic disruption, the greatest since, the most significant since the Great Depression. Australia has managed to come through this, faring better than nearly Order any other left. nation. Than nearly any other nation. Now, it is not possible for government to guarantee 
the survival of every single business or of every single job. Order. What Senator government needs to do is to Senator make sure that we continue the trajectory of economic growth and jobs growth that we have been on since the Senator depths Watt. of this crisis hit. And that is exactly what all of our policies are geared to do. Senator all Watt. of our policies are geared to keep businesses sustainable, to keep jobs growing, to generate more jobs. And with 813,000 jobs in the last eight months, those Order. policies Senator are clearly Birmingham, working. Senator time for the answer has expired. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. There were three Aboriginal deaths in custody last week, in one week, bringing the number to almost 500. We are only 3.3 per cent of this population. Next month marks the 30th anniversary of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody's final report. Our people are screaming for justice. What will you do to end Aboriginal deaths in custody? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. And, uh, and these are serious issues that Senator Thorpe raises. Uh, all Aboriginal deaths in custody are tragedy, and every single death that occurs in custody are a tragedy. It is an ongoing problem and challenge for the nation uh, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are overrepresented in our adult and youth justice systems. Uh, both as offenders and as victims, and that, uh, indeed, while the rates of death in custody for Indigenous prisoners is lower than for non-Indigenous prisoners, any death in custody is one too many. As the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody found, the fundamental issue is that too many Aboriginal people are in custody too often. The new national agreement on closing the gap includes targets for reducing the rates of adult incarceration by at least 15 per cent, which is target 10, and for youth detention amongst Indigenous Australians by at least 30 per cent by 2031, which is target 11. And the Indigenous Advancement Strategy of the government funds activities to complement the efforts of states and territories to improve justice and community safety outcomes for Indigenous Australians. Some $261.3 million has been committed in 2020-21 alone. We recognise the seriousness uh, of these issues uh, and through the Closing the Gap uh, Agreement uh, are committed to working with uh, states and territories, uh, but also most importantly individual communities, uh, to seek uh, to overcome uh, and address these issues, but we know there is no quick or silver bullet to doing so. Uh, it is why, though, we have spelt out clear targets, clear funding, uh, and work to try to address uh, this tragedy uh, that Order. ensues. Senator Thorpe, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. This government needs to close their own gap. It's been 30 years since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody released its final report. The government refuses to implement all of the report's recommendations that could save black lives today. This would also prevent the loss, trauma and grief that we experience every Senator single Thorpe, day. Why haven't you done anything? The question has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, I understand that uh, an independent review into the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody uh, was conducted in 2017. At the time, it found that the Australian government and governments of all political persuasions uh, had fully or mostly implemented 91 per cent of recommendations for which the Australian government has responsibility. And it also found that 18 partially implemented recommendations have largely been superseded by subsequent government actions and policies, uh, that, uh, that 78 per cent of the 339 recommendations in total, noting that many of those related to states and territories uh, as the uh, operators of the judicial system, uh, have been fully or mostly implemented, uh, 16 per cent partially implemented. 
uh, and that around 90 per cent of recommendations relating to the order, safety of Indigenous Senator Australians Thorpe. taken into custody so and fully or mostly order, implemented. Thorpe. Yes, point of order for misleading the chamber. Oh, sorry, Senator Thorpe. Um, a point of order can only be about compliance with the standing orders. Um, merits of answers can be debated after question time. Well, point of order on relevance. And the relevance being my question was around what is the government going to do about the recommendations, not give me a spiel on what recommendations have been implemented okay. or not implemented and a dodgy, dodgy Senator, report Senator Thorpe, please, that Senator they Thorpe, base Senator Thorpe, on desktop I've, 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 only. I've, I've allowed you to um, make your point of order. There's an opportunity to debate the merits of answers after question time, but I believe the minister is being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the, the point being the recommendations have overwhelmingly been implemented by governments of all persuasions, but acknowledging there continues Order, to be Senator a job Birmingham. to be done. Senator Thorpe, a final supplementary question. Again, there were three Aboriginal deaths in custody just last week alone. That's three families and communities that are now in terrible pain. What do you have to say to them? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I would say, and I imagine that I would be joined uh, by uh, all other senators, that we are deeply sorry for their anguish, for their loss, uh, for the pain felt, for the pain felt uh, in those families and those communities, for the circumstances that led to those individuals being in custody, for the failings in relation to in systems or in communities that brought them to the point of being in custody, but that we are determined to continue to try to find pathways to reduce the rate of Indigenous incarceration, that we will continue, as governments have been, state and territory, Commonwealth, Labor and Liberal, to implement the recommendations and to go beyond the recommendations Order. in a number of other policies Order, and measures Senator. most recently outlined in the National Agreement on Closing the Gap and that we're committed to continue to work with Order. communities in partnership Order, to Birmingham. achieve those Time outcomes. The answer has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Minister, can you advise the Senate on the progress of the national COVID-19 vaccine rollout, please? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Van, for his question. Mr President, we're now into week four of the mass vaccine rollout across Australia, and we are prioritising the most vulnerable in society, as we should, to receive the vaccine first, Mr President. Each week, each week more aged care residents, border, quarantine and frontline health workers have had the opportunity to receive their first dose of the vaccine. This week, Mr President, we also, also saw the start of the second dose round being administered, so we are now in the position to start to have fully immunised uh, citizens against the COVID-19 virus. Both the Pfizer, uh, BioNTech and the AstraZeneca vaccine require two doses to be fully immunised. The Pfizer vaccine, 21 days apart, Mr. President, and the AstraZeneca vaccine, 12 weeks apart. Senator Van, I'm sure you'll be glad to hear that vaccinations are gathering pace in your home state of Victoria. So far, more than 38,900 people in Victoria have had a jab against COVID. Next week, we'll begin phase 1B of our vaccination program, which includes vulnerable groups, including older people, people with underlying medical conditions. Mr. President, we are enlisting general practices across the country to play a major role in the vaccination rollout and have been heartened by the enthusiasm of, vaccine, uh, of GPs to get on board our vaccination program. Uh, 1,100 will be commencing next week. Mr President, we thank all Australians, including our frontline workers, uh, GPs, for their commitment and hard work in rolling out the vaccination in this country. We are getting on with delivering the vaccine and it will underpin our health and economic recovery. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank Order. you, Mr President. Can the minister also update the Senate on how many people have been vaccinated so far in Australia? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. 
Mr. President, uh, as I've said earlier today, more than 203,500 Australians have been vaccinated as a part of our vaccination rollout so far, including more than 45,000 more than 45,000 aged care residents in over 500 aged care facilities. Indeed, we have been progressively ramping up our rollout in aged care homes, and today 26 uh, facilities across the country will receive vaccinations. Mr. President. Health care teams will also be vis visiting 35 aged care facilities for the second time to deliver second doses to our most vulnerable citizens. Mr. President, in coming weeks, the vaccination program will reach more than 2,500 residential aged care facilities, and more than 183,000 residents will be vaccinated, uh, uh, including uh, uh, 339,000 staff. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister expand on how Australia's general pra practitioner GPs will assist with the mass vaccine rollout in the country? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and Senator Van, more than 1,000, in fact, more than 1,100 general practices will join the COVID vaccination program from next week. GP services will progressively come online from March 22, which is what we said would happen uh, when we announced the vaccination rollout program. By the end of April, we will have more than 4,000 GP services assisting us with the vaccination program. This staged scale-up will align with the supply of AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca vaccine, and as more vaccine becomes available, more services will come online. There are six million people in the second phase of the vaccine rollout, and I want to assure Australians that everyone who wants a vaccine will get one, but Mr. President, I would also urge them to be patient. As the vaccine becomes available, we will make it available to Australians. Senator Gallagher. Order on my right. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. And my question is to the Acting Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Defence Minister Senator Reynolds promised last year to secure a contracted requirement of 60 per cent minimum local content for the future submarines program. Can the Acting Minister for Defence confirm that this contractual agreement has still not been finalised? And when will the revised contract actually be finalised? The Acting Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Gallagher for his question. The government, of course, expects defence industry doing business uh, with Australia to meet their commitments, to manage their costs and to deliver projects on time and according to our specifications. And that, Mr President, will not be done at the expense of Australian jobs and Australian industry. In the case of the attack class submarine, we expect that Naval Group's commitment to spend a minimum of 60 per cent of their contract value in Australia will be finalised as a matter of priority. As we come out of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has never been more important for the government to back in Australian industry, and that is what we are going to do. We have been very clear that we will not agree to provisions in the strategic partnering agreement that are not meaningful and measurable over the long duration of the program or dilute the protections we currently have. The government is a strong client and will maintain a fit-for-purpose agreement for decades to come. Mr President, I am advised that Defence and Naval Group have made progress on the agreement, with details being worked through to finalise the amendments to the strategic partnering agreement. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. The Chief Executive of the Australian Industry and Defence Network, uh, Mr. Brent Clark, has said that the agreement, and I quote, will go to the very heart of our, how Australian industry is to be brought into the supply chain for the submarine and that it needs to be made public to ensure transparency. Is Mr. Clark wrong? Senator Payne. Mr President, I haven't seen the specific remarks of Mr Clark, so I'll take those uh, on face value from Senator Gallagher, of course. Um, I do want to be clear about the amendments to the strategic partnering agreement, though, because they'll detail provisions that apply to Naval Group's achievement of the commitment, including both remedies and incentives. And as with all provisions in the strategic partnering agreement and, indeed, other major defence contracts, as Senator Gallagher is well aware from his extended period of time on committees that deal with these matters in the parliament, with 
specifics of these amendments will remain commercially sensitive. Similar to our other projects, AIC performance will of course remain subject to parliamentary scrutiny through the Senate estimates process and the program will remain the subject, as it has been, of ongoing regular reviews by the ANAO. Senator Gallagher, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Acting Minister of Defence, Senator Payne, has previously argued against a local minimum contact content requirement in contracts for the future attack class submarines, asserting it would create a ceiling, not a floor on local content. Is this why the Acting Minister will refuse to reveal details of any Australian content requirement, as reported in today's Australian Financial Review? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. The answer to Senator Gallagher's question is no. Uh, I've been clear in relation to uh, the finalisation of the 60 per cent AIC commitment, uh, the nature of the protection of the provisions in terms of the uh, uh, commercial sensitivity of those, uh, and they are matters, as I said, of which Senator Gallagher is well aware. Uh, Mr President, in concluding my answer, may I also seek the indulgence of the Senate to refer to uh, the members of the National Rural Women's Coalition muster who are here in the gallery in the Senate chamber today, from Christmas Island to Pakenham and Hamilton to Noosa Shire and Weeper to Wagga Wagga and multiple locations in between. May I welcome them to the Senate? Yeah. Senator Rennick. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Could the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting small business and the Australian economy to recover strongly from COVID-19, including through our plan for lower taxes, which is giving Australian households and small businesses more of their money back? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Rennick for his question. And, uh, Mr. President, the Morrison government, those of us on this side of the chamber, the one thing we well and truly all agree on is that tax cuts well and truly benefit the economy. We believe that lower taxes are the best way for our economy to thrive. What do they do, Mr. President? Well, they put more money in the pockets of hard-working Australians, and of course that money is the money of those hard-working Australians, so we're really giving it back to them. But we're also putting money back into the pockets of small businesses. And as we know, when a small business uh, gets by with a tax cut, they actually in, uh, invest back into their business. And that's a good thing for all Australians. Mr President, since last July, about $9 billion, $9 billion in tax cuts has landed in the pockets of around 8.8 .8 million Australians. $9.9 billion in tax cuts has landed in the pockets of around 8.8 .8 million Australians. This is money that has been returned back to them. And what has it done? Well, it's boosted household balance sheets, and what we've also seen is consumer confidence rise now above pre-pandemic levels. And, Mr President, we're not stopping there, though. A further $2 billion per month in tax cuts will flow to Australians between now and the end of September. Why is that, Mr President? Because the Morrison government, we believe in giving people back their hard-earned money by way of reducing their taxes. And, Mr President, what that also means for small businesses is that when households are able to keep more of their money, $9 billion now back in the uh, pockets of families, they are able to go out and support those local businesses. And of course, when you support a local business, what you're ultimately doing is supporting jobs. And that's what this government is all about, supporting jobs in the economy. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Wow, that was fantastic. Well done, Senator Cash. What additional support is the government providing to our 3.5 million small business owners as Australia emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic and its economic impacts? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr President, I think those on the other side just said not enough. Well, guess what? Guess what? We're providing them with a further tax cut. And as you know, Mr President, uh, what we're doing for small business builds on the government's record of actually reducing tax cuts for small business or reducing taxes for small business, something those on the other side just don't agree with. And we'll get to that shortly. We'll get to that shortly. Mr President, last year we reduced the small business company tax rate to 26 
per cent. These changes, of course, are a part of what the Morrison government is doing to accelerate small business tax cuts. Uh, we also brought forward that tax relief um, for SMEs by five years. In fact, Mr. President, under the Morrison government, small businesses are paying the lowest company tax rate since 1967. But, Mr. President, we're not stopping there. We will now reduce that. The small business company tax rate will fall to 25 per cent on the 1st of July. Because we know when you back small Order, business, Senator you back Cash. jobs. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. Can Senator O'Neill. Senator, Senator Rennick. Senator O'Neill. Senator Rennick. Can the minister outline why the Morrison government's strong and effective record of supporting Australia's three and a half million small businesses through tax relief, red tape uh, reduction and hiring incentives is so critical to our economic recovery as well as any risks that, as well as any risks that small businesses and their employees face during the next phase of our economic recovery? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, I've got to take that very quiet interjection from the Leader of the Opposition, Senator Wrong. Well, here we go. And you're right, Senator Wrong, here we go. Because it's important that the Australian people understand exactly what the Labor Party will commit to delivering to them if they were ever elected to office. It's not bad enough, it's not bad enough that they took to the last election a commitment to slug Australians' colleagues uh, with $387 billion worth of tax. $387 billion in taxes and of course then colleagues can you imagine the state of the economy if that had occurred and then COVID-19 had hit. But they didn't stop there. They didn't stop there. The former Leader of the Opposition, he has yet again confirmed to the Australian people that when it comes to lowering taxes, the Labor Party, they just don't believe there's any point. Because to quote him, this is what he said, what is the point? of giving a tax cut. Well, Mr President, I'd ask all those hard-working Australians order, out Senator there Cash. who are Senator, benefiting order, from— Senator, I have Senator um, Kitching on a point of order. Senator Kitching. point of order is that that's misleading. The full quote was, what's the point of a tax I'm cut afraid. if that's you don't have a job? That's not order, Senator Kitching. And Senator, Senator Birmingham Kitching, misled the chamber Senator yesterday. Kitching, I, Senator Kitching, all senators know that there is an opportunity to debate the merits of answers after question time, points of order are not the appropriate time to raise the point of debate. I think Senator Cash, you had five seconds left while I was trying to, Senator Cash has concluded her answer. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate representing the Prime Minister. The Attorney General has instituted legal proceedings against the national broadcaster, the ABC. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said, in an abundance of caution and to avoid any perception of conflicts of interest, the Attorney-General will not perform certain functions that may relate to the federal court or the AB and the ABC. Could you please state each and every function the Prime Minister is referring to? Could you please list which roles and functions and which minister has, have each of these functions been delegated to? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. And, Mr. President, I uh, uh, firstly uh, would make the point that the Attorney General, as with any other Australian, are entitled to uh, initiate defamation proceedings, and they're entitled to do that against the ABC or anybody else who is alleged to have defamed them. He is still entitled to initiate defamation proceedings, Order. Senator Keneally. Order. In relation to the questions that Senator Hanson Young asked. Firstly, point out uh, that at this point in time, uh, the Acting Attorney General, Senator Cash, fulfils all of the functions uh, of the Attorney General's responsibilities, assisted in the delegated responsibilities by Senator Stoker, the Assistant Minister to the Attorney General. The government, out of an abundance of caution, has sought advice from the Solicitor General in relation to the functions of the Attorney General to avoid any perception that any conflicts of interest may arise when he returns to fulfil his office. Out of caution, the government has indicated uh, that until that advice is finalised, the Attorney-General uh, and his office will not uh, perform certain functions that may relate uh, to the administration of the federal court uh, or to uh, the ABC. The administration of the federal court or to the ABC. The government is, as I said, 
seeking that advice from the Solicitor General that will fully inform the practices and processes that are put in place upon the Attorney General's return to work. Senator Hanson Young, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like the minister to take uh, the question on notice, given we don't have uh, the full list from him. Um, I'd like to know how the Attorney General, who has been accused of rape, is now suing the National Broadcaster for defamation, can oversee national consent laws, it is the establishment of a Commonwealth Integrity Commission, defamation law reform, and indeed any other functions of the Attorney General's portfolio. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr. President. And, uh, and I note many across the parliament, past, president, including Senator Hanson Young, have used defamation laws at times. Oh. Now, the Attorney General will return to his office informed, informed by the advice of the Solicitor General around the conduct, around the conduct of those duties. I can't take the first question on notice to preempt the advice and information of the Solicitor General, uh, but certainly uh, we will make sure uh, that it is transparent to all once that advice is received and the attorney returns to work about exactly the procedures that are put in place, where there are duties that need to be fulfilled uh, by Senator Stoker. We have full confidence that the Assistant Minister to the Attorney General will fulfil those duties fully and with absolute competence and confidence. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the Prime Minister ensure that the Attorney General is recused from all cabinet discussions relating to the ABC, including budget deliberations? Senator Birmingham. Uh, well, Mr. President, I note that the, uh, the lists of members of cabinet committees are published. The Attorney General is not a member of the Expenditure Review Committee of Cabinet. But if there are, if there, if decisions, if decisions, Senator Wall. If decisions are taken in relation to the management of any Order. perceived or potential conflicts of interest, then those decisions will be consistently applied Order across all left. ministerial Senator and Pratt. cabinet functions. Senator Gallagher. President, my question is also to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. The minister has just confirmed that legal advice has been sought from the Solicitor General to facilitate Attorney General Porter's return to the Cabinet. Why is it that the Prime Minister is willing to seek legal advice to ensure Mr Porter can return to work, but not to, to ensure Mr Porter is a fit and proper person to retain the role of, of Attorney General? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yes, Mr President, advice is being sought in relation to ensuring that there are no uh, potential for any perceived conflicts of interest to exist. Uh, that's consistent uh, with many previous precedents in relation to management of conflicts of interest. The minister has concluded his answer. Just avoided the order. Se um, Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. It is hard to justify, I must say. Um, the supplementary yesterday the minister said in question time that as an, in, as an interim measure, until advice is received, the Attorney-General's office will have no engagement with the federal court or the ABC. When will this advice be received? And given the Attorney-General's defamation action could be appealed to the High Court, will that prohibition on engagement be extended? Senator Birmingham. Well, the, uh, the, sec the second part of the question uh, from Senator Gallagher uh, uh, obviously uh, depends upon the advice of the Solicitor General, uh, and the government will receive that advice, I'm sure, which will be provided as soon as the Solicitor General is in a position to provide it. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you. The Morrison government has appointed a junior assistant minister to respond to the Respect at Work report after it sat on Mr Porter's desk for over a year, prohibited the Attorney General from engaging with the federal court, and prohibited the Attorney General from engaging with the ABC. Why is it Mr Morrison is willing to go to this extent to facilitate the Attorney General's return to Cabinet when he's not even willing to read the complaint or seek legal advice? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Senator Stoker, since her appointment to the ministry, has been fulfilling duties that are allocated to assistant ministers in a range of different portfolios. Uh, this, was the, uh, this was an appointment. This was an appointment of an assistant minister to the Attorney-General 
that had not previously existed, and quite appropriately, responsibilities were passed from the Attorney General to Senator Stoker at the time. And indeed, she is pursuing further Order. responses to the Respect at Work uh, inquiry, further responses to it, I add, uh, because indeed the government has gotten on with a number of aspects of responding to the Respect at Work inquiry. And the $2.1 million provided to support and implement a number of recommendations work to establish the Respect at Work Council, which was established and is due to meet for the first time this Friday. The establishment of the Respect at Work website as a central platform for resources on sexual harassment, Order, the conduct of a national Time survey on sexual harassment. Has expired. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions, uh, Senator Soldier. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's technology, not taxes, approach to energy policy is creating new jobs, strengthening our economy and reducing emissions? Order. Order, set, order. I'm going to ask. I'm going. Order. I couldn't hear the second part of that question. I'm going to ask Senator McLaughlin to ask it again. Order, Senator McLaughlin, please thank, ask thank the Thank you, question Mr. President. Again. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's technology, not taxes, approach to energy policy is creating new jobs, strengthening our economy, and reducing emissions? I'm going to insist, Senator Wong. I'm going to insist on order during the question being asked, so I can hear it my own purposes. The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator McLaughlin for uh, that outstanding question. The Morrison government is delivering on our plan to provide Australian families and businesses with the affordable and reliable power they need to help cement Senator our Ayers. economic recovery and to create jobs. And as I updated senators in February, we have delivered eight consecutive quarters of year-on-year -year CPI retail price reductions, and prices are set to continue to fall, continue to fall, putting Senator, more money in the hands Senator of Australians, Ayers. more money Senator in the hands Ayers. of Australian households and Australian businesses. And I would think that those opposites should be welcoming uh, those falls in energy prices. But we're also reducing our emissions, uh, all the while reducing our emissions. And I know that senators will welcome the fact that Australia has reduced our emissions by 19 per cent on 2005 levels. And I would have thought Senator McAllister would welcome that fact, would welcome the fact that we've reduced them by 19 per cent whilst lowering energy prices. I mean, why won't you join with us in celebrating with Australian families, in celebrating with Australian households? I mean, even Senator Watt would be welcoming that. Even the Greens should be welcoming Order our reduction. Senators it McAllister and Gallagher. Thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. President. We should all be welcoming, and we are on track. We are on track. And when we compare our effort, our 19% reduction since 2005, Order. compared to New Zealand with 1%, 0.1% reduction in Canada, this is something we should all be celebrating because we have overachieved on our target by 639 million tonnes. Our emissions fell faster than Canada, New Zealand, Japan, United States, more than double the OECD average. So you can do this. You can deliver emissions reductions while delivering lower energy prices for Australian families, for Australian households, for Australian businesses. That's something we can all celebrate. That's something we can all get behind. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the Morrison government is delivering reliable energy while meeting our international commitments? Senator Selger. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we are proud to be meeting and order, beating order. our Senator international Selger, commitments. Your, not, not an error on your part. There appears to be a problem with that microphone. Could you try and use the one adjacent to you, please? Um, there's a feedback coming from the microphone, so it might be easier. My apologies. Order. <laughs> Senator Seselja. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, and we are proud to be meeting and beating our international commitments without destroying jobs and without wrecking our economy as those opposite would do. And we know Labor would do it. We know the Greens would do it. I mean, the Greens, the Greens are out Order. there, you know, the un-Australian Greens Party, arguing against our, our, our contribution, our, our nominee for the OECD. But we are getting it done. We are getting it done. We are actually doing it without a carbon tax. We are doing it through a technology, not taxes approach. And that is something that ensures 
We continue to support jobs. We continue to support household budgets. We continue to deliver on our emissions reductions target. We do it without a carbon tax. We do it by investing in technology. We do it by backing Australian business, by backing Australian innovation. That's our, that's our policy. That's what we're going to continue to do. And it would be time for those opposite, opposite to start supporting those successful policies. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister please advise why it is important to focus on delivering secure, reliable and affordable energy for Australian families and businesses and of any risks to this policy approach? Senator Seselja. Well, well, thank you, Senator McLaughlin, and uh, I thank him for the question. It is vital. It is absolutely vital that we focus on cheaper and more reliable energy because that is what Australians expect and that's what we are delivering. And Senator McAllister can interject all she likes uh, because, unfortunately, uh, there are risks, and it is from those opposite, Labor and the Greens, whose, whose only, only prescription when it comes to this area is more taxes. You know, leading the Labor Party's policy is the member for McMahon. Uh, the member for McMahon, who's never seen a tax that he didn't support, backed, of course, uh, by the Queensland Resources spokesman, Senator Murray Watt. Labor's car tax alone, of course, Labor's car tax alone would have added $3,000 to the cost Order. of a new vehicle. They, remember their retiree tax, the housing tax, the car tax, the carbon tax. Labor is all about taxes. This government is about technology, not taxes, lowering our emissions and Order, lowering Senator energy prices. Sosselja. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for uh, Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. After months of uncertainty for the half a million workers across our tourism sector, the government made a chaotic announcement of meagre support beyond the withdrawal of JobKeeper. In this chaotic announcement, the government has flagged a total cap of 800,000 uh, discounted tickets. Now that the government has been forced to expand the scheme due to, the, to uh, political pressure, which of the 13 original locations will have their share of this support slashed? Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Thank Senator Farrell very much uh, for his question. I reject the premise of Senator Farrell's question because what Senator Farrell has failed to acknowledge is this important next step in the government's national economic recovery plan, which is about supporting businesses and workers and regions who are still finding it very difficult in the uh, post-COVID-19 pandemic period. And the packages mix of whether it is uh, discounted airline tickets, uh, loans for business, direct support to keep planes in the air, airline workers in their jobs is an important part of building that bridge to, uh, back to a normal way of life for Australians. Now, the centrepiece of this package is a demand-driven program, it is, as, the, as the senator said, 800,000 half-price airfares to actually enable Australians to travel, to actually support tourism operators and businesses and travel agents and airlines who have been dealing with these challenges. And I don't understand why those opposite do not support that initiative to actually engage with those businesses to actually enable those Australians to travel. So the package ultimately will take more tourists, whether it is to our hotels and our cafes, to go on tours, to explore our own backyard. And that does mean more jobs and investment for the tourism and aviation sectors. It is a win for local communities. The local communities that were spelt out here earlier in the week in the chamber don't understand why those opposite don't support those local communities and don't want to support them with this package, Mr President. The half-price ticket program, as we've said, initially operating to 13 key regions. And other new measures in the support package include that new international aviation support to assist Australia's international passenger airlines to maintain over 8,000 core international aviation jobs, support for regular passenger airports to meet their domestic security screening costs, a new aviation services assistance support program to, support, to help ground handling Order. companies Senator to meet Payne, the cost of mandatory the training certification and accreditation. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Uh, I do have one. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. On Sunday, the Deputy Prime Minister on the ABC's Insiders program couldn't answer a simple question about whether this program was capped or driven by actual demand and need. Can you please tell us what it is? Senator Payne. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I think we've been quite quite clear about the about the 800,000 airfares, Mr. President. 800,000 airfares that will enable Australians to do that travelling that we've been talking about. That is about. Uh, motivating, incentivising, if you like, Australians to, uh, to travel around their own country. Order, and Senator we have Payne. Seen... I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Thank, thank you, Mr President. Uh, the point of order is direct thank relevance. Uh, the question was very precise, and it was the same question the DPM could not answer. Is this program capped or demand-driven? I ask the minister to return to the question. Um. I'll let you restate the question, Senator. Well, I was listening very carefully, and unless I misheard, I thought I saw, heard a number referred to. I can't instruct a minister how to answer a question, um, so I'll call Senator Payne to continue. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, we know that there will be. I've mentioned the 800,000 figure, Mr. President. That is 800,000 half-price tickets to travel around Australia. An opportunity, Mr. President, which has, for example, seen flight searches on Virgin Australia increase order. almost 80% following the announcement of, of the. Uh, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Direct relevance. Didn't ask about booking system or. Travel agents asked a budget question. We asked a budget question, Mr. President, and I would ask you to remind the minister of the question. Um, I'm listening very carefully, Senator Wong. Um, I take the point that it was a question about a program. I and I heard earlier the minister refer to a number, but I can't instruct a minister how to, in the terms in which to answer a question. I've allowed you to reinforce the question. Um, but it is up to the minister to determine what terms in which she answers it. I'm listening very carefully, and at this point, I believe the minister is being directly relevant. Yeah. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And thank you for uh, for that ruling, uh, Mr. President. I was indicating what the impact of the announcement of 800,000 half-price airfares okay. and Senate the associated. Order. Senator Payne, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Mr. President, I, I'm going to ask you to go away and reconsider that ruling after question time, looking at the trans at the hand site. Uh, I again raise a point of order on direct relevance. The question, the question relates directly to whether this program has been funded as a capped program or a demand-driven program. I'm happy, Senator Wong, to take. I will always accept the re request of a senator to review the Hansard. My initial reaction is that when the minister is talking about a specific number, to ask me to go further and ask the minister to when a specific. And, and, and Senator Wong, I'll take the interjection. That goes to, in my view, trying to instruct the minister of the terms of how to answer a question. There's an opportunity to debate it. I will reflect on this and come back to the chamber. Um, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As I was saying, Mr. President, what we have seen in response to this measure is bookings increasing almost 40 per cent. Order, Flight Senator Payne. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, Senator Farrell has the call. Senator Payne, Senator Farrell has the call for his final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I do have a final supplementary question. Minister, how will the 800,000 tickets be distributed across the destination? Is there an agreement with the airlines and operators, or uh, is this again being decided by a colour-coded spreadsheet? Senator Payne. Well, Mr. President, I'm not sure that I understand the, the details of Senator Farrell's question, but this is demand-driven about where passengers wish to go, where Australians want to travel. And as the tourism minister said uh, in uh, comments uh, uh, the day before yesterday, I think we are going to continue to work with the aviation sector. For example, if there are other destinations we need to add, we will do that. It is about giving people the confidence to travel, because if people have to have the confidence to travel, we know that the demand and the will is there, and we know that they will take that up. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Are there any uh, motions to oh, minister? Thanks, uh, thanks, Deputy President. Uh, Deputy President, uh, for the information of the Senate, I table correspondence from the Chair of the Select Committee on COVID-19, Senator Gallagher, 
regarding the seven recommendations made by the committee in its second interim report. Deputy President, uh, in addressing, uh, in addressing uh, those recommendations and the response that I have in correspondence I've just tabled, at the outset I would like to restate some of the remarks made by Senators Patterson and Davey in their additional comments to the second interim report. It is important Sorry. Yes. Just stop the clock. Minister, thank yeah. you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Deputy President. At the outset, I'd like to restate some of the remarks made by Senators Patterson and Senator Davey in their additional comments to the second interim report. It's important to note that the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 was appropriately established with bipartisan support on 8 April 2020 notably under the broadest possible terms of reference and with a tenure that effectively ensures it does not expire until the end of this term of parliament, if that is the wish of the committee. It is beyond doubt that both government and opposition parties acknowledge and respect the important role parliamentary oversight plays in our Westminster system of government, uh, as reflected by the establishment of this committee during the most extraordinary of times. To date, the committee has held over 40 public hearings, published over 500 submissions by interested organisations and individuals, and then it has published over 700 associated documents. It is noteworthy that in a time of health and economic crisis, officials from the Department of Health have appropriately appeared before the committee in public hearings no less than 10 times, and officials from the Department of the Treasury have appeared before the committee in public hearings no less than eight times to answer questions on how they and the government have responded to the dual health and economic crises. The committee has received nearly 2,000 answers to questions on notice throughout this period, nearly 2,000, overwhelmingly from government departments. A remarkable demonstration of cooperation and transparency especially when considering they did so while managing the day-to-day -day fight against a once-in-a-generation global pandemic and associated economic crisis. They did so in addition to the work of those uh, departments responding also to other estimates questions on notice and other parliamentary questions on notice, which appear to have been no less frequent during that time. The relatively few disagreements between the committee and the government about a small number of public interest immunity claims should be viewed in the light of the overall significant cooperation and information sharing undertaken. In relation to the specific claims of public interest immunity, as noted in my correspondence to the chair of the committee, Senator Gallagher, the committee maintains the public interest immunity claims advanced in the initial responses to the committee's requests. The government holds the strong view that the documents and information sought would or could reasonably be expected to disclose the deliberations of the Cabinet or a committee of the Cabinet. Along with national security, this is the most long-standing and fundamental ground of a public interest immunity claim. As is well recognised in the Westminster system, it is in the public interest to preserve the confidentiality of Cabinet deliberations to ensure the best possible decisions are made following thorough consideration and informed discussion of relevant proposals within Cabinet. It is not in the public interest to disclose information about the Cabinet's deliberations, as it may impact in the future upon government's ability to receive confidential information and to make appropriately informed decisions impacting upon the Australian community. In keeping with this long-standing practice, information about the operation and business of the Cabinet and its committees, including when a matter went to the Cabinet, who attended and what form of submission was provided, as to do so could potentially reveal the deliberations of the Cabinet, which remain confidential for the reasons I have outlined. In relation to the request for legal advice, while I note that the Senate has not accepted legal professional privilege as a public interest immunity, it has been the long-standing practice of successive Australian governments not to disclose privileged legal advice. This practice has previously been outlined 
by the Honourable Gareth Evans QC in 1995, who said, nor is it the practice or has it been the practice over the years for any government to make available legal advice from its legal advisers made in the course of the normal decision-making process of government for good practical reasons associated with good government and also as a matter of fundamental principle. That was Senator Evans on the 28th of August 1995. The Honourable Philip Ruddock stated in 2004 on the 29th of March, Order. it is not the practice of the attorney to comment on matters of legal advice to the government. Any advice given, if it is given, is given to the government. Former Senator the Honourable Joe Ludwick on the 26th of May 2011 put the position as follows. To the extent that we are now going to the content of the advice, can I say that it has been a long-standing practice of both this government and successive governments not to disclose the content of advice. The government maintains, consistent with the positions put by ministers uh, of previous governments uh, of both Labor and coalition persuasion, that it is not in the public interest to depart from this established position. It is integral that privileged legal advice provided to the Commonwealth remains confidential. Access by government to such confidential advice is, in practical terms, essential to the development of sound Commonwealth policy and robust lawmaking. The specific harm that the doctrine of legal professional privilege seeks to prevent is the harm to the administration of justice that would result from the disclosure of confidential interactions between lawyer and client. Both the High Court of Australia and the Federal Court of Australia have confirmed that legal professional privilege promotes the public interest by enhancing the administration of justice, facilitating freedom of consultation and encouraging full and frank disclosure between clients and their advisers. I thank the Senate for the opportunity uh, to respond and comment uh, on the matters tabled in the letter to Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rustin. Madam Deputy President, um, I refer uh, to the comments made um, by the Leader of the Government uh, in the Senate today and the correspondence that I sent to the Chair of the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 dated 18 December 2020. I confirm the Government maintains a public interest immunity claim over the content of the advice that was provided in the context of the Cabinet deliberations. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I also refer to the comments made today by the Leader of the Government in the Senate and the correspondence from the Attorney-General to the Chair of the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 dated 14 May 2020 and 11 June 2020 and confirm the Government maintains its public interest immunity claim uh, over the content of the confidential legal advice in question. Thank you. Um, Minister. Minister Colbert. Thank you, Deputy President. I refer to the comments made by the Leader of the Government in the Senate and the correspondence from the Health Minister to the Chair of the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 dated 23 September 2020 and 1 October 2020 and confirm that the Government maintains its public interest immunity claim over the confidential Cabinet deliberations in question. Thank you, Minister. Thank Senator you, Gallagher. Madam you Deputy President. Note? I move that the Senate take note of the statement made by the ministers uh, in relation to uh, the COVID-19 Select Committee and the public interest immunity claims. What the Senate has just witnessed is uh, four ministers coming into this chamber and giving the proverbial finger to non-executive members of this place. That's what's just happened. Make no mistake. There was a lot of words expressed by the Leader of the Government in the Senate, but it was a lot of words to try to justify the unjustifiable. Now, let me be clear. The Senate committee has worked well and we have worked hard. Senator Birmingham made those points. But we have been thorough as well. And when we have had public servants refuse to provide information and hope that we'll just forget about it, we didn't. We wrote to those heads of department and we said, you took this on notice, you haven't replied. They then referred it to ministers and eventually, months later, often, we got a response from ministers with a lazy use of the public interest immunity claim, often not even specifying the nature of the harm that would be caused to the public by, not pro by providing that information to the committee. Some of them didn't even 
uh, well, most of them didn't even abide by the Cormann motion um, of 2009, which clearly sets out the way for public servants and ministers to work through that process. And what we did then was we considered the claim. On two of them, we agreed with the government. On the others, we didn't. And we brought that to this chamber and we won the vote. Every non-government senator in this place considered the matter, as we were, are required to do and as um, Harry Evans specified in his note in 2005, that when that matter arises in a committee, to bring it back and report it to the Senate. And that is what we did. And the Senate voted to order the government to provide those, that information or, in the absence of doing that, make a statement exactly about why they aren't going to provide that information. And I'll, I'll come to that. But just so people understand, because it's a broader principle here, yes, we are after the information. We are after information that I didn't even think would ever be refused by the government. The date the Cabinet first got briefed about the pandemic. Whoa. Pretty relevant to the work that the COVID committee was actually set up to do, which is to monitor the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So you would think, actually, when, when you first got briefed, when the, the chief medical officer uh, first provided information to, to the uh, cabinet, when the minister for aged care with a, with a COVID um, crisis raging through aged care that he was responsible for, for facilities, for hundreds of people dying, when did he first brief the cabinet? Was it in May? Was it in June? Was it in July? Not what did he brief the cabinet, but when did he brief it? We didn't ask about cabinet deliberations. We never ever sought information that related to, to the ongoing um, discussions within um, cabinet. We accept that. But dates, come on. How are we meant to fulfil our job? If the government, in a very stubborn way, once they'd taken the decision not to provide that, finds them in this position where we've won an order for production of documents some six months after the question's been asked, and you're still saying it relates to cabinet deliberations. It's ridiculous. I mean, these the claims are, the, the, the information sought is not unreasonable. It should have been provided at the time. For example, the date on which the AHPPC, a body that the um, government often tosses out as being the most important body that's been assisting them with the pandemic, when did they brief the Minister for Health first? When did they go to Cabinet first? When did they brief the National Cabinet? I mean, the Productivity Commission chair gave a presentation to National Cabinet, so it's gone to all of those governments. Could we have a copy of the presentation, please? No. No, top secret. Not allowed to have it. So every other governments are allowed to have it. What they do with it is up to them. They've all got the presentation, but we're not allowed the PowerPoint. It's ridiculous. Some of the decisions about the economic support. Well, no. Some of the um, information about the economic support packages, about the you know the information that went into determining that that was the package, not, whether, not what were the options before you made the decisions about the package, but what were the expectations of what that package would deliver. You know, no, not allowed any of that information. And our terms of reference are very simple. It's to um, monitor the Australian government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. All of these relate to the health and economic response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And yes, we have got a lot of information out of um, the public service. Sometimes it's painful, but we have got it. Sometimes it's clear they don't want to answer, probably because they're worried about whether they get in trouble or not. But we persist and we tell them, you're not allowed to just say nothing or refuse to answer. We, give them, we explain to them. But that is part of their job. You know, Senator Birmingham says, well, they've come to all these hearings and they've provided all this information. Yes, because they're accountable to this chamber as well as working for executive government. You know, it's not an option. It's part of their job to support the work of Senate committees. They may not see it that way, 
And under this government, I think it has changed a little about their interaction with Senate committees, but it is part of their job. It is not an option about whether or not they want to participate. So yes, I appreciate the fact that they have come to the committee, but I don't think it's out of charity or that we should feel honoured that they have come. And I've explained that to them before, that it is part of their job. Now, when I go and read the advice of that great Harry Evans, where he is clear about the grounds for uh, claiming public interest immunity in his note and what the Senate has accepted as being legitimate or potentially acceptable grounds. and They are listed. And he also goes to those um, grounds that haven't been accepted by the Senate as reasons to withhold information, and they are advice to government. And quite often we have witnesses coming here and going, uh, and we ask about um, whether they provided advice, and they, they might not even want to answer that question, let alone um, because they just say, oh, it's advice to government, it's, you, you can't have it. No, the Senate has never accepted that. Legal professional privilege, the Senate has never accepted that. Yep. Cabinet in confidence, the Senate has never accepted that. And they are all the reasons that this government is using to withhold this information. The Senate has never accepted that. We have accepted that disclosing information that relates to the deliberations of Cabinet are, and we are not trying to change that. But just because you've stamped Cabinet in confidence, or it might have been walked through on a trolley along with the sandwiches and cups of tea, doesn't mean that that information is withheld in a COVID safe way, of course. Um, does not mean that that information should be withheld from the Senate. And the, the thing here is, I mean, Senator Birmingham has a very polite style, but his, what he has done today is to say to every non-executive member of this place, whatever you ask for and on whatever terms you ask for it, we are the, the ones who decide, and we decide that the Senate is not having it. So whilst they're trying to get through the IR bill and do deals, with um, crossbench members, think about this, because they're trying to be all nice to you on one side, but you said the other day you wanted this information and they have come in here and said bad luck. Yep. That's what they've said. And that's what this government is known for, secrecy, double speak, withholding information when it's polit politically inconvenient to release it. Yep. That is what this is about. And so maybe we won't get this information, even though the committee wants it and the Senate has actually asked the government to provide it. Maybe we won't. But the principle here is that we don't accept the lazy and misuse of the public interest immunity claims process. We don't accept it. The Senate should not accept it. We do think this information should be provided, and this is a principle that the Senate should stay firm on. Because if we let this one through, what next, senators? What next? You know, because I think anything becomes possible then. If we don't stand up and push back on this today, and have some consequence for this, what next? Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Seaworth. Thank you, Deputy President. I'm a part of the committee. I'm a member of the COVID committee, and am absolutely appalled that the government hides behind public interest immunity. But I'll also remind the chamber that it's not the first time that this has happened in very recent history, and we don't have to go far back to, to work out and to think about when it occurred. Robo-debt, repeatedly, repeatedly used their uh, and refused to provide the Community Affairs Committee with the information that we were very justified in asking about their uh, decision making and how they came to decisions around robojet. I'm using that as an example, not to uh, prosecute that argument yet again, but the fact that this government keeps hiding behind the cabinet in confidence arguments again and again. Cabinet 
when they, as Senator Gallagher's just said, wheeling a trolley through the cabinet with some documents piled high on anything that the Senate might ask for is not appropriate. So this isn't the first time the government is hiding behind cabinet incompetence or public interest immunity. Now, I'd argue very strongly that there's not an argument of cabinet incompetence for telling us, and one of the questions that they refused to answer was about how did they determine the coronavirus supplement rate? How did they determine it? Wouldn't you think that was in the public interest to know? And I tell you what, I'm really interested to know because it's very important for the debate that we'll have later in this chamber, probably tomorrow, rushed through when we no doubt get a motion on ours, where they'll then, of course, include the guillotine and to gag debate on the debate over the government's appalling rate of job seeker, which is in the legislation that will come before this chamber to be just $25 a week, when the coronavirus supplement was doubled, a move that this Senate supported and agreed with because the government knew that people couldn't survive on $40 a day. So we wanted to know, quite justifiably, because it was a COVID response, how they came up, how was that rate determined? No, nah, won't tell us. We also asked for the modelling on the job seeker payment. No, nah, won't tell us. We asked for the modelling around stage two tax cuts being forward. No, nope, won't tell us. When was Cabinet first briefed by the Chief Medical Officer? An absolutely fundamental question. No, secret, we won't tell you. So you have to ask, what have they got to hide? It's a really simple question that Australia has the right to know. Why not tell us? We also asked, when did the Minister for Aged Care, Minister Colbeck, brief Cabinet on the aged care issues that we also plainly saw roll out it in this country? No, nah, won't tell you. Wouldn't tell us. We also asked how often the Minister for Aged Care briefed Cabinet on the crisis, aged care crisis, and not one person could deny that we had a crisis here. Did he tell us? No. Apparently that's secret too. That's secret. How many times did he? Did he recognise, when did he recognise that we had a crisis on our hands? When did the government know that Australia had a crisis on its hand in aged care? We don't know, because he won't tell us. He wouldn't tell us. The government won't tell us? Oh, that's right, it's cabinet in confidence. How often did he brief? When did he brief? When did he attend cabinet? When did the government know? And how urgently then? It tells us how urgently and when they started responding to the aged care crisis. No, won't tell you. We also asked about childcare. We all know that there was amendments made to payments and how we approach childcare during, during the crisis, during the heat of the crisis last year. Wouldn't, won't provide the modelling on when they then changed their mind and ended that particular approach. Won't provide that. Won't provide the, won't provide the parameters on JobKeeper. Won't provide the information on when Cabinet decided that Australia was going for a suppression approach rather than an elimination approach to COVID. These are all questions that are very legitimate questions for the COVID committee, part of our work. The committee was charged by this place to do this work, won't provide that information. They are key bits of information 
for the committee to do our work. But not only just for us to do our work, it's for broader Australia to know. But I know it's Cabinet in confidence. As has been discussed in this chamber before, we don't accept those claims. This information is information the committee should have access to, and it's information Australia should have access to. And I'll go back to the issues around the coronavirus supplement. Those were important decisions the government made. Very important decisions. And they are happy to take the support and the welcoming of that from the, from the Australian community, but they're not happy to tell us how they came to that rate. That is appalling. Australia has a right to know how we decided on that rate because it's made a lot of difference to Australians having had access when they were unemployed, having had access to that rate. So I'd argue very strongly, and I do argue very strongly, that we have a right to know how that rate was arrived at because it is so important and because it was so important. But of course the government doesn't want to release that because it makes even more of it, they know it'll make a mockery of the lousy 25 bucks a week, $3.57. I'd challenge people to find out where you can buy a coffee, cup of coffee in this country for $3.57. Okay. It makes an absolute mockery of the rate that you are going to ask this place to pass probably within 24, maybe a bit longer, depending if we get an hour's motion—36 hours. This information is important to this country and it should be made available. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to uh, take note of the, the minister's response. Um, I accept uh, the, what the uh, finance minister has said in relation to the uh, COVID committee being set up as uh, uh, under uh, with bipartisan support, uh, and that's a good thing. But of course, in order for a committee to do its work, it has to be properly informed. It needs to be able to have access to information. So you can't stand and say, it's OK, we've, we've, um, uh, we've assisted, we've given our support to a committee, uh, but then on the other hand deny relevant information to its line of inquiry. I want to go to two claims that have been made by the government. The first goes to legal professional privilege. Now, uh, it's worthwhile understanding the purpose of the privilege. The purpose of the privilege allows for confidential discussions between a client and, a, and uh, a, a lawyer. In this case, the lawyer will be either the Solicitor General or the AGS or perhaps a contracted lawyer, but the client is, of course, the Commonwealth Government. And one of the things that uh, you can do in relation to legal professional privilege when you are the client, because the privilege belongs to you, is you can simply waive the privilege. You can say, uh, I, I accept that uh, this is legal advice, uh, but it, it, the, the release of this information will not cause harm, so I waive my privilege. That's the first thing that the government could do in these circumstances. Have a look at what the content of the legal advice is and, in the spirit of openness and transparency, simply waive the privilege. Now, I know people stand up on a regular basis and say, that, that, is, uh, that, that undermines the uh, well-established doctrine? Well, the bottom line is it does not. The doctrine permits the waiving of privilege. The client just simply has to say, I uh, agree to waive the privilege. And I might point out that on the 2nd of March 1986, uh, the, the, uh, cabinet, uh, the cabinet made a decision uh, under the uh, Secretary of the, Brazil, uh, of the uh, Attorney General's Department at the, to uh, at the time, Mr Brazil. It's called the Brazil Direction, and it was a direction from Cabinet that, in actual fact, uh, legal advice belongs to the government, paid for by the people, and only in circumstances where harm 
uh, could be caused, it should be released. So I invite people to go and have a look at the Brazil direction and uh, study it, and you'll see that there's no reason, unless there is harm caused, uh, as to why legal uh, advice can't simply be handed over. Now, the minister did not stand up and say this is the harm that would be caused by a particular piece of advice being given. He didn't do that. He simply said it would be harmful just because we do it. That would cause the harm. That's wrong. That's simply wrong, uh, I say to Minister Birmingham. And you need to, I think you should go away and reflect on that. The second part of the, the equation, if you don't wish to waive privileges, that the, uh, the Senate has the power to uh, order the production of, uh, of legal advice. I said earlier in this chamber on Monday, I said, I read out from the judgment of Egan and Chadwick in the New South Wales Supreme Court, where unanimously the, Su the Supreme Court uh, appeals justices uh, basically said that uh, the, the uh, Legislative Council, the New South Wales Legislative Council, has the power to order uh, the production of legal advice uh, in circumstances where they believe it belo that uh, it uh, relates to the work that they carry out uh, as a legislature, either in respect of uh, uh, considering legislation or in its oversight role. So there is no reason why the government should not hand over that advice. It is consistent with uh, the doctrine of legal privilege and it is consistent with the rule of law in this country. Please don't stand up and say, an attorney general said this, therefore it is. Why don't you listen to the justices within our legal system, who I think are much better qualified than uh, people in this chamber, to understand what the law of this land is? And it would be good if the government complied with the law of this land, and unfortunately they are not. Now, in relation to the second aspect of some of the claims, the, the claim of uh, cabinet uh, inconfidence, again, we should go and look back at the root purpose of uh, cabinet inconfidence. The dominant purpose of that protection is to protect the deliberations of cabinet, that is, the exchange of, uh, of words between ministers across the cabinet table. For the, uh, for the protection of what is referred to as collective responsibility. We allow ministers to have their, their, uh, their uh, uh, opinions, to uh, say what they want to say about whatever is being talked about in Cabinet, but the guiding principle is there is collective responsibility. Once you walk out of the Cabinet room, you adopt the uh, position of the Cabinet. And, uh, there is a protection around deliberation of, of cabinet, but there's also a, uh, a ruling uh, again in the in the civil jurisdiction that that uh, that deliberations are strictly are strictly the discussions that take place between ministers uh, around the cabinet table, and uh, the cabinet rules. And I've got looked into this in, in great detail. The cabinet rules uh, do not permit the deliberations of Cabinet to be recorded on the minutes of, of, of Cabinet. They can only be recorded by the note-takers, who then take the notebooks and they lock them up, send them to the archives and we, we find out later what has been said. It is not possible for any minute from the Cabinet, any decision of the Cabinet, to contain a deliberation because that is not permitted under our Cabinet rules. So, uh, a claim that we see quite regularly thrown around, and, and actually I've got some challenges in the, with the Information Commissioner in relation to some of these, uh, these cavalier claims, that, uh, that uh, you know, these are deliberations of Cabinet, are simply false, because the only place deliberations of Cabinet call, uh, are recorded are in the notebooks. Uh, of course, there, there is accepted uh, principles behind the uh, uh, the keeping secret of cabinet uh, decisions and cabinet minutes, but again, understand what the law of this land is. I invite you, invite you to go and have a look at the case of Sankey and Whitlam uh, in the High Court, where the High Court determined it is not for the cabinet to decide whether or not to keep uh, cabinet documents secret in in, uh, in court proceedings. It is a matter for the court to do so. 
No one in this country is, is uh, immune from handing over uh, documents uh, or, or entitled to complete secrecy. If the interests of justice demand or require the adducing of cabinet documents, then the High Court has said that is what will happen. Brett Walker SC, and I know the attorney respects uh, uh, Brett Walker SC, he's engaged him in, in, his, in, in his, uh, uh, his, his uh, matter uh, that he's uh, just initiated, uh, gave a presentation here a couple of years ago that said the High Court has said that uh, cabinet documents can be adduced in a court if the burden has been met, uh, the interests of justice demand it. He also indicated that, that is the same uh, sort of threshold test uh, can be applied and that, the, uh, that, that uh, the Senate has the ability to demand those documents as well. So the, 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 one of the problems we've got here is that, um, is that the government is simply very cavalier in all of its, in all, all of its claims. I have uh, brought into this chamber uh, on at least one occasion and certainly to, to a committee room a document that is cabinet in confidence according to a response to an order for production that I got under FOI. You make the claims in such a ca cavalier manner that get overturned. My current score, it's gone up since the last time I spoke in the, in the, uh, in the chamber about this, current score on FOI appeals is, uh, is Rex 7, governments zero. It's gone up by one because you make all these claims and they are not properly grounded in law and they get overturned. And what happens is everyone understands now what you're doing. You're crying wolf. You, you cry wolf every time someone wants, to, wants a piece of information. You inappropriately and unlawfully uh, withhold that document. Again, I say that uh, uh, transparency to the Prime Minister is like kryptonite to Superman. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So the question is, the motion to take note is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, we'll now move to taking note. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Colbeck and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Dodson and O'Neill. In, I wish to uh, talk about the vaccine rollout because it, it's, there's a lot of concern in the community and that concern is centred around a number of issues that have been badly handled with the vaccine rollout by this government. We've had issues around uh, overdosing, we've had issues around training, we've had issues around uh, storage, we've had uh, issues, as I uh, understand it, even today with the launch of the booking system. And it's really, unfortunately, seems to be par for the course for this government. It's a confused, slow and an uneven rollout of the COVID vaccination program. Across Australia and in my, own, in my home state of Tasmania, now, I think everyone would remember when the Prime Minister promised that four million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March, end of March this year. And of course, we know that we're, I think we're about over 160,000, but a long way off, for, for, a long way off the four million. And of course, Senator Colbeck, in his response to Senator Dodson, did not respond at all to the question that was asked of him about the Prime Minister's um, commitment to Australia around vaccinations. And then, of course, that commitment did morph in. Um, to be completely fair to the Prime Minister, it did morph in um, that the commitment of four million would be by the end of April. And then, of course, that commitment disappeared altogether. There have been commitments to six million vaccinations by the, by the 10th of May and even 11 million by the end of May. Well, 
if the rollout in Tasmania is anything to go by, the government is a long, long way from delivering on these commitments. The problem is that despite months of planning, the systems to deliver the vaccine programs are still not in place. I just want to go to the announcement that was made today and have a look at the electorate of Lyons. Now, in Tasmania, there have been 36 GP clinics announced, and in the electorate of Lyons, there's only five. Now, Lyons contains 12 municipalities, and six of them, six of them, have been left off the vaccination map. Now, the government expects people living in the Derwent Valley, Southern Midlands, Glamorgan, Spring Bay, Tasman, the Central Highlands, and Kentish to travel, and are now expected to travel considerable distances to get vaccinated. And that's if they can, of course, get an appointment, and if the GP clinic has any available vaccine. But of course, I've already spoken about booking through the national booking system, because we've already heard the issues around the system not standing up. There has been some website errors. Now, I hope that the system stands up to the demand and doesn't suffer from the same fate as many of the other platforms that this government, had, uh, this government has uh, run in the past, because they don't have a very good track record. But I hope it does stand up, despite the early um, reportings this afternoon, because it simply would not be good enough for this, the booking system to not be able to handle, handle um, the demand. Now, for the older people living on the ta Tasman Peninsula and on the east coast, their nearest GP clinics are in Sorrell and St Helens, which are 90 minutes away. The government has really done a very bad job with the vaccinations. They've overpromised, overcommitted, substantially overpromised and overcommitted. They, they have had one issue after another. As I said, they've had the overdosing, they've had the tra lack of training. They really need to get their act together because uh, oh, people you, are Senator relying Brown. on this Your vaccination program. Expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Oh, here we go again, every single day. Whatever it is, there can be never any recognition from those opposite that Australia has weathered the COVID pandemic better than all major advanced nations, both in economic and health terms. And it doesn't matter where we're talking, doesn't matter if we're looking at the $267 billion that's gone direct in, health, in economic and health support to Australians. We can't talk about the $267 billion that has benefited Australians through this pandemic without hearing doom and gloom from those opposite. And as everyone around the world has experienced when their vaccine programs have launched, it's been slow and steady as the vaccine rollout starts up. That's the sensible medical-based approach that's been taken around the world. But yet again, Labor Party have to come in on all their complaints, all their worries, all their concerns, which we know is part of their generalised faux outrage about everything. But one moment they're calling for it to be rolled out as fast as possible, the next they're calling out cries around safety. We couldn't have consistency of message. We couldn't have anything that doesn't absolutely look like hypocrisy. I mean, we've seen it this week. The Women for, Women for Justice March, where we saw Tanya Plibersek and Senator Waters, Senator Waters being shuttered away by Tanya Plibersek as Cathy Sheriff tried to address the march. But no, 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 we, we only want to focus on one side as we politicise this issue. And yet again, this hypocrisy is coming through because one minute the vaccine's not happening fast enough, the next minute we're not sure how safe it's going to be. We need to make sure those in aged care have more surety and we're not sure about each different type of vaccine. But yet again, the hypocrisy comes through. 
You know, I think you'd actually have a much better time just on a general day-to-day -day basis if you just ease back on the anger about everything. The faux outrage must be exhausting. I mean, you really must be tired, and I do feel sorry for you all. And you know, all of these Australians, 164,000 that have received vaccines at the moment. But the other side of this is that we have ensured in the Morrison government that we have sovereignty over vaccines, that we're able to produce our own vaccines and have sovereignty. We will not be beholden to exports from the world once we establish the production means which we have organised to happen for the AstraZeneca vaccine to be delivered in a sovereign way to Australians. This domestic production will start with one million per week of deliveries from late March. But no, not good enough over here. Going to have to get a little outrage up there. Probably don't like advanced manufacturing very much either, or probably not too happy about job creation happening in this country. You know, we heard today how JobKeeper, that was absolutely stated by opposition leader Albanese that it should be tapered out. I mean, he's obviously a little distracted this week while he's trying to ignore a Facebook chat group. But you know, he was the one advocating for JobKeeper to be tapered out. But now, no, 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 we've changed our mind again. We've changed our mind again because living wages, handouts, subsidisation of industry is all part of your mantra. We want Australians to get back to normal life. We want pre-COVID existence to come back. We want Australians to have security in not only their own businesses but in their jobs. And that's going to happen through the vaccine. I'm sure you guys won't be lining up for it as you object to every step of it the way, but I'm sure in more hypocrisy you'll probably come through because you know, you'll be advocating confidence or whatever you're looking for as you criticise the rollout, as you criticise the safety. No, I'm sure you, you, you guys will. You won't want to get the vaccine at one moment, then you'll want to get it the next because you guys don't know which way's up, whether it's black or whether it's white. No, you guys Order. have had your say over there about Order. one minute it's not fast enough, the next minute it's not safe. The next Order. minute we're criticising that Europe won't send it over, but we're not happy about domestic production. We're not happy about creating jobs and keeping it on shore. We're not happy about securing our sovereignty. You guys just are never happy. I really think you need to get out, give yourself a big pat on the back at each other and let yourselves know it's OK to smile. It's OK to be happy about the way Australia's performed through the pandemic. It's OK, guys. Thank you, Senator Holly. Your uh, Senator, beg your pardon, Senator Hughes. Your time has expired. Senator Chisholm. Inject a dose of reality into this debate because it was sadly lacking from that performance there. And I won't dwell too much on it because it was a bit of an alternative universe that Senator Hughes tried to create there. So I won't dwell on it too much. But suffice to say, if any of those Australians out there on JobKeeper saw that performance, I would sure they would be absolutely aghast that that is what the coalition senators are talking about in this important debate. So you can make things up and you can throw all sorts of accusations, but what we saw today in question time is actually the collision of incompetence and neglect from this government. Because that's actually the questions that we put about JobKeeper and the vaccine actually go to the collision of neglect and competence of this government. And the neglect is focused on those hundreds of thousands of Australians that are going to be losing their job uh, in 11 days when they cut JobKeeper. That goes to the neglect of this government, the fact that they are prepared to sit back and basically ignore those people and let them fall onto the scrap heap um, because uh, they are not focused on those people. And then we see the incompetence, and this is the dangerous part, because the incompetence is going to have consequences. It goes to the vaccine, and we are angry about the vaccine, but that's because they promised four million would be done by March, and we're not going to get anywhere near that. And we're also angry because their incompetence on policy solutions is going to ensure those who rely on tourism are going to be worse off as well, which is going to make them cutting JobKeeper worse. So they try and say they've got solutions to these problems, but none of them are actually going to work. The vaccine is slow. Their policy prescriptions around tourism are diabolical and aren't actually going to fix that problem. 
So they can't put a policy solution in place. Um, they can't get the vaccines delivered on time, and they are showing neglect for those Australians who are going to be cut off JobKeeper shortly. And that is a significant impact in Queensland. And what we saw is a level of arrogance from this government when the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, travelled to Cairns uh, and Senator Green was there waiting for him. And he had no policy solution. He had no detail that he was going to do uh, to roll out for the tourism industry. And there's 172,000 Queenslanders who rely on JobKeeper, and they are going to lose their payments in 11 days. That will actually cut $83 million a week from Queensland's economy. We can't afford to fall off a cliff when this ends. Uh, international borders remain closed, and we know the reason why. Uh, but the slow pace of the vaccine rollout is actually going to ensure that those international borders are closed for longer. And what's been estimated across Australia is that 100,000 people will lose their job. We understand that a quarter of Queensland's 40,000 tourism businesses have predicted they will go bust when JobKeeper ends. So the government is acting too quick to remove JobKeeper, and it is too slow on the vaccine rollout. And it is a level of incompetence when it comes to this. Currently, there are around 203,000 Australians who have been given doses. The Prime Minister promised there would be 4 million doses administered by the end of March. According to the news reports, we had 2.1 million doses below the required level to meet that 4 million target. Bloomberg has a list of all countries currently vaccinating, and Australia is currently 68 out of, out of the number of doses administered, behind Rwanda, Panama and Bulgaria, amongst many others. So when you look at the doses per 100, people, Australia is tracking significantly below South Korea, the EU, US and the UK when they were at the same stage of their vaccine rollout. And there's also been media reports about the impact of this in regional Queensland, uh, where there are uh, doctors groups who have said that they are only going to get 100,000 doses each week when they have 20,000 patients. So it is not going to do the job of those who need it the most. And I've mentioned the incompetence on policy as well. So the flights announcement has been a debacle from start to finish. Uh, we saw the Deputy Prime Minister in the media last Sunday unable to answer questions. They've had a few days to actually get their answer right on this. And again, we saw the minister representing in question time not actually provide that answer. So there's no wonder that Australians are anxious about this government and their decisions. Uh, it is a mixture of incompetence. Uh, and it is also a, a dose of neglect. And it is the Australian people that are being worse off, unfortunately, because of their decisions that they are making uh, with the ending of JobKeeper, that is going to have a devastating impact for many Australians. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Small. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And just as Australians are again confident that the future is bright, our best days in fact lie ahead. Just as confidence returns to the Australian economy and just as we get assurance that uh, with the delivery of the vaccine we will move to a post-COVID world, those opposites seek to undermine confidence in both the vaccine rollout and the strength of the Australian economic comeback, which is so clearly on. In December, Consumption was up 4.3 per cent and business investment up 2.6 per cent, its strongest result since 2017. Dwelling investment, driven by the government's successful uh, home builder package, up 4.1 per cent, its strongest quarterly increase since 2015. Madam Deputy President, we're not done yet. Also in the December quarter, direct economic support from the federal government was halved. That is half the amount of borrowed taxpayer money being injected into the economy, and yet at the same time the economy grew by 3.1 per cent. The second such quarter, where we achieved economic growth of more than 3 per cent in a quarter since 1959. The first time since 1959 we've achieved two such quarters at that level of growth. One, sorry, 2.1 million Australians graduated off the JobKeeper program, and that's because this government stands for Australian business and a prosperous economy, allowing Australians to go about their business and do what they do best. Those opposite seek to undermine both the economic comeback and confidence in our vaccine rollout at such a critical time. Madam Deputy President, spare me the feigned indignation over there. The JobKeeper program was always 
as with everything that this government has done to simulate the economy and shepherd it through the global pandemic, it was always targeted, time-limited and never intended to be permanent. Initially, the JobKeeper program was only planned for six months. And indeed, as we've heard today, the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, said there would always need to be a taper. But instead, this government extended it for 12 months. 12 months and at a cost of $90 billion, being the single largest economic support program of any government since this nation was federated. Uh, 2.7 million Australians have already had their jobs protected by the JobKeeper program, but then uh, graduated from that program and make their way in the world uh, unabated. That is what this government's track record says. 100,000 new apprentices in the first five months of our successful job maker hiring credit. But we weren't done yet. As we've heard Minister Cash and the Prime Minister announce in recent days, we've expanded that program. This government is about jobs, lives and livelihoods. We have been unashamed about that. Uh, with respect to the vaccine uh, rollout, I'm, I'm pleased to advise the Senate that there are now more than 203,000 vaccines that have been administered. That is a 10 per cent increase on the number of uh, vaccinations delivered in Australia since yesterday. More than 10 per cent increase in the last 24 hours. 509 aged care facilities and more than 45,000 of our most vulnerable Australians in aged care have received those vaccinations. And that's despite the fact that we've only received 700,000 of our contracted 3.8 million AstraZeneca vaccines. Why? Because this government was the government that made the decision in August last year to ensure we had sovereign vaccine manufacturing capability so that those countries that still find themselves in the depths of this crisis, Madam Deputy President, like the UK, like the US, like countries in Europe, where tens of thousands of people die every day, Australia finds ourselves with the capability to manufacture a vaccine right here in our own back door. The rollout continues as we have said it would, because this government was clear that in February we would commence phase 1A. When did we do that? February 22. The AstraZeneca program was always uh, scheduled to commence in March, and lo and behold, we find ourselves about to commence phase 1B uh, with uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, four weeks after the commencement of 1A. Already more than 1,000 general practices across this nation uh, are ready to administer that vaccine, and we're increasing the capability of the uh, vaccine program by another 4,000 general practices over coming weeks. Rural and regional Australians have been considered, uh, with the phases not applying in those isolated communities such that travel is not a problem. This government is about lives and livelihoods. Thank you, Madam Thank President. Thank you, uh, Senator Small. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. It's interesting to hear the government talk about confidence because in Cairns there is no confidence in this government. We know that the member for Leichhardt sits in the government party room. We know that the treasurer visited Cairns. The minister for tourism has visited Cairns. So maybe those three men would like to have a quiet word with the senators opposite and the members of the government party room because there is no confidence in Cairns. And when they come in here and talk about how great everything is going, it shows how out of touch they are with the reality, with the, uh, what people are facing in far north Queensland right now. People in far north Queensland are listening to the words in this place. They have heard that the government promised four million vaccines by the end of March. They also heard that, that we would be fully vaccinated by the end of October. Well, it took two questions from Senator Gallagher over here the other day to find out that we will not be fully vaccinated in October. And why does that matter? Why does it matter that the government made promises and they're not going to meet them? Nobody forced them to make these promises. Nobody forced them to make these commitments. Why does it matter? Well, the government has also said that international travel will return in October in line with the vaccination program. 
So there are people in my community who are listening to the promises the government is making about delivering four million vaccines, about making sure that all Australians are fully vaccinated by October, and they are planning their financial security, their economic security around these promises. That's why it matters. In 11 days, 8,000 workers in Cairns will lose JobKeeper. Cairns has the highest number of JobKeeper recipients of any postcode outside the big cities and their suburbs. And I've heard the arguments opposite today that from the ministers answering questions that JobKeeper was always supposed to be temporary and targeted. Well, in terms of targeting, wouldn't you think that targeting JobKeeper and extending JobKeeper to one of the hardest hit communities in our country would be a good thing for this government to do. Absolutely it is, but they are not doing that. Instead, they've come up with some haphazard scheme, a scheme that they don't even have the details on yet. They haven't actually decided whether it's a cap, whether it's demand, what destinations will be on that list. The, the program to take the place of JobKeeper isn't even thought out, and yet JobKeeper will be cut in 11 days. What operators are saying, though, and I've, we've heard a lot from those opposite about what Labor is saying, but the operators, the tourism operators in Cairns, have made many comments since the Morrison government made its so-called aviation announcement and in the lead-up to JobKeeper. Tony Baker, the managing director of Quicksilver said that continued government support was needed to survive. Anything that encourages visitors is great, he said, but we still need some form of ongoing wage subsidy. On the federal government's aviation package, Perry Jones from Ocean Free sums up the concerns that many have. He said, on the 1st of April, if there is no one on that boat, there's no wages coming in. And of the half-price flight scheme, he said that the only problem is that it doesn't mean they're going to be on my boat. This is what these two tourism operators are saying publicly. What they are saying publicly, privately is that they have been left behind by this government that they have no confidence in this government to deliver the vaccina vaccination rollout in the timeline that they promised. No one forced them to make those promises, but they can't even live up to those. They are saying privately that they are terrified. They are going to lose their jobs. They are going to lose their businesses. It is a major concern for people who have uh, Listen to what this government has said. The promises on vaccinations, four million vaccinations by the end of March, fully vaccinated by the end of October, that this government is not delivering Thank on you, its Senator promise. Green, your time has expired. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Brown to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the minister's answer to my question on Aboriginal deaths in custody. So, which minister? Sorry, Senator. Uh, Ms. Minister Birmingham. Uh, Birmingham. Minister Birmingham. Thank you. Calling what the minister gave an answer is a bit rich, because it was not an answer at all. It was more platitudes and motherhood statements about how they care about ending Aboriginal deaths in custody how they are taking action and how they are taking them seriously." Inverted commons. And then they say that they are sorry and that it's a tragedy. What a joke. Sorry means you don't do it again. We are sick of hearing this country saying sorry and continuing the genocide that started over 200 years ago. The minister had the gall to give his non-answer to this chamber with one of the royal commissioners, Senator Dodson, present. Words are cheap, and this government's words are even cheaper. They spend thousands on an empathy consultant, and that's the best they can do? Either this government is beyond help 
or the consultant wasn't any good. The government is always rolling out their absolutely discredited, dodgy Deloitte review into the implementation of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody to congratulate themselves for implementing the recommendations. Well, that review is wrong. The review did not consult with Aboriginal people or Aboriginal organisations. It was a desktop review. Deloitte's review counted government action towards implementing a recommendation as having completed the recommendation. They couldn't even get this right. Let's be honest, they didn't even try. Yet they wheel out this absolutely dodgy review that was conducted in the dark just so they can pat themselves on the back to tell us that they're taking action and that they care and that our lives matter. And yet three Aboriginal people died in custody last week, in one week. Well, over 450 of us have died since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, and well over 580 Aboriginal people have died in the last 40 years. Not enough action Otherwise, it wouldn't be happening. This country over-targets our people and has been doing so since the colonial project began in this country. Surely that constitutes ongoing genocide of this country's sovereign first peoples. Just some weeks ago, countries at the United Nations absolutely slammed this country for over-imprisoning our people. This country has targeted and over-imprisoned us more than any other people on earth. The world is watching Australia. The number of First Nations women in custody in particular has been called one of the most challenging human rights issues facing Australia. Our women in this country represent the largest cohort of imprisoned people in the country, comprising approximately 34 per cent of the total number of female imprisoned people, despite making up only 2 per cent of the total population. Imprisoning our women, the keepers of our families, even for a day, causes immense distress and disturbance to family and community life. So many of our women are imprisoned for short sentences or non-violent offences, that is when they are actually sentenced because this country's prisons are heaving with thousands of unsentenced prisoners. This country is happy to be warehousing people in prison instead of supporting them out of poverty. Not surprising since the first thing that the white settlers did when they came to colonise was to turn our ancestral lands into prisons for their convicts. Not only are our women being warehoused in prison, they are subjected to ongoing violence when they are there, including sexual violence. And we already know that the Prime Minister doesn't care about that now, does he? Particularly when it's happening to black bodies. Our people have the answers and the solutions to ending our over-imprisonment. Come speak to us. Don't commission to Deloitte to do a nonsense review so that you can pat yourselves on the back while hundreds of us are dying in prison cells. Shame. The question is the motion moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fioravanti. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I give notice uh, of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notices of motion numbers one and two standing in my name for two sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the ASIC Credit Electronic Pre-Contractual Disclosure Instrument 2020-835 and ASIC Credit Notice Requirements for Unlicensed Carried Over Instrument Lenders Instrument 2020-834. Are there any other notices of motion? There being none, we shall move on. Senators, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 15th of November 2020 of the Honourable Christopher John Herford AO, a former minister and member of the House of Representatives for the Division of Adelaide, South Australia, from 1969 to 1987, 
and I'd like to acknowledge his family joining us in the chamber today, joined by former Speaker of the South Australian Parliament, Mr Michael Atkinson. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, I move that the Senate records its sorrow at the death on 15 November 2020 of the Honourable Christopher John Herford AO, former Minister assisting the Treasurer and Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs and former Member for Adelaide, places on record its gratitude for his dedicated service to the Parliament and the nation and tenders its deep sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Mr President, the Honourable Christopher John Herford AO lived a long life dedicated to improving the lives of all Australians and representing our great nation in public service. By the age of 15, Chris had lived on three continents, experiences which would shape his future and inform his worldly outlook. Chris helped to pioneer the widening of the Australian Labor Party, of the Labor Movement, expanding through his life Labor's base beyond its traditional origins. He was a dedicated and strong believer in the Australian Labor Party and an active member of its South Australian branch. And I acknowledge, indeed, colleagues from the South Australian branch of the Labor Party on the other side here in the chamber uh, and, of course, in the gallery. Although I am informed that, apparently, in 1949, at the age of 19, he was somehow found standing at the Scarborough polling booth, handing out voting cards for the Liberal Party at that historic election. I am sure. Uh, I, I note Senator Farrell's interjections, and, uh, and I'm sure that, uh, that the record uh, can be corrected in that regard, if need be. Chris had been born on the 30th of July, 1931, to Monty and Kathleen Herford Jones in Mao, in central India. His father, Monty, was an Englishman from Bristol who served in Gallipoli and France as an officer with the British Army. His mother, Kathleen, was an Australian whose father was a mining engineer. The two met in Rangoon, Burma, in 1919, marrying shortly thereafter. Chris spent his early years living in India, where his father was stationed after transferring from the British Army to the Indian Army. In 1940, Kathleen took Chris, then aged nine, and his younger brother, to Western Australia to attend boarding school at the Jesuit St Louise School, where he remained until he was 14. During these years, Chris spent many of his school holidays on his grandparents' property near Boyup Brook. His grandparents were a great influence on Chris's life, and the time spent on their property was where his love of country, rural and regional Australia blossomed. In 1945, the family travelled to, India, uh, travelled to England via India for three months to spend time with their father, who was stationed there until India gained its independence in 1947. Once they reached England, Chris attended the oratory school near Reading to finish his education. At age 18, the family moved back to Australia, settled in Western Australia. And while Chris sought to go to university, earning a living became the priority at the time. He began his working career as a trainee chartered accountant in Perth at Rankin, Morrison and Co. However, a couple of years later, after receiving a telegram from an old school friend, he moved across the country to work in the mining industry in Broken Hill. Broken Hill introduced Chris to the trade union movement and was also where he completed his first accounting qualifications at the Broken Hill Technical College. After two years in the mining industry, Chris had saved enough money to go back to England and study part-time at the London School of Economics, where he would later graduate with honours in economics. I doubt that the path from the mines of Broken Hill to the London School of Economics is an especially well-trod one, or indeed has been trod by many others, if any. It is a testament to the work ethic and drive of Chris that he did make that remarkable journey. During his time in London, he met his future wife, Lorna Seidman, a social worker from South Australia. Chris and Lorna would later marry in 1960 and together have five children. While in England, Chris's passion for politics developed and he joined the British Labor Party. In 1958, upon return to Sydney, he joined the local branch there of the Australian Labor Party and a year later, 
moved to Adelaide to be with Lorna, where he was tasked with reviving the Labor Party's North Adelaide branch. Chris would twice stand for the state electorate of Torrens in both 1962 and 1965. Fortunately for him, he was unsuccessful both times. I say fortunately because he was later quoted as saying, he was bloody glad I didn't win because I wasn't really interested in state politics. Apologies to uh, Mr Atkinson in the gallery there. That's, uh, <laughs> Chris's unsuccessful attempts at state politics, and uh, he's not the only one to have unsuccessful political attempts in, uh, in their life. I say personally, and, uh, and looking at you, Senator Farrell, I'll come to that, uh, would lead him to run for the federal electorate of Adelaide in 1969, defeating the then 25-year-old Liberal incumbent member for Adelaide, Andrew Jones. Chris Herford would go on to win Adelaide at seven more elections in 1972, 1975, 1977, 1980, 1983, 1984 and 1987 holding the electorate for 18 years through a remarkable series of wins. Notably, having won Adelaide off of a Liberal MP, his successor candidate in the Adelaide by-election of 1988, I'm sorry to mention Senator Farrell, lost Adelaide to the Liberal candidate Michael Pratt at that election. It's a testament to Chris that he held that seat all those years between those two Liberal MPs short-lived though their careers were in the federal parliament. As a parliamentarian, Chris served in many roles, including as Minister for Housing and Construction, Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, Minister Assisting the Treasurer, as well as a number of roles in the shadow cabinet. Throughout this time, he had many notable achievements. As the Minister for Housing and Construction, he was responsible for the introduction of Labor's first homeowners scheme in 1983. If I think back to the opening remarks I made about his work in broadening Labor's base and the traditional origins of our side of politics under Menzies in seeking uh, to make home ownership a core pillar of our party, it's a demonstration of the work that Chris Herford did in reaching out to broaden the Labor Party base through policies such as the First Homeowners Scheme. Throughout his time as Minister for Immigration, Australia saw a large increase in the intake of migrants. Chris Herford played a key role in the development of the skills-oriented aspects of Australia's immigration policy, which would contribute to our success as one of the most multicultural nations in the world, but also to the successful development of the social licence and support that underpins those immigration policies. Chris, of course, in that long service, had also been a member of the Whitlam government. And during the dismissal in 1975 on his way to question time, he had been confronted in the corridor and informed of what had happened to him, reflecting what a very sad time it was for him at that stage. After his service in the ministry and following the 1987 election, Chris was one of the longest serving members of the ministry and of the Labor Party's parliamentary caucus, and he chose to leave the ministry to make way for new blood. Shortly after making that decision and retiring from the parliament, he was appointed as Australia's Consul General in New York, promoting Australia's interests there with distinction for four years. In returning to Adelaide and to South Australia, Chris accepted the offer of a role at the new University of South Australia, helping to establish a new and important institution that has grown from those early years to serve so many South Australians and create new opportunities for so many. In 1993, in recognition for his service to the Australian Parliament and to Australian-American cultural and commercial relations, Chris was awarded an Officer of the Order of Australia. Like so many of us in this place, family was important to Chris, and I do recognise his family in the gallery today. He was a loved and cherished husband, father and grandfather. Equally like many, having to come to Canberra, it was a challenge to be taken away from family. He spoke of taking the time to phone his children every day, something that I do and I know Senator Wong does and many others in this place reaching out to keep that contact with their loved ones. But of course in our travels today that's a little easier than it was during 
the time of service for Chris and those who have gone before us. And he was quoted talking about having to make those calls, whether wherever he was, from the hot phone boxes in MacArthur uh, or Port Hedland uh, or indeed anywhere around the country or the world, making that effort to maintain those connections. And reflecting beyond the work of his posting in New York, he noted the wonderful benefit that provided of allowing him to spend more time with his children, who would often spend long periods visiting or staying with him in those years. The Hon. Christopher Herford AO passed away on Sunday, November 15, 2020, aged 89. His wife Lorna had passed away in 2005. Together they had been married for over 45 years, and Chris reflected that she had been my best friend for about 50 years. Chris and Lorna are survived by their five children, Alex, David, Philippa, Kate and Richard, and eight grandchildren. On behalf of the Australian Government and the Australian Senate, I extend to Chris's loved ones our gratitude for his service to our thankful nation and our sincerest condolences. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I um, thank uh, Senator Birmingham for his fine uh, contribution to this uh, condolence uh, motion. I'd also like to thank Senator Wong for allowing me to make this contribution on behalf of the Labor Party <coughs> um, because uh, Chris Sherford uh, was both my friend, <coughs> my mentor and a, uh, a uh, very important colleague. Um, Chris uh, was the uh, Labor member for Adelaide from 1969 until 1987, and he passed away, as the minister has just indicated, on the 15th of November last year. My abiding memory of Chris is of his big, generous smile. Uh, it would always cheer you up, and uh, his good uh, humour is and will continue to be sadly missed. Uh, today's condolence motion, and I thank the President uh, <clears throat> for this, uh, has been timed to allow many of his family to be here uh, with, uh, with us today to honour the man. And I guess it's appropriate, <clears throat> given Chris's mother's Irish heritage, uh, that uh, it's taking place on St Patrick's Day. Chris's daughter Alex, sons David and Richard, daughters-in-law Margaret and Emma, and uh, grandchildren Georgia, Tom, Claire and Matt are all uh, here with us in the gallery uh, today. Uh, Chris's daughter Philippa and Kate and their families were unfortunately not able to travel to Canberra today, uh, but I believe they'll be watching from, uh, from their home in Adelaide. To all of uh, Chris's family, I offer my deep uh, personal condolences. Um, Chris's funeral was held on one of those very hot Adelaide summer's days, uh, the sorts uh, that uh, are so vividly described by Peter Goldsworthy in his novel uh, Three Dog Night. <clears throat> the funeral was held under strict COVID conditions, unfortunately. Uh, so I was uh, honoured to be one of the 50 people invited by the family to attend the, uh, the funeral. Uh, fittingly, his granddaughter sang a, who's present here today, touchingly poetic version of Summertime from Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, which I'm told was one of Chris's favourite uh, songs. Chris's early years, as a I'll explain shortly, <clears throat> were not what you'd necessarily think as a typical Labor upbringing. So I've wondered since the funeral whether an interest in the issues of racial inequality, which are addressed in Porgy and Best, were perhaps one motivating factor in Chris's uh, joining uh, the progressive side of uh, politics. Christopher John Herford was born in India on the 30th of uh, July 1931 to his English father, Monty, and his uh, Australian mother, Kathleen. In 1940, shortly after the start of the Second World War, Chris's mother uh, took him and his younger brother, Dave, from India to her home state of Western Australia by sea. The thinking was that the uh, war would be short 
uh, and that the boys could see it out in the care of their grandparents on a wheat farm in the state's uh, southwest. But the war, of course, was longer than expected, and for five years the brothers boarded at the Jesuit school, St Louis, in Perth, and for five years spent uh, the school holidays on their grandfather's farm uh, on, and uh, on the coast. In 1944, Chris's mother, Kath, returned to Australia to collect her sons, braving Japanese submarines in the Indian Ocean. They returned to India for three months before travelling to England, where Chris completed his schooling. In 1949, the whole family migrated to Western Australia um, and uh, they, were, they qualified as uh, so-called 10-pound poms uh, because, of course, Chris's father was, uh, was English. Uh, Chris began training as a chartered accountant in Perth before moving to take up an accountancy job in Broken Hill a town, of course, with very strong trade union uh, presence. From Broken Hill, where he was uh, a very proud beneficiary of the lead bonus, uh, Chris was able to return to England to study uh, at the London School of Economics, established, of course, by the Fabians, uh, on, the, on weekends. He supported himself by working as an accountant for Marx and Spencer. It was during this time that uh, Chris met uh, the great love of his life and his future wife, Lorna, and by 1960 they were married and back living in, uh, in Adelaide. Lorna was a wonderful person and, like so many parliamentary spouses, she selfless, selflessly supported Chris and their children during his many trips to, to Canberra. Uh, she continued to do good works, especially with uh, St Vincent de Paul, where she would often uh, rope in my wife uh, and uh, until her untimely death in uh, 2005. Chris, of course, was heartbroken and uh, I know the whole family still miss uh, Lorna deeply. At his funeral, uh, Chris's family spoke about how growing up exposed to the ruling British Raj in India and the caste system there, along with uh, British boarding school and the class system, might have played a role in him becoming such a fine Labor man. Chris told his family that his time in Broken Hill, where he was in management but also in the union, although I suspect it was probably compulsory to join, he may not have had any choice, knowing Broken Hill as I do, and he drank and socialised in the union pubs and also uh, that played a big role in his uh, future. Chris transferred his membership from uh, Sydney, uh, his ALP membership from Sydney, where he, when he moved to Adelaide and was uh, tasked with reviving the North Adelaide uh, sub-branch of the ALP, a no mean feat in the Playford gerrymandered South Australian electoral system of the time. As uh, the minister said, he stood unsuccessfully for the uh, safe Liberal seat of Torrens in 1962 uh, and 1965. Uh, and while he uh, obviously lost, he gained respectable swings to Labor. <coughs> he obviously impressed the machine that ran the South Australian branch of the Labor Party at that time, uh, Jeff Virgo, Clyde Cameron and Jim Toohey. Uh, and as a result, <coughs> his effort, efforts were rewarded in 1969 when he was elected as the federal member for Adelaide and uh, entered the uh, federal parliament. Since the 1940s, Adelaide had largely been a Labor-supporting seat, but it fell to uh, Liberal Andrew Jones, one of the youngest uh, ever members of the House of Representatives in the uh, coalitions all the way with LBJ landslide of 1966. But the people of Adelaide quickly realised their mistake. Jones proved unpopular and Chris regained uh, the seat for the Labor Party with a resounding 14.3 per cent swing at the uh, Don's Party election of 1969. That's right, Don's Party. That was when it was. Uh, he turned Adelaide into a safe uh, Labor seat in one stroke, and uh, Chris won enough votes on the first count to take the seat without the need for preferences. He, uh, and he held Adelaide until the end of uh, 19. Uh, 
1987, when he resigned to become Australia's Consul General in New York. As the minister said, uh, his resignation triggered the 1988 uh, Adelaide by-election, the so-called uh, timed uh, telephone uh, call uh, by-election. <coughs> Uh, that uh, by-election became my first very unsuccessful run for parliament, um, and I know he was uh, dis very disappointed uh, when we were unable to hold his seat on his departure, but the less said about that campaign, the better. <coughs> uh, but I'd like to say a little bit about Chris's time in parliament. Being an accountant by trade, it's perhaps unsurprising that one of Chris's first roles in the pa parliament uh, was on the Joint Statutory uh, Committee of Public uh, Accounts, and he served on that committee from 1969 until 1973, uh, including uh, six months of chair of that committee. Chris's other committee services included uh, chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Prices from May 1973 to November 1975, a member of the House Standing Committee on uh, Standing Orders from 1975 and uh, again from 1980 to 1983, and as a member of the uh, Expenditure Committee in 1976. After the Hawke Labor government was resoundingly uh, elected in 1983, Chris was appointed Minister for Housing and Construction in the first uh, Hawke Ministry from March 1983 until December 1984. <clears throat> he was promoted to Cabinet in the second Hawke Ministry as Minister for uh, Immigration and uh, Ethnic Affairs until February 1987. At that time, he replaced Don Grimes as Minister for Community Services, following Grimes' announcement that he would not seek re-election. Chris also served, um, importantly, as Minister Assisting the Treasurer, where he helped out a very young and ambitious Paul Keating from uh, May uh, 1983 to July 1987. Chris made a significant contribution to the Hawke-Keating era that led to the opening up of the Australian economy, uh, which itself led to almost 30 years of uninterrupted economic prosperity for this country. After the 1987 election, uh, Chris withdrew from the third uh, Hawke ministry and after retiring from parliament at the end of that year, became Australia's Consul General in New York, a, a uh, role that he performed with distinction for, uh, for four years. Although still only in his early 60s, Chris never returned uh, to public life as such after his return to New York, and I think that was probably a loss to, uh, to South Australia. In recent years, uh, myself and Michael Atkinson, who's in the chamber today, the former Speaker of the South Australian House of Assembly, um, uh, would join Chris for lunch at his uh, North Adelaide apartment, where uh, we would spend uh, the afternoon reminiscing about the good old days. Um, and I'd like to say a few words at a personal level um, about my friendship with uh, Chris. I first met Chris when I joined the Labor Party in 1976. Seems like a very long time ago now. I lived then, where I do now, in uh, Little Sturt Street in Adelaide uh, CBD, and Chris was my local federal member of parliament. Uh, for some reason, Chris uh, befriended me, a young lawyer uh, for the Shop Assistance Union, uh, which wasn't an easy thing to do uh, with the memory of the labour split of the 1950s, uh, still fresh in the minds of many in the ALP. Uh, the groundbreaking Dunstan decade was soon to come to an end. The ALP was split between the centre-left, um, who backed uh, Bill Hayden in South Australia, and the rampaging left under Peter Duncan and Nick Bolkus. The right, based on the uh, Shop Assistance Union, which advertiser <coughs> journalist Ration Randall Ashbourne said uh, con could conveniently meet in a telephone, book, uh, telephone booth, uh, was just beginning to grow. In 1984, Chris broke with the ruling uh, centre-left group uh, around uh, John Bannon and established Labor Unity uh, at a meeting held at Chris's house in Finnis Street, North Adelaide, where all of his uh, children uh, grew up. 
In attendance were Bob Hawke supporters Graham Richardson and Simon Cream, as well as local, uh, locals uh, Michael O'Brien, Paul Holloway, John Bogue and myself. It was a meeting that ultimately led to the modern South Australian Labor machine, which with the uh, left's Patrick Conlon led to an unbroken 16 years of Labor government in South Australia, the most successful government in the modern era. Uh, our branch owes a sincere debt of gratitude to Chris Herford. Uh, when later Rep Michael Atkinson join us, joined us, a, a young advertiser journalist who became uh, Attorney General and Speaker of the South Australian Parliament. On one occasion, as Labor unity were beginning to grow, we were suddenly entitled to two national conference positions for an up-and-coming national conference uh, meeting. Michael and I uh, presumptuously decided that we would fill those two positions uh, and go down to Tasmania and rep represent the group down there. However, Chris quickly disavowed us of that idea and made it clear that he would be a delegate along with my boss, uh, John Bogue. Michael also reminded me uh, this morning of a, a trip Chris took to Canberra when he was surprised to see Ron Owens, the very burly Secretary of the Builders Labourers, Labourers Union, sitting up at the pointy end of the plane. Um, and he expressed some surprise uh, that Ron would be up there. And Ron, quick as a flash, said, nothing was too good for the workers or their representatives. Chris, <coughs> brand of sensible progressive policies, uh, has of course set the branch up for a return to a government uh, led by Peter Malinowskis at the next state election. On behalf of the Federal Labor Party, I wish to thank Chris for his contribution to our success and to the betterment of our nation. All of us can honour his memory by following the example that he set of working, uh, of working to reduce inequality and to make Australia a fairer place, where people from all work, walks of life can share in the nation's prosperity. Chris Herford was a fine, fine man, and he will be sadly missed. May he rest in peace. I ask all honourable senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried. I shall now move on, Senators. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I'll commence with the clerk. Postponement notification, a postponement notification has been lodged as follows. General business notice of motion number 1070, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, from today to 18 March. I remind senators the question may be put on, any, on the proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall. Oh, sorry, Senator Urquhart. Uh, I, uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators for personal reasons: to Senator Polly for the 17th to the 18th of March 2021, and to Senator Carr for the 18th of March 2021. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Smith. Mr. President, I also seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Brockman. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Brockman for today for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business and I'll try and do it in an order most convenient to the Senate. Can we commence with business of the Senate matter number one? In the name of Senator Hanson. Senator Roberts, are you in a position to move that? No, I'm not, sorry. Okay, I'll come back to that. We will then deal with business of the Senate matter number two in the name of Senator Kitching. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number two, proposing a reference to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. 
Could I come to government business matter number one? Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I ask that government business notices of motion numbers one and two be taken together and as formal. Is there any objection? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move that the following bills be introduced a bill for an act to amend the National Health Act 1953 and for related purposes, and a bill for an act to amend the Royal Commissions Act 1902 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham. I present the bills and move that these bills may proceed without formalities and be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. National Health Amendment Pharmaceutical Benefits Transparency and Cost Recovery Bill 2021, Royal Commission's Amendment Protection of Information Bill 2021. Senator Dunningham. I table the explanatory memoranda relating to the bills and move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to 11 May 2021. Senator Dunningham. I move that the bills be listed on the notice paper as separate orders of the day. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. I'll now jump to 1065, Senator Waters. Thank you, uh, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1065 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Griff, could we come to your matter number 1069? So I ask that general business notice of motion number 1069 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Griff. I move the motion. Question is, oh, Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. National health priorities are determined in consultation with states and territories. The Morrison government is determined to continue working to prevent babies from being born with FASD supporting women and families to stop drinking if they are planning to have a baby and during the pregnancy, and helping babies born with this condition. We're investing nearly $24 million of funding for FASD diagnostic and support services, which is in addition to the $25 million announcement for a national awareness campaign on the risk of drinking alcohol during pregnancy. Uh, these uh, commitments bring the total government investment into the fight against FASD to more than $75 million since 2012. The question is the motion moved by Senator Griff be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson, could we come to your matter, business of the Senate, matter number one? Look, all I can ask is that um, the Senate move my, um, my notice of motion, number one. Um, it's probably I haven't got any documentation here whatsoever. So are you seeking that the motion be taken as, taken as formal? Yes, please. Is Seek there the being no objection? You can move the motion, Senator I move Hanson? the motion. The question is that business of the Senate motion number one in the name of Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Could I now proceed to Senator Wish Wilson, 1066? I ask that general business notice of motion 1066 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Wish Wilson. I move the motion. Senator McAllister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Labor opposes this motion because it is not helpful for the Senate to set itself up as the arbiter of individual projects, motion by motion. Rather than playing wedge politics, Labor advocates for the protection of the environment, the comprehensive protection of the environment and for secure jobs. And we are calling on the Morrison government to introduce strong national environment standards to establish a genuinely independent cop on the beat for Australia's environment and fix the explosion in job and investment delays caused by their massive funding cuts to the department. And Labor is the only party that will protect jobs and the environment. Senator Roberts. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One Nation opposes this motion that highlights the hypocrisy of green wind power. The Robins Island development will place 122 wind turbines on pristine coastal Land, coastland in northwest Tasmania. Now I can understand Senator Wish Wilson's concerns at having 122 bird choppers sitting in the middle of a bird sanctuary. What could go wrong? Green jobs do exist, even if the only skill required is the ability to use a bucket and a spade. Robins Island will generate power where we don't need it, then use a 115 kilometre high voltage power line to bring intermittent power into the grid. This transmission line will carve its way through sensitive coastal salt marsh. The problem with this development 
is not only the avian carnage, Tasmanian devils are native to the area. Their habitat will be dug up to install the base for the wind turbines and then covered in 30,000 tonnes of concrete. How green is that? It's time to put a st stop to this green energy madness. The question is the motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1066 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 8, noes 37. The matter is resolved in the negative. Could I come to matter number 1064 in the name of Senators Rice and Waters? Senator Waters? Yes, thank you, President. I seek leave to make a minor amendment to General Business uh, Notice for Motion number 1064, uh, which has been circulated in the chamber before asking that it be taken as formal. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Waters. Thank you. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. I move the motion as amended. Senator Dunningham. Uh, Mr President, the government would like to split the motion, uh, having part 1A considered separately from part 1B and part 2, and in doing so I'd seek leave to make a short statement as well. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Mr President. The Senate notes the sentiments and concerns of those who marched yesterday and signed related petitions. That's why, since 2013, the government has committed more than $1 billion to reduce violence against women and children and is working on the next national plan. Along with other measures to support uh, staff, we've appointed the Sex Discrimination Commissioner to conduct an independent review into the workplaces of parliamentarians and their staff. Politicians, like all Australians, have the right to the presumption of innocence, and we cannot support a dangerous precedent to stand down an individual merely on the basis of an allegation. Okay, so according to the request, I'm going to put first uh, clause A, um, and then I'll separately put um, B and 2, although it's worded in a way that makes that difficult, but I, can, I imagine that can be made on the run. Um, unless the clerk objects. Senator Waters? Seek some clarification. Which bits you want? One um, the government and has asked B2, that, is that, that right? The government has asked that Clause 1A be treated separately from Clause 1B and 2. Um, the only hassle is that Clause 1A, the covering clause of 1, says that the Senate. Now, I will just assume that that can stand regardless of what happens. So we are dealing with Clauses A, Roman 1, 2, 1 and 2. And three, and then we'll deal with clause B. And, um, is everyone clear? So the question is that clause one A of motion one o six four be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now the question is that clause one B and clause two of motion one o six four be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is that clauses 1b and 2 of motion 1064 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes and Senator Smith tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the negative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber for a couple of divisions. Can I move to matter number 1067, Senator Rennick? I'll give you a, I'll give you a moment to take your... Uh, I ask the general business notice... Motion 1067 relating to carbon emissions be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. There is. I'll now move to motion number 1068 in the name of Senator McMahon and others. Senator McMahon. Senator McMahon. <laughs> I ask that general business notice of motion number 1068 uh, relating to affordable and reliable power supply be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to move general business notices of motion numbers 1067 and 1068 together and for the motions to be determined without amendment or debate. Is leave granted? No. Senator Dunningham. I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent general business notices of motion 1067 and 1068 being moved together immediately and determined without amendment or debate. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. Senator Patrick. Just in accordance with the standing orders, I'd like to, to be recorded as, uh, as voting against that division. Senator Patrick, Thank so you. recorded. So the question, Senator Waters. Um, Pres, I've got two statements that I seek leave to table in relation to each of the motions. Yep. Uh, leave, leave is granted to Senator Waters to table those statements. Leave is granted. Senator Roberts. I seek leave to table a, uh, a statement on motion 1057. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Does anyone want the matters put separately or can I put them together? Okay, I'll put them together. Motions no, the question is that motions number 1067 and 1068 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The aye. Senator McAllister. Uh, the, look, in lieu of calling a division, I request that you record the Labor Party's opposition on notices of motion 1067 and 1068. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Seawitt. Senator Seawitt. For the Greens, I also ask that the Greens opposition to 1067 and 1068 be recorded. Thank you. So noted. Any other, anything else? That concludes the discovery of formal business. I'll give senators a moment to resume their seats or depart the chamber before we proceed to the next matter.
curioso. next we'll manage to get through it I suppose oh, good. oh thanks very much can I start now then yes it is If senators could, if they're not staying in the chamber, could they please leave as quickly as possible? I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 27 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator McCarthy. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The need for the Morrison government to explain how rebadging in its, its inadequate loan scheme is good enough for tens of thousands of struggling small businesses that will face the impact of JobKeeper cuts on 28 March. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call on Senator O'Neill. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I, I take the opportunity to congratulate Senator McCarthy for uh, submitting this uh, matter for public, of public interest for discussion this afternoon. The matter of public interest is the government's callous withdrawal of job seeker and job keeper and its particular effect on my home region of the New South Wales Central Coast. The COVID-19 pandemic has created a two-track economy. At business forums that I've been hosting around the Central Coast, I've been delighted to hear that local manufacturers such as the bin company Sulo have been going gangbusters and are desperate for extra trained staff. Other businesses in our world-class tourism, arts and events sector are doing far, far worse. And this is indeed a reflection of the profound patchiness of the recovery of some jobs and also indications of further major problems from this government about the capacity for people who need to employ to be able to find workers to do the work that they need, and that's a, a, a litany of failures that have led to that reality in the country. JobKeeper was a vital part of the stimulus that halted the economic wrecking ball that COVID initially threatened. It was part of a stimulus that government, labour and the union movement all worked together uh, on a rare, in a rare act of bipartisanship. Now, the vital stimulus of the same kind that the Liberal and the National parties railed against in the GFC when Labor did it, but I would rather them be hypocrites than do the wrong thing for the country. They didn't want to do it. They didn't want to support JobKeeper and JobSeeker, but ultimately they pushed the panic button, recalled the parliament and responded to Labor's leadership on this matter. At the height of the pandemic, the payments were sent out to 3.5 uh, million workers and that's nearly a third of the national workforce. And it was done so to keep workers tied to their workforce. Around 11,000 local businesses on the central coast of New South Wales uh, are actually receiving JobKeeper. Now, 11,000 businesses is 47 per cent of all businesses on the central coast, so nearly half the businesses on JobKeeper. That means that thousands of Central Coast jobs are at risk when Scott Morrison and Mr Josh Frydenberg pull the rug out from under those businesses in just 11 days. In New South Wales, the New South Wales Business Chamber has reported that across the state, 23 per cent of businesses that they surveyed believe they were at high risk of failure. 
when supports such as JobKeeper ended. But you would never know that from the sort of answers to questions we had today here in the chamber. But that just further reflects a government completely out of touch with the reality of small businesses under incredible pressure. The businesses that are most likely to go under are indeed those small and medium enterprises which pre-COVID-19 were the engine room of the Australian economy and more particularly on the Central Coast, our great local employers. Independent economist Nikki Hutley thinks 100,000 jobs could be lost as a result of the JobKeeper cuts, which would also take around $5 billion out of the economy. Deloitte Access Economics also reported that around 40 per cent 40 per cent of all businesses in the hospitality, professional services and transport sectors do not have the cash reserves to cover more than three months of operation in the current environment. Now, This clearly, for anybody who understands small business, is an unsustainable situation. And there are particular industries that we absolutely need to save. But this government has failed to do the work to locate the pressure points and deliver what is needed for small businesses across this country in any way that actually meets the demand. On February the 12th of this year, I visited the historic Avoca Beach Picture Theatre to speak to the wonderful owners, our local legends Beth and Norman Hunter. I spoke with them about the drastic effects of COVID-19 on their business and indeed on all independent cinemas across the industry. They told me they were terrified about the effects of cancellation of JobKeeper on their 30 staff members and their complaints to the government across the nation for the sector continue to fall on deaf ears. They weren't just advocating for themselves, they were advocating for cinemas right across this country. We need to do far more to support local and independent cinemas. There's been no case of COVID-19 worldwide that's been contracted in a movie theatre. And we need to support our local cinemas and local industries that are doing it tough. So if you haven't been to the movies in a while, Senators, I encourage you all to do so. Support a local cinema. They need your assistance. On that same day, I also had the privilege to visit EI Productions, a proud family-run local business in West Gosford that provides expert lighting, lighting and technical expertise to live music productions. If you've been to a fantastic concert from a major Australian or international band, pretty good chance that they were the ones who did the lighting and sound and gave you a great show. Pre-pandemic, this business, based on the local, in my local area on the Central Coast, was one of the top performers in its field in Australia. But the shutdown of the live music industry and global travel have left this once bustling business absolutely struggling. It's exactly the kind of business that JobKeeper was created to protect and is now being abandoned by this government. It was a competitive industry leader, brought low not by willful neglect or poor business techniques, but by a once-in-a-generation pandemic that crippled their specific industry. The government needs to listen. The government needs to support exactly these kinds of local businesses. The government needs to extend JobKeeper to hard-working Australians like Caroline and Neil Mace. The industry group representing the New South Wales events industry, Save New South Wales Events, surveyed their industry recently and they found out what the government couldn't hear, that is that 95 per cent of those businesses were on JobKeeper. The whole industry has declined to the tune of almost 82 per cent from April to December 2020. The survey reported that 45 per cent of those companies will lay off staff, 42 per cent will have to close their doors when this government rips JobKeeper away. What they need is targeted support to keep their doors open till better times arrive. We cannot allow the two-track economy to continue. Otherwise, we're going to have an incredible loss of capacity and devastation of uh, job loss for those people who simply have nowhere to go and put their great skills to work. 
What the government's decided to do to these businesses that have been struggling for more than 12 months with this massive downturn is to give them another layer of debt. Another layer of debt. Offering them loans instead of the support that they need right now. While it's better than nothing, it's going to mean that businesses taking on further debt to survive, with the vaccine rollout far away and increasing variants on the virus, will be forced by this government to take on liabilities in an increasingly insecure environment. These loans may even be rejected by banks on, the risk, on risk grounds, leaving the businesses with no support whatsoever. And the government's got pretty poor form on organising loan programs. The last one was so poorly organised that it promoted and promoted that only 5 per cent of the funds went out the door. But they announce a big sum, get the big you know, razzle-dazzle announcement out of the way, and then the disaster follows behind closed doors. And that's what they keep getting away with. But time's up. This sort of action isn't sufficient. It isn't smart policy. It isn't right. The data is there. The indicators are there. The peaks of the, the industries that are at risk are revealing the shape of need for small business in this country. But this government is blind and deaf when it comes to that and refuses to respond. Mr Morrison's government is not listening and the invisible member Lucy Wicks have shut down the Edelong Centrelink office at this time, knowing for over two years that the lease was ending. They didn't find another location and instead they let the centre go. Now This is a gut punch to people on the peninsula at a time when they absolutely need it. We're approaching a cliff on March the 31st with JobKeeper withdrawn. This government, who closed a Centrelink office, will be built Bring businesses Senator to the brink your, your of disaster. Time has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. Well, well, well. The fox is in the hen house. The fox is in the hen house. Here we go. We've got Labor suddenly worried about small business. Get real. I mean, this is the fox that wants to destroy small business. This is the party that wants higher taxes. This is the party. This is the party that wants higher energy prices. I just put a forward a motion then to support nuclear energy, which would give us clean, green, baseload energy. No. What do they do? They want to vote against it. Another way to lower energy costs. I mean, if the Labor Party were really serious about small business, they'd vote with us on these IR reforms, which would help improve flexibility and give employees and employers the opportunity to get back to work. But no, not the Labor Party. And let's look at the Labor state premiers. What have they done? They have destroyed confidence. They have destroyed confidence. And instead, they have replaced it with fear. And they have used COVID as a method to command and control. To mark command and control. And that is Labor's modus operandi all the time: is to instill fear into everyone. Well, I happen to know someone from the music industry. I've been talking to them very closely. They need open borders, number one, and they need consistent restrictions, number two, and they need some of those restrictions lifted. Because when you've got restrictions that vary between state to state, people aren't going to travel because they don't know. They don't know if they're going to get back home. Okay? They don't know if they're going to get back home. Uh, so, you know, to, just to listen to the Labor Party keep going on about how you know, businesses are going to hit the wall, how we don't really care, can I say it's an insult. And they're trying to attack here the coalition. They're trying to attack the coalition, but I'll tell you who they're really attacking. They're attacking the taxpayer. Because in the last 12 months, the taxpayer has forked out a total of $250 billion, $250 billion to support small business and their employees. Right? Now, at some point, and this is what Labor don't seem to understand, we have to start moving forward. JobKeeper and JobSeeker were all about protecting people while we locked down to get on top of COVID. Right? That was in order to stay locked down. Now that we're on top of COVID, okay, we have to open up. We have to increase activity. We have to increase activity. Now, when Senator O'Neill stands there and says we don't listen, we have been listening. And the overall feedback we've been getting from employers is that they can't get employees back to work. 
And a part of the reason for that is that a lot of employees have stayed home because of job seeker or job keeper. Right? Well, out there in regional Queensland, they are screaming out for work. They are screaming out for uh, employees. And while we continue to keep job seeker and job keeper going, it's going to encourage people to stay at home. So now we need to get people back to work. And, and we accept there's going to be an adjustment here somewhere, um, but we stand committed to supporting both employees and employers in Australia. But what we won't take is the other side, Labor, who are all about fear and negativity. Because I tell you what business rely on most, and that is confidence. It is all about confidence. And while we have Labor Party over there constantly talking down the economy, constantly talking down the government, constantly talking down our recovery, constantly talking down how bad everything is, you know, they're, they're going after, they're making personal smears, all the rest of it, that destroys confidence. Yeah. That destroys confidence. And that is the difference between this side of the chamber and that side of the chamber. This, this side of the chamber, we're optimists. We're positive. We're glass half full people. We're not all that negative, dreary, oh, the world's falling in. No, no, we say get out from under the doona. Get out there, enjoy the sunshine, and let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. But you know, I've got talking points here, and I actually couldn't actually, I didn't bother printing them all off because there's 16 pages of talking points about just how much we have supported small business in the last 12 months. And to be quite frank, since the start, the start of this country. I mean, our whole uh, party was founded on the Forgotten People speech was all about small business. Because we on this side of the chamber understand that small business is the heart of capitalism. Small business is the heart of individualism. Small business is the heart of autonomy, independence, freedom, making up your own mind, choosing what you want to do with your life. Okay, if it wasn't for small business are the backbone of this economy. And we have stood here shoulder to shoulder with small business to make sure that they survive. To make sure that they survive. And for the fox to come in here into their hen house and pretend that bark, 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 they're chickens too. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. We can see the fox here. And it is on that side of the chamber. It is on that side of the chamber because the Labor Party hates small business. They have always imposed more regulation. They have sold the infrastructure that small business relies on to provide them cheap energy, cheap water. I mean, you've only got to look at the state Labor government and what they've done. They've sold all our infrastructure off to foreign owners. They won't build dams. Not only do they not build dams, they tear dams down. They've shut down small uh, maternity wards in regional Queensland. So the people and farmers now, they, they don't want to go to regional Queensland. You won't get doctors going to regional Queensland. I was at the rural doctors' lunch yesterday, and the rural doctors were saying how Families just won't move to regional towns because they don't want to go to a town where there's no um, good health services. And you know, you've only got to look at Queensland Labor's record in shutting down over 30 maternity wards, 30 maternity wards, many in towns that have now had populations that are bigger, that are bigger, to know that Labor do not care about the little guy. I'll make an exception for Senator Sheldon and Senator Stirl. I know those two guys care about the little guy. But as for the left wing of the party, they're all about telling the small business how to live their life, what they should be doing, and increasing regulation and increasing taxes. That is not the way forward. That is not the way forward. So I'm going to read out all the support that the coalition government has provided to small business. Has provided to small business. For a start. Well, we don't have enough time. We don't have enough time. I mean, I'd have to uh, move a motion to get the rest of the whole MPI time to go through it. Um, I'll, go, I'll go through a couple of pages. There's 16 pages here, but there are billions, billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars in support, courtesy of the taxpayer, who just happens to be small business, and courtesy, of, co of course, to our children, who are going to have to pay some of this COVID debt off, which is why we need to get business moving forward again so that we start paying the debt off and don't leave it to our children. Yeah. We don't leave it to our children. Now, it's the coalition government. It's the coalition government that has cut the tax rate for small and medium business from 27.5% to 26%. To 26%. We've got a long way to go because withholding tax rates, we've got to lift. I'm working on that one. Don't worry. 
Uh, what else have we done? We've, we've uh, also uh, accelerated personal income tax. Now, that matters because I'll tell you why. The lower income tax is for uh, individuals. When you give a pay rise, that's more money they get to keep in their pocket. So that, that is a future benefit that flows through to the economy. Now, we've also expanded small business tax concessions. Small business tax concessions. Small business now can get an immediate write off of 150 grand. I know farmers uh, especially like that one because they can go and buy a new tractor or a new, uh, new plough or uh, whatever. So that's a really, really good one. Uh, as well as that, we've uh, simplified our credit framework, uh, improved access to finance. Uh, we've small, been supporting small business research and development, increasing the refundable research and development tax offset from uh, to 18.5 per cent and removing the annual cash refund cap for small claim, uh, claimants. Uh, the other thing we've done is we've reformed Australia's insolvency framework. We've enabled small business to get paid faster by introducing payment times reporting framework and the procurement connected policy. Now that is really, really important because it is incredibly important that small business gets paid as quickly as possible to keep the cash rolling in. We've supported small business with tax disputes. We've pushed back on the ATO. Like all bureaucrats, they tend to get a bit uh, carried away and a bit Orwellian and, and dystopian in the way they like to uh, bully small business around. We've said that's enough, enough, boys. Just remember who's paying your wages. We've reduced regulation and compliance tax uh, uh, costs. We've increased digital capability. Uh, we've invested in the mental health of business owners. We've worked to get our workplace relations settings right, which is with these uh, industrial relations laws, which are going to actually give more flexibility to both the employer and the employee. We've encouraged Australians to go local first. We've got to keep working on that. We need to do more work there, but we will go and do that. Uh, and we've, worked, we've also We've also, and this is the one, uh, I just want to uh, run this line through. We've offered, get a load of this, where is it? I can't find it, it's over on this page. Um, now, this recovery scheme, Senator we've increased Rennie, the split your from 50. Time okay, has right. See, I told you I'm... Senator McKean. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, buried in that load of tripe from Senator Rennick was an admission that we're facing a massive austerity budget coming down the line. And as we know, austerity doesn't work. And of course, it is the poorest of Australians who suffer the most under our Liberal austerity budgets. Now, reports that the government is planning to extend their small business loans is yet another example of this government looking extremely busy but actually not doing very much. I want to be really clear. There is, of course, merit in extending the scheme. Many small businesses are likely to continue to struggle, and all the more so once JobKeeper finishes at the end of this month. But if the government or Senator Rennick uh, would be interested in this, I feel, if the government actually wanted to help small businesses, then they'd go to one of the root causes of the problem, that Australia's financial system, aided and abetted by the big corporate banks, is rigged in favour of housing. Over the last 30 years, banks have gone from lending twice as much money to businesses as they did for housing to now lending twice as much money for housing as they do to businesses. Now, under the reign of the neoliberals, Australia's financial system has gone from one that served the real economy by provi providing loans for productive enterprise to one that serves the speculators in the housing market by providing even larger loans for those investing in ever-increasing house prices. The Productivity Commission undertook an extensive inquiry into competition in the financial system just three years ago and it found this. The reform that would most significantly improve small to medium enterprise access to finance would be changes to the underlying prudential requirements for SME lending compared with lending for residential mortgages. So there you have it. In other words, fix the financial system so it's not rigged in favour of housing speculators. That's what we should be doing. Make it so that the banks aren't able to lend so much more against their capital holdings for housing as they are for small businesses. And that would help put some balance back in the financial system and our economy in favour of people who are actually doing something with the money they lent rather than betting and speculating on ever-increasing house prices. Now, it's not surprising that the government's small business loan scheme has been undersubscribed, but there is uh, no such issue in the housing market, I can assure you. 
Over the last 12 months, consumer lending for housing grew 44 per cent, the highest rise over any 12-month period on record. In part, this is thanks to the RBA's ambivalence about the flow of credit. What has happened is this. The RBA has printed hundreds of billions of new dollars, pumped it into the financial system and said to the banks, basically, you can do what you like with it. And not surprisingly, with spending down and business confidence low, the banks have gone, oh, well, we'll stick that money into the housing market. I mean, no wonder an entire generation of young people are being priced out of the great Australian dream of owning their own, help, uh, owning their own home. But even that is not enough for the LNP in here and their corporate banking masters. Despite the largest increase in consumer lending on record, an increase in risky lending, according to APRA figures released just yesterday, the government has introduced legislation to abolish responsible lending laws to make it even easier for the banks to lend even more money. This government and their corporate banking masters want even more money to flow into one of the most overpriced housing markets on the planet. Like just about everything this government has done in response to the pandemic, their plans to rip up responsible lending laws are firstly all about helping their big corporate mates, secondly leaving ordinary Australians to fend for themselves, and that of course includes small business. What small business really needs is the same as what everyone else needs, which is for the LNP to stop acting as agents of the big corporate banks in this place. What we need is for the rules in the financial system and the tax system to be rewritten so that we reward and support productive enterprise and the rapid transition to a zero carbon future and we stop rewarding and stop supporting financialised capitalism and all of the other corporate rent seekers who will not stop until they have taken control of every corner of our economic system. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam. Uh, Acting Deputy President, and uh, I sort of want to sort of thank Senator McKim for his contribution, uh, considering the one that we had earlier from um, Senator Rennick. Um, I, look, I also rise to speak on this matter of public importance that's been been brought before the Senate today, and surely just uh, a few days away from this government's premature ending of JobKeeper, and this matter could not be of any more public importance than it is right now. Over the course of the last 12 months, JobKeeper has been a lifeline for millions of Australians right around the country. This time last year, as many of our fellow Australians faced the prospect of losing their livelihoods, to have JobKeeper there to support them at that time could not have been more important. As important as it was then, it remains so now. Whilst it is certainly the case that in some areas of the economy there has been a steady transition towards relative normality, for many the future continues to remain uncertain. In fact, in my home state of Victoria, the premature ending of JobKeeper is estimated to impact upon 134,000 businesses employing around 413,000 workers. Almost half a million workers, Madam Acting Deputy President, in my state alone. Now, for those 413,000 workers, the same concerns they had this time last year persist today. For those workers transitioning to, relatively normal, to relative normality, like others, may have been fortunate to do, but it is not an option. Some of them may work in retail, in hospitality, restaurants, in tourism, but these are by no means the extent of it. Many, many other industries then those will find themselves affected by this decision by the coalition government. And that is because for them, the recovery, such as it is, 
is still yet to be realised. For them, the shocks of the COVID-19 pandemic remain. And this could be no more the, than the case in my home state, where the pandemic has brought quite profound disruption. Whilst those in other states were at bars, at cafes and restaurants, roam in their regions or simply getting on with their lives as best as they could, Victorians, through no fault of their own, were mostly confined to their homes, only in rare instances permitted to even stray just five kilometres beyond. Now, I was obviously one of those Victorians, and take it from me, the economic effects of this remain. The support that was put in place, particularly of JobKeeper, continues to be welcome and it is quite frankly needed. One must ask themselves what could possibly possess this government to think that cutting the safety net for these workers whilst they still remain laying in, in it is a good idea. You know, we've heard from other members across the aisle justification after justification. But the reality is there are people who will do it tough, who will struggle, who need that support from their government. That is why they pay their taxes and they look up to government. They are looking to, up to all of us here in Canberra wanting that support. What kind of government would seek to throw 413,418 working families into financial peril? But I suppose when one ponders the question, it should hardly be surprising that we see this government, this coalition government of all governments, seeking to undertake such an action. Of course, let us in this place and this country not forget that JobKeeper was never a proposal that those opposite were prepared to embrace. In fact, it, when it was initially proposed by those in the Labor movement, by those on my side of the chamber and the crossbench, it was dismissed out hand by this government. Let me quote from the Prime Minister, who on the 25th of March last year said, the best way to get help to people is through the existing payment channels. To dream up other schemes can be very dangerous. Dangerous is what the Prime Minister said. What Australian workers saw as a life jacket in a stormy sea, the Prime Minister saw as dangerous. Well, as we have seen, JobKeeper has been anything but dangerous. Rather, it has been one of the most positive things to have come out of this place in quite some time. Thank goodness those beside me and around me those in the community never gave up on the fight on its establishment. And thank goodness that together we were able to successfully drag this government to the table. Because it is owing to those efforts that so many have been able to rely on the support they needed to get through. Now, these are the essential workers who every morning would get up make sure that our supermarket shelves were stocked, our nurses on the front line at hospitals making sure that people got tested for COVID. Now, these are the very people who rely on this payment. And it may not even be those people. It could also be people that they live and share their homes with as well. It is because of many of the efforts being put in place that so many businesses, and in particular small businesses, have remained afloat, and so many workers remain connected to their place of work. And that is a good thing. Being able to provide for their families, being able to support the many local businesses, which are probably supported by families, and support their local communities in regional Australia. But what remains the question for, for us 
and for those who still require such assistance is what is to become of them. I note that the coalition government has recently unveiled its SME recovery loan scheme. And for those listening and who are unfamiliar with the SME recovery loan scheme, this is an initiative in which the government will seek to work with lenders to ensure that certain eligible businesses will have access to finance to get them through the many tough times ahead. No matter how this coalition government might seek to dress up this scheme, it is by no means a like for, for like swap with JobKeeper. And I can assure you that if you were the owner of a small or medium-sized business, or indeed a worker in one of those small or medium-sized businesses, you would by no means be looking forward to what is to come in just 11 days' time, when JobKeeper is scrapped. We know just how important that certainty is to business, big or small. And I don't think you would have to convince anyone of just how important it is that when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic, that we get the recovery right. Indeed, how we get out of this is crucial to guaranteeing our nation's future economic prosperity. Because at the end of the day, that is all that we want. The success of Australian business is central to this. And I know, for instance, that Labor's Shadow Minister for Small Business, Matt Keogh, has spoken at length with business owners from all around the country about their concerns. Should the government persist in scrapping JobKeeper without the provision of targeted additional measures, many of these businesses will close. And this will have an effect not just on the businesses concerned and those directly employed by them, but on other businesses that might rely on those too and the indirect jobs that may be lost. Now, Labor has certainly made its own suggestions about what the government might do to improve JobKeeper. We have sought to work constructively with those opposite. Sadly, the government has not been forthcoming on this and instead, in conjunction with other proposed legislative changes before this place, has sought to maintain an on ongoing ideological crusade against working Senator people. Senator Ciccone, your time has expired. Senator Abetz. Labor's relentless negativity appears to know no bounds, and today's matter of public importance put forward by Senator McCarthy is another example of this relentless negativity. Labor's newfound interest in small business is welcome, but like all of Labor's business statements, there's no actual substance or actual policy initiative that is put forward. It is just criticism after criticism after criticism. On the one hand, Labor tells us, and might I add quite rightly, in a rare lucid moment, the JobKeeper needed to be rolled back. As we announced JobKeeper, we said it would be a temporary measure to assist us through the immediate crisis, would be tapered off and then would need to be stopped. Labor actually agreed with that at one stage in one of their rare lucid moments in this space. But of course it doesn't take them long to try to play the populist card, the relentless negativity, and somehow suggest that the money for JobKeeper can just keep flowing and flowing. The Australian Labor Party and the Australian Greens don't seem to recognise that through this pandemic, huge borrowings have been undertaken, massive borrowings, all of which need to be repaid, and repaid, I suggest, by the next generation, and chances are the generation after that. And therefore, we have to be exceptionally circumspect to ensure that the debt burden inflicted on the next generation or generations, plural, is as limited as possible. Because to do otherwise would be intergenerational theft, and this parliament would be abrogating its duty and its responsibility to the next generations. The motion that we have before us, or the topic we have before us, is this sort of glib dismissal of our small 
and medium enterprise support scheme. The motion says that somehow all we've done is rebadge it without dealing with the significant measures that are contained therein to ensure that our small and medium enterprises, the ones that we on this side seek to champion, are able to be maintained. Because small and medium enterprises, employers as they are, are called employers for a very simple reason. They employ people, and jobs are the lifeblood of our community. Jobs provide the individuals who have those jobs with better mental health, physical health, self-esteem and social interaction outcomes, and for everybody that lives in a household with somebody that is gainfully employed. And so, in pursuing our economic measures, it is not because we believe in economic purity that we so pursue them. We pursue them because of the social dividend that is delivered by good, sound economic management. And I must say it was somewhat galling to have to listen to Senator McKim, who was one of the failed ministers of the Green Labor government in my home state of Tasmania, that left its economy as a smoking ruin in recession. In recession. But with the election of the Abbott government and then the Hodgman government, Tasmania has been able to go from recession to the turnaround state and today the standout state. These things don't happen by accident. Recessions occur usually because of bad economic management. The turnaround has occurred because of good economic management by Prime Minister Abbott and Premier Hodgman, built on now by Prime Minister Morrison and Premier Gutwin. But we were told as well by the Green contribution that somehow the financial sector was rigged in favour of the housing sector. Well, if it's rigged in favour of the housing sector, one assumes more and more houses are being built. And if it wasn't so rigged, as Senator McKim describes it, there would be less houses built. But how often do the Greens issue their press releases like confetti complaining about homelessness and the lack of housing availability? They really have this capacity, as is the want of the left in this country and indeed elsewhere, to talk out of both sides of their mouth. On the one side, they say there's a housing crisis, we need more houses. On the other side, when it suits them, they say the financial system is skewed in favour of creating housing, too much housing. I don't care what your story is, just keep it consistent. Give us an actual position on these matters. You can't one day or you can't claim credibility in this space and assert there aren't enough houses and then simultaneously assert that too many houses are being built. And so uh, I turn to Senator Ciccone's contribution, which started by, not surprisingly, thanking the Green contribution. The Labor Party and the Greens cannot help themselves. They continue to be in lockstep, especially when it comes to bad economic management. I don't know what the attraction is, but it is a fatal attraction, and we have seen the results in my home state of Tasmania, and I would never want to see it inflicted at the national level. But in the moments remaining, that which the Labor Party seek to dismiss a simple rebadging includes such things as allow, uh, having the SME recovery loan scheme increasing from the current 50-50 split between the government and the banks to an 80-20 split, which will encourage more banks to support small businesses and demonstrates the government's commitment to back those businesses that are prepared to back themselves. Clear, good, positive policy, simply dismissed by those economic illiterates on the other side as rebadging. 
I dare say they use that terminology because they don't understand the significance and importance and value of these sort of initiatives. The expanded scheme will also increase the size of eligible loans from 1 million under the current scheme to 5 million and maximum eligible turnover increased from 50 to $250 million. In anybody's language, significant changes to the scheme simply and ignorantly dismissed as rebadging. Is it really the case that Labor don't understand or they haven't looked to the significance of these policy changes? Similarly, the maximum loan terms under the expanded scheme will be increased from five to ten years, providing businesses and lenders with greater flexibility and certainty. The expanded scheme will also allow lenders to offer borrowers a repayment holiday of up to 24 months. All of these fantastic initiatives simply dismissed as rebadging. The scheme also will also be able to be used by eligible businesses to refinance existing loans, another great assistance. This allows SMEs to access more concessional interest rates available under the program and to better manage their cash flows through an extended loan term and lower combined repayments. These are targeted, focused, enhancements with real outcomes, simply dismissed by Labor as rebadging. You really can't take the mob opposite seriously when it comes to economic management, which in turn means employment and self-sufficiency for our fellow Australians. You've got to give it to the Labor Party. When it comes to spin, chances are there's no one better. But when it comes to sound economic policy, that is where they are found wanting. The Australian people are awake to them. They understand that the JobKeeper funding cannot keep going, but they do know that the fundamental underpinnings required for SMEs to keep them in employment is required, and that is what we are delivering. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. To the millions of Australians out there who have received JobKeeper during the last nine months, during this very difficult time, uh, who have received their $700 a week, uh, who have been able to get on with their lives, who have been able to have some certainty that they can pay their mortgage and put food on the table, you might be tempted to think that you owe the Liberal government for paying you this stimulus package during this difficult time. But it's really important for you to note that this wasn't the Liberal government's idea. It was many people coming together to find a solution at a time of crisis. And I'm very proud to say that the Greens were the first to raise the concept of a living wage and push, at that particular time, the Treasurer and the Finance Minister to adopt a New Zealand or UK-style living wage that ended up being JobKeeper. The union movement were out there advocating for a living wage. The business community were advocating for a living wage. And we had this very unique time in history when everyone was working together for the national interest. I remember uh, putting out a media release the day of the government's first stimulus package saying exactly this. You need to go further. You need to have a living wage to keep businesses going, to keep workers in certainty during this pandemic. It took two weeks, two weeks for the government to come on board with the idea. And you know what? I'm very glad they did. But they can't be claiming credit for this scheme that has kept the economy going for the last nine months. Now, it's not perfect. Nowhere near enough people got it. It was cruel and unfair in many ways that cohorts were excluded for political reasons. Uh, and there was a lot of other problems with it, but let's be, let's be honest, it was a difficult time. We've never done this before. We should all be proud in this place of how we had cooperative politics and we worked for an outcome. We need to be very clear from here that we're not out of the woods yet, not by a long shot. While government regulations are in place around travel, around border closures, around restrictions, small business will still suffer. Workers will still suffer. 
We need to give them certainty. We need to let them know that we've got our backs. And I'm prepared to work with anyone in this chamber across political lines to make sure that happens. Let's keep the cooperative politics at the heart of what we do, not political conflict. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. There is a clear need for this government to explain how rebadging this inadequate loan scheme will be good enough for the tens of thousands of struggling small businesses that are indeed staring down the barrel of JobKeeper cuts uh, on March 28. This is the government's third attempt uh, at its SME loan scheme, a scheme that is already proven to not be working. The Treasurer has said it would help small business stand on their own two feet as we recover. However, what we see here is a government that's prepared really to push small business in Australia further into debt. Now we know that financing is uh, important and access to finance, but we also know that in with this lumpy response that's been given by the government that they've been have been pushed into needing to do, that this particular solution uh, isn't working particularly well so far. Uh, and indeed I can't see it playing a meaningful role given uh, the government's inadequate explanation of the scheme's role. The Treasurer has been disingenuous. He says it's about small business standing there on two feet when indeed the government is uh, stimulating uh, their activity by pushing them into greater debt. The government's guaranteeing a high proportion of the loan, uh, the 50-50 split with banks shift to a, an 80-20 split. But as we know, taking on more debt will only be good if you can pay it back. So holidays uh, from debt repayments, etc., while uh, they can be important, they simply do not lift the economic burden off these small businesses uh, in a way that's meaningful. Nothing more is being done for small business than allowing them to be pushed into more significant debt. There is no direct funding support anymore with the end of JobKeeper. So why is this unpopular inadequate scheme being extended? The government promised some $40 billion in small business assistance, but the government has confirmed in its own figures that only $3 billion has been lent under the existing scheme over the last year. We know that the revised scheme opened in October. It extended the loan terms and loan size, and only 39 lenders signed up. The second version, there are now only 44 lenders signing up. Um, since the August, uh, revised August scheme, there's been th fewer than 3,000 new loans worth less than $300 million uh, under the new terms to January 20 of this year. We know that JobKeeper has been cut on March 28. The Morrison government's cutting this direct support and asking small businesses to take on further debt to continue to employ people from already a grossly undersubscribed scheme. So I think the government needs to be seen to point to something, that it's doing something. Uh, uh, it's going to say, oh, well, we've got this loan scheme as we end JobKeeper. Oh, well, uh, but what we also know is that with JobKeeper ending, the job seeker pay rates have also uh, now been headed right back down pretty much to just about what they were before. This is not economic stimulus for our nation. It is not wage growth for our nation that would see small businesses uh, benefiting from boosted consumption in our nation. We have made every effort to help small businesses and continue to do so in the Labor Party. We do want this version of the scheme to work better than the last, but we believe very strongly that we also need direct support. What the government is offering is not a lifeline for small business. It's a debt sentence. Small business and their workers deserve a real plan from this government, a comprehensive plan to help them through this health pandemic that's limiting economic activity in our nation, not a promise of more debt. 
The Reserve Bank Governor has predicted some job shedding once JobKeeper ends. And for these workers and these employees of businesses, indeed these very businesses, there are many that simply won't make it. They'll be on this manifestly inadequate uh, job seeker amount. A third version of this thank unpopular you, scheme is simply Perhaps not good enough. Has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy President. And I would like to commend Labor for finally acknowledging our small business community. I mean, this is the same party that last election offered nothing for small business except more union power and increased cost of doing business. Since that election, uh, small business has not featured in Labor's policy manifesto whatsoever. And yet here they are today proclaiming to be the champions of small business. But as usual, Labor are being opportunistic and unrealistic. They would have us indefinitely fund JobKeeper at the expense of real business support mechanisms, mechanisms we have put in place to create jobs. And indeed, we heard today from uh, Senator Birmingham that over 800,000 jobs have been created in Australia in the last six months alone. Because unlike Labor, we have a history of supporting small business. Ever since the coalition came back to power in 2013, we have delivered a range of policies and initiatives to make it easier to establish, operate and grow small businesses in Australia. Our policies enabled small businesses to create over 1.5 million new jobs between 2013 and the start of the pandemic. And as a national, I know all too well that our regional economies, in particular, are almost entirely dependent on small businesses, from farmers to boutiques, bakeries to consultancies, hairdressers and plumbers. Our small businesses keep our economy and our communities going. COVID has been particularly crippling, particularly in the regions. These are regions almost untouched by the pandemic itself, but have faced the same lockdowns the same business clo closures and the same restrictions that have been imposed to um, manage the pandemic in urban areas. And for border communities in particular, the haphazard state-imposed border lockdowns and restrictions that have come off and on and off again have been particularly crippling. It's made it impossible for businesses to try and manage and plan for the future. And they've done so with no state compensation whatsoever, except for New South Wales, who established the Southern Border Small Business and Support Grant. And I commend the New South Wales government for recognising the impact that state uh, restrictions have had on our small businesses. At the beginning of the pandemic, our government understood that our economic recovery would be dependent on the thousands of small businesses across our nation. That's why we swung into action to support them throughout. And our measures have worked. And JobKeeper was only one of those measures, and it was always temporary. The other measures we've put in place, tax credits for small businesses. Over 800,000 small businesses re receive $35 billion in tax credits. Uh, Labor likes to talk about the cut to JobKeeper, but let's talk about the real cuts, the tax cuts—30 to 26 per cent for turnovers of less than $50 million and the personal income tax cuts. These are the cuts that put money back into people's pockets. The $4.9 billion tax relief through temporary loss carryback, which allows companies to write off their bad years against good years, so important after the year that was. And yes, the Small and Medium Enterprise Loan Guarantee Scheme, and I thank Labor for highlighting this very good and very popular policy. It has already supported 35,000 loans worth more than $3 billion for our small businesses. The improvements and the extensions we're making to this scheme are wanted, have been asked for and will succeed. We must remember JobKeeper was always targeted and temporary. It was there to see us through the worst of the pandemic. And thankfully, our worst has been nothing like the worst seen in other nations. 
And thankfully, Australia, due to our good management of the pandemic, is ready to rebuild. And as we rebuild, our government will continue to support small businesses. And I remind anyone listening the best way they can support small business is to buy local, support local, support your small businesses, get a coffee from the cafe, get your hair done down the street and support your local small business. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I ask an associated question, a connected question, yet a far bigger question. My question is, even if loan scheme is adequate, what about the big picture, restoring our productive capacity in this country? Look at our electricity prices, fundamental for manufacturing, fundamental for agriculture in many areas. Energy is the key. It's the primary driver of productive capacity. We've gone from the lowest cost of electricity in the world to the highest cost. It makes us uncompetitive. Liberal, Labor and the Nationals did that together. Renewable energy target, retail schemes, state and federal this is, N the network, gold-plated networks, the national electricity market, which is really a national electricity racket, privatisation, anti-coal policies from Liberal, Labor and Nationals. Taxation. Joe Hockey said not so long ago, people work from January to June to pay the tax man and for the rest they keep for the rest of the year. It's actually worse than that. It's about 68 per cent according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics back in the late 90s, early 2000s. A person on the, on the average income in Australia works from Monday to Smoko on Thursday morning just to pay for rates, fees, levies, taxes, supercharges, all the rest of it. So, we need to do something about that, especially when 90 per cent of our large companies are foreign owned and since 1953 have paid little or no tax. Overregulation, control, uh, control of, of so many of our assets, the public, uh, private assets in the hands of government. The Fair Work Act, for example, which I'll talk about later. The lack of water infrastructure, the governance of, of this country, the Murray-Darling Basin destroying the Murray-Darling Murray -Darling Basin Authority destroying the Murray-Darling Basin itself, property rights, the loss of those under the Liberal, Labor and Nationals regimes. These and so many other things are destroying the governance of our country and the productive capacity. Governance in this country now is, ba is based upon vested interests, satisfying vested interests, unfounded opinions, emotions, fears, ideology, and not based on data. It's quite often contrary to the data. The loan scheme may or may not be inadequate for Australia, for Australian businesses and workers. But the mountain we all have to climb here is stupid, reckless, counterproductive government. We need to restore our country's productive capacity. The time for discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. Now, documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Do we have any speakers? Senator Russ. President, I seek leave to table a non-conforming petition. Is leave granted? It's concerning. Leave is granted. <laughs> Yes, so I um, um, wish to table an unconforming petition from Amnesty International concerning the detention of Mahira Yukub, a Uyghur woman, by the Chinese government, which has got 38,926 signatures. Thank you, Senator Rice. Are there any speakers for documents? No, there being none, I shall now proceed to. I shall now, where are we here? Yeah, documents. <laughs> Tabling in consideration of committee reports, which are listed on page three of the notice paper. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, on behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, Senator Polly, I present Scrutiny Digest number five of 2021. Senator Davey. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the Chair of the Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I present Delegated Legislation Monitor 5 of 2021. Uh, table. Thank you. Senator Seward. I rise to table a document, Acting Deputy President, of which I think you will be taking a great interest. Um, 
I present the report of the Community Affairs Reference Committee on Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder, together with a, a Hansard record of the proceedings and documents presented to the committee, and I move that the Senate takes note of this report. This uh, report makes 32 recommendations. It, this issue was referred to the Community Affairs Committee um, actually more than 12 months ago. Um, it's, a, it's an issue that um, the committee has uh, long taken um, an, an interest in, and we took longer than, than, obviously we ex than we expected, obviously because of the COVID uh, pandemic. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, otherwise known as FASD, is an entirely preventable permanent disability. FASD includes a range of physical and neurological impairments occurring due to brain damage caused by exposing a foetus to alcohol during pregnancy. As a spectrum disorder, FASD manifests in a range of ways and conditions can range from very mild to severe. Um, the committee found that FASD is still not well understood or recognised in Australia, and I'll come back to that because that's particularly important. It is frequently called an invisible ec uh, epidemic. The evidence includes that human, social and economic costs of FASD are immense. There is no safe level of alcohol that can be consumed during pregnancy. And you'd think by now that in Australia we would get this, but we still have significant problems in that particular area, which is why we say that this is an entirely preventable um, uh, disability. There's many myths regarding the so-called inadverted commas safe use of alcohol during pregnancy that have been uh, circulating in the community for a long time. I must say, including by some health professionals and most notably the alcohol industry. Prevention efforts must fundamentally aim to shift societal attitudes and behaviour around alco alcohol consumption in the broader Australian community. The, community, the committee recommends a long-term strategy and funding for FASD awareness and education, including in secondary school curriculums. In other words, we have to start making sure that people understand um, the harms caused by alcohol, but also specifically the harms caused by alcohol in pregnancy. And the evidence we received is this just is, doesn't just uh, affect the fetus in vitro, in terms of, in other words, it just doesn't, isn't a relevant message for women. It's also an important message for men because it affects sperm as well. It is very important that we raise awareness around um, alcohol consumption and FASD. The announcement of mandatory uh, pregnancy warning labels on alcohol products and packaging during this inquiry was a, long was a long time coming, and we were pleased to see it. The committee urges alcohol companies to promptly implement the mandatory labels before the deadline in July 2023. It's not as if the industry doesn't know that they should have been doing this a long time ago. Health professionals play a key role in prevention, diagnosis and support for people with FASD and their families. Interactions with pregnant women and women of childbearing age provide opportunities to educate women and their partners of the risks of maternal alcohol consumption and, the influent and influence behaviour change. However, for a range of reasons, including stigma, and a lack of understanding, health professionals do not always discuss alcohol with women or provide accurate advice or referrals. The committee is of the view that building the capacity of health professionals to identify and prevent harmful alcohol consumption during uh, pregnancy must be prioritised. I was especially alarmed by the evidence the committee received around online marketing of alcohol being used to micro-target micro micro uh, particular, um, uh, particular uh, cohorts. Fair commented during the COVID-19 pandemic on their analysis of Facebook and Instagram during an hour period showed an alcohol ad every 35 seconds. 
Almost a quarter of these referred um, specifically to the pandemic. Because what's happening is people are ordering alcohol online. This data is being collected and enabling this micro-targeting. It's a very significant issue. There are serious conflicts of interest which mean industry-managed processes um, could not properly restrict alcohol marketing in an effective manner. We need to be doing a lot more around uh, than just have a regulatory code which has so many uh, loopholes in alcohol advertising. It's clear we need a new approach to controlling alcohol marketing, especially online marketing. This is in fact to not just address um, FASD but also around other broader uh, issues related to alcohol and its harm. FASD is often not identified early in life. In fact, sometimes it's not identified at all. And as a result, many people do not receive the recognition of their disability or, very, very importantly, access to the support that they will need. Partic and, and that needs to be lifelong support. Diagnosing FAS FASD is complex and involves a multidisciplinary team. The committee heard that there are limited uh, there are limited multidisciplinary FASD diagnostic services in Australia and the wait lists are very long. There is clear need to ensure FASD diagnosis is more widely available across Australia. This includes building and training the health workforce involved in FASD diagnosis and in exploring alternative models of assessment and the use of technology. Supports for a person with FASD will necessarily be, as I just indicated, over the entire life course. Unfortunately, support services in Australia are limited and can be cost prohibited. Throughout the inquiry, the committee was made aware of the difficulties accessing support through the education system, the NDIS and social security system. The committee agrees with submitters that FASD must be specifically recognised as a disability by the Australian government and the social security system. Access to assistance, assistance must be urgently improved to help people with FASD and their families to meet the extensive costs of FASD supports. The committee also talks about the interaction um, with people with FASD with the uh, justice system and also the child protection system. And it's very clear that we need to uh, improve those, uh, s those interactions. We need to we make recommendations. As I indicated, we, we made 32 recommendations, but we also touch on the need to improve interactions between the justice system and the, uh, the child protection system and screen people, uh, young people in particular. Um, going into the justice system and also into the child protection system. We heard some very moving and emotional evidence from carers um, and from carers for young children that have gone into the uh, care system and they have not been screened uh, and they are not getting adequate support for the, the in, off, in some cases, babies and young children that they are providing care for. They weren't even given an indication that, a child, that children potentially going into um, care have, in fact, FASD. We saw some outstanding examples of work that's being done, including in the Marula uh, strategy in, the Fitz, in Fitzroy Crossing, who have done an outstanding job in identifying in, um, issues around FASD. I, I personally will be fascinated to see the outcome of their 10-year follow-up study that we've just heard about is occurring. And I, I'm sure the people that, that were involved in the inquiry will be watching that very closely. Uh, we need much more data on FASD. We need a prevalence study. We still don't have an understanding of uh, the prevalence of FASD in this country and we have a lack of data. It's absolutely essential we address that issue. This is, I think, a very important uh, committee report. In fact, I uh, thank the Deputy Chair, uh, Acting Deputy Chair, uh, Senator Griff, who uh, initiated this in, uh, inquiry by the Community Affairs Committee. I'd particularly like to thank all the witnesses who, and, and those who gave us submissions, they provided us with absolutely essential information. I apologise to both the people in Alice Springs and in Fitzroy Crossing that we didn't actually, in, we didn't actually make it up there because of COVID for the site visits that we were so looking forward to. And there's a number of committee members who still want to come up. 
Um, and I particularly want to thank the Secretariat, who once again have gone above and beyond and produced outstanding uh, re uh, report and supported us uh, very, very well. Um, and if no one else wants to speak, I'll seek leave to continue my remarks. Senator Davey. This on. Is that on this? I've just got to. Um, <laughs> on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Trade and Investment Growth, I present the report of the Committee on Diversifying Australia's Trade and Investment Profile. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Secretary. I'm to table a non conforming petition. Okay, is leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you. Thanks. After they Are there any ministerial statements? Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. In response to the order for the production of documents agreed to on the 15th of March 2021, I table the government response to the report of the Select Committee on the Aboriginal Flag. Minister. I also table the annual report on the operation of the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme for 2019-20. Thanks, Wally. Thank you, Minister. Senator Seward. Uh, take note of the ministerial response to the um, committee report and seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. Leave granted. Uh, committee memberships. The President has received a letter requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Leave granted. Leave is granted. I move that Senator Chisholm be discharged from and Senator Ciccone appointed to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation and References Committees and that Senator Chisholm be appointed as a participating member. Okay. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those, are, those against, the ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Online Safety Bill 2021 and Online Safety Transition Provisions and Consequential Amendments Bill 2021. Minister. I move that these bills may now proceed without formalities and may be taken together and now be now read a first time. Okay. All, all, all those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Call the cl uh, clerk. <laughs> a bill for an act uh, relating to online safety for Australians and for other purposes. A bill for an act to deal with transitional and consequential matters arising from the enactment of the Online Safety Act 2021 and for other purposes. Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Okay. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate now be adjourned. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the question is that the debate be adjourned. Those that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Minister. I move that the resumption of the debate be uh, be an order. Um, sorry. I move that the resumption of the debate be an order of the day for a later hour. Those that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Right. Clerk, the ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Social Services Legislation Amendment Strengthening Income Support Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may now proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate now be adjourned. Those that opinion say aye, those against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk.
President has, re has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of Mr. Thistlethwaite and Mr. Varakomi to the Joint Select Committee on Road Safety. Clark. Clark. Uh, Government Business Orders of the Day number one. Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2021. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator McKim, you are in continuation. I am indeed uh, Deputy President. Thank you um, for that. Uh, well, as I was saying uh, when I was just getting warmed up before we ran into a hard marker earlier today, it's no surprise at all to see uh, under the cover of a pandemic. The ideologically driven neoliberals have come in here to do the bidding of their corporate masters and, of course, the people who are going to wear the pain for this are Australian workers. And before I go to the detail of the bill, let's have a look at where four or five decades of turbocharged neoliberalism has brought us to today. We are cooking the planet. The climate is breaking down around us. We are in the sixth mass extinction event in the history of the earth. An entire generation of young Australians are being priced out of the great Australian dream of owning their own home. We have millions of Australians unemployed, underemployed or in unsecure, insecure work with women, young people and migrant workers bearing the brunt. And instead of working to increase job security, to create more jobs, to lift wages, which is what the government should be doing, instead they are pushing through a bill that will further entrench insecure work, will suppress wages, will give more power to businesses at the expense of workers and will undermine the role of unions. And the neoliberals have got an awful lot to answer for. The pandemic has highlighted the inequality that's been allowed to flourish as a result of neoliberalism and as a result of insecure work in Australia. Casual workers were hit hardest during the pandemic accounting for about two-thirds of the people who lost their jobs in early 2020. Those casuals who still had a job were amongst the lowest paid and most insecure workers with no access to paid leave entitlements. And we can't forget the role that insecure and casual workers played in spreading COVID-19 across the country as workers without paid sick leave paid sick leave were forced to choose between their health or losing their income. Many employers have built insecure work into their business models, and while they turn a profit, workers have had no work or income security. The changes in this bill will further entrench insecure work in Australia. It will exacerbate wealth inequality in our country and in our industrial relations system. I want to uh, quote from Alison Pennington uh, from the Centre for Future Work regarding the bill. She says this, casual work has dominated employment growth in our post-COVID recovery, post recovery. Between May and November, 62 per cent of all jobs created were casual. That is 400,000 in six months, 
or 2,200 every day. It's the fastest growth in casual work in our history. What that shows is, first of all, that claims that there is a lack of confidence amongst employers to engage in hiring casual work is not credible. It also shows that the pandemic is intensifying and entrenching the use of insecure and casual work in the economy." End quote. Instead of passing a bill that will entrench insecure work, reduce wages and increase the power of employers, we need to outlaw insecure work, ensure the right of all workers to a safe, meaningful, well-paid and secure job with good conditions. Those are the things that we should be doing. I also want to make the point that during the pandemic, Australia's billionaires did very, very well indeed, increasing their wealth on average by over 20 per cent in the year that we've been living in a global pandemic, increasing their wealth on average by over 20 per cent when hundreds of thousands of Australian workers lost their jobs, increasing their wealth on average by over 20 per cent while most of the rest of the country had to tighten our belts and do it tough. It's about time that billionaires were forced to make a bigger contribution to government funds so that we can fund the public services, the extent of public services and the quality of public services that Australian people expect from their government. Now, we should be making the billionaires and the big corporations pay their fair share of tax so that we can provide more Australians with a dignified life, with safe and secure work and lift people out of poverty. That's what we should be doing, not bringing legislation like this one into the House. Now, the definition of casual in this bill will give employers all the power to determine whether a worker is casual and will allow businesses to classify workers as casual at the start of their employment, regardless of the number of hours they actually end up working. The bill clarifies that, to avoid any doubt, the question of whether a person is a casual employee is to be assessed on the basis of the offer of employment and the acceptance of that offer, not on the basis of any subsequent conduct of either party. I mean, there it is, colleagues. It's black and white. Now, not only does this new definition do nothing to prevent the continued abuse of casual workers? It actually facilitates it by allowing businesses to hire workers as casual and give them full-time hours without requiring them to pay entitlements or provide any job security. I mean, this is one of the great challenges facing our country today. But what do you get in this place when the agents of the big corporations when the agents of the super wealthy in the LNP come into this place, they move legislation like this, which will entrench insecure work, will suppress wages and will continue to ensure that millions of Australians live in poverty, live in rental stress or live in mortgage stress. So what we should be doing is making sure, and we do have the capacity to do this, to make sure that we put in place public policies that lift wages, that reduce the number of Australians and ultimately eliminate the number of Australians in casual and insecure work. Because we are a rich enough country to make sure that every Australian who wants a decent job can have a decent, safe and dignified job to work. Now, these are not pipe dreams. These are not pie-in-the-sky philosophies. 
We are a wealthy enough country to generate full employment. And the amount of time I hear the LNP come into this place and talk about jobs. Well, I've got to say, on their own test, they are abject and epic failures. Because they come in here every day and they talk about the importance of jobs. I've been in politics for nearly 20 years. I've never seen the unemployment rate significantly under 5 per cent. And of course we know there are large numbers of Australians who simply don't participate in the labour market because they've given up all hope of ever landing a job. We should be aiming unabashedly for full employment, where every Australian who wants to work has a job. And yet you get these hypocrites in here, they come in here every day, thump the tub and talk about jobs. Well, you've failed on your own test. You've failed on your own test. And why have you done that? Because you've deliberately chosen to put in place policies where the number of people who are looking for work far exceeds the number of jobs available, and you've done that in order to drive down wages. It's a simple supply and demand equation. And you've done it deliberately, and yet you come in here and you hypocritically bang on about how important jobs are and how jobs are your number one focus. Well, I'll tell you what, if jobs are your number one focus, I'd really, really hate to see what your number five or ten or twenty focus issues are because you've abjectly failed at what you describe as your number one focus, which is generating jobs in this country. This legislation will create a new class of de facto casual workers by robbing part-time workers of hours and income security by allowing businesses to effectively treat them like casuals with the power to increase and decrease workers' hours. The bill introduces simplified additional hours agreements which allow part-time workers in industries that have been hardest hit by the pandemic, such as hospitality and retail, to be employed on contracts that only offer a guarantee of 16 hours a week with their employer able to increase their hours without paying overtime. This applies to 12 modern awards. However, the minister will have the power to make regulations to include or exclude modern awards. Workers will be forced into a false choice to accept a contract with minimal guaranteed hours and agree to, wish to additional hours at lower pay or risk losing the job offer or additional hours to one of the over two million people who are currently unemployed or underemployed. This push from government turns what should be secure, well-paid jobs into insecure work with no guarantee of regular hours or take-home pay. So while we're cooking the planet, while the climate is breaking down around us, while a million species is on the road to extinction in the sixth mass extinction event in the history of our planet. While there is a war on nature, while an entire generation of young Australians are being priced out of the housing market because this government allows the RBA to print hundreds of millions of dollars at a time and bung it into the banks, who instead of lending it to productive businesses, lend it to housing speculators while we have millions of Australians in insecure work who are underemployed, many of whom are unemployed, while all these absolutely solvable social and environmental issues exist, what does this government do? They come in here to do the bidding of their corporate masters. And why do they do that? because they benefit from the institutionalised bribery of dirty political donations. And they know that when their time is up in this place, many of them will roll out the revolving door and into cushy, well-paid jobs 
as CEOs, senior managers and board members of those very same corporations. It is nothing other than blatant corruption. That's what it is. And what we're seeing here today is yet another example of the old adage, if you want to know what's going on, follow the money. And the other adage that if you scratch most things in politics, the first thing you will expose is self-interest. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In rising, in rising to speak on this bill, I do so on behalf of the many hard-working Tasmanians who are worried about the impact this legislation will have on them and their rights at work. I also wish to highlight the impact this legislation will have on the heroes in our fight against COVID-19, the aged care and disability care workers and other frontline health workers. This bill, that, which has been amply addressed through some of the contributions in this debate, does nothing to address issues around job security and exploitation. Absolutely nothing. In, plate, in fact, the opposite. This bill does nothing to address wage insecurity. This bill seems to assume that employers are not already casualising permanent work. This bill assumes that employers need even more flexibility with rosters. It says nothing about the certainty and security our key health and social services workers need and deserve. And all this is being done by this government, who every time they have an opportunity, they attack workers' rights and entitlements and security. They've done it before. They do it every time, every time they get that opportunity. And this time it's even worse because they're doing it under the guise of a recovery from COVID-19. Under the guise of a recovery of COVID-19, this government is looking to increase casualisations, enable more job insecurity and to cut take-home pay. This is what this bill that we are debating here today will do. If it is passed and passed into law, it will make wage less, wages less secure, jobs less secure and take-home pay less. Now, as the Health Services Union said at the Senate inquiry, and I quote, when health and care workers do not have secure work, our most vulnerable community members miss out. People with disability, older Australians, those with mental illness, they all miss out, end quote. Now we know that is the case. It's a case now. And this bill seeks to make that position worse, exacerbate that position. And what will happen is that those most vulnerable in the community will again miss out. Surely we need look no further than the devastating evidence given to the Aged Care Royal Commission to understand the impact the current employment practices are having on older Australians. Aged care workers are already ending shifts in tears because they are short-staffed and overworked and haven't been able to provide the care that aged care residents need. What's the government's answer to this? This is after an aged care royal commission and all the evidence that has been taken, completely ignored, completely ignored by this government. And, so, and what's the answer? To introduce legislation that will give employers even more flexibility, that will that will deliver increased job and wage insecurity. Our most vulnerable Australians and the hard-working Australians who care for them deserve so, so much better than this. 
It is estimated that currently 40 per cent of workers are in, are in insecure work, while more than one million of our fellow Australians are underemployed in what, what more work? Surely the cornerstone of any workplace relations legislation should be that workers are entitled to a fair opportunity to provide for themselves and their families. So how does this bill do that? The short answer is it doesn't. Instead, if this bill is passed, the number of people trapped in insecure work will increase. This bill further erodes the rights of casual workers and will broaden the use of casual workers throughout our economy. And this bill is coming along after years of uh, advocates and, and employment spokespeople talking about the casualisation of the workforce, the, how the casualisation of the workforce is even greater and insecurity in work is, is growing. And so it, it's really quite unbelievable that those on that side think it's really it's really an it, it really should is an opportunity for them to even erode those rights even more, to make casual work even greater in Australia. I'm sure they would know the difficulty it is to to care for your family when you're on when you're a casual worker how you're not able to rely on a, reg a regular um, paycheck, how you're not able to access loans, how difficult it is to, to secure rental, housing rental. These are, these are actual realities. This is what people are dealing with, and your answer is to make it even harder for them. Make it even harder. I'm not really sure if you actually go out and, and, and talk to people that are casual workers and have been long-term casual workers working the same hours that any normal person would suggest was actually a permanent part-time a permanent part-time position or even indeed a full-time position. But people take these jobs and they accept those conditions because they need to take care of themselves and their families and pay their bills. But let's not think that it's a, that makes that's easy for these families, these people, because they do have those uh, issues around being able to secure rent, housing, rent, housing rentals, and loans. And this bill just further erodes the rights of those casual workers and will and will broaden the use of casual workers throughout throughout our economy. Casual and insecure workers experience unpredictable and fluctuating pay, limited or no access to paid leave, insecurity over the length of their employment, at the whim of their employer. For insecure workers, wage increases are, are, are irrelevant, and they don't have a if they don't have a shift the next day, week, or month. Creating and protecting secure jobs and decent working conditions should and must be our collective top priority. And I don't understand what it, why it isn't for this government, or maybe actually I do, because every time they have the opportunity to cut workers' entitlements, to cut workers' conditions, to cut workers' pays, they take it. The, fact, the most um, the, um, work choices, of course, being the, the, their, their opportunity that they took that was a, very, uh, that was a wholesale wholesale 
um, destruction of the industrial relations system at this time. And, this, and what we're seeing now is the government taking the opportunity under the cover of COVID-19 recovery, which seems they seem to think should be should be borne by those least able to afford it. Seriously, seriously, get out there and talk to casual workers, and get out there and talk to employers, because there's plenty of employers that are doing the right thing. But what you are doing is making it harder for these employees and harder for those employers that want to do the right thing by their employees. That's what you're doing right here, right now. So instead of protecting secure jobs and decent working conditions, instead of doing that, this bill is about the growth of casualisations particularly in industries like hospitality. It is now clear that insecure work is not a stepping stone to permanent employment. Labor hire, sham contracting, casualisation, gig platforms and more. All of these work practices have thrived under this government and will now be entrenched if this bill is passed. And I, I really hope that that is not the case. But I fear, I fear that um, that that will ha that will happen, and it'll be the casual workers that will be bear the brunt of this legislation and their families. Just look at sham contracting. It's used by employers to disguise the employment relationships as independent contracting arrangements. This is usually done as so the employer can avoid responsibility for employee entitlements. These contracts are rife in the horticultural, security, cleaning and in the trades. Sham contracting shifts all the additional employment costs like insurance they, it shifts it all onto the worker. During COVID, Australians got, got, a, got uh, to learn about the employment arrangements and conditions of private security guards. Many of the employees in this sec sector are overseas students. They were particularly vulnerable during the pandemic as they were excluded from the government's JobKeeper and JobSeeker arrangements. Another harder-hearted uh, action by this government. The private security sector has, been, has seen increased profitability and growing rates of employment, but that employment comes at a cost. It is a sector littered, littered with extremely poor job and income security. Employees pay up to $1,700 to qualify as an insecurity guard and then earn it as a little as $13 to $15 per hour. Little wonder. They take as many shifts as they can and work across more than one location and, and for more than one company. I don't think anybody here would like uh, to have to bring up a family on that sort of money or even keep body and soul together on that sort of money. There's no superannuation, there's no long service and leave, there's no sick leave, there's no, no overtime loading, no penalty rates for working on weekends or public holidays, just a flat rate. $15 an hour. These workers were, were at the forefront of keeping our communities safe by restricting the, street, the spread of COVID. And at the heart of in insecure worse work is the issue of power. Employers know that insecure workers have limited power to speak up and assert their rights. Without job security, workers cannot speak up without risking their job. The legislation before us today makes bargaining for better wages and conditions harder. Make no mistake, that's, that's an actual fact. There won't be any bargaining. It will allow cuts to wages. The COVID-19 pandemic has made it br uh, brutally clear that the work of paid women in sectors such as aged care and disability services is fundamental to our economic and social survival. Over 90 per cent of aged care sector workers are female and they will bear the brunt of this piece of legislation. That's what's going to happen. That's why this is 
and it's, it's written to affect the, this group. The government knows that that's what's going to um, happen if this legislation is passed into law. This bill marks a return to the us and versus them mentality that has well, that was at the heart of work choices. If, if passed, it will further entrench low wages growth. It represents a return to let the market rip, rip approach to workplace relations that lies deep in the heart of the Liberal Party. For these reasons, and for many more, this bill should and needs to be rejected. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill uh, 2021. I cannot support this bill. I cannot support this bill in the form uh, in which it uh, has been presented. Uh, I do note uh, in the last uh, probably three or four minutes, uh, One Nation have, have circulated a number of amendments. Uh, and uh, what I would say is uh, even even uh, as I do, I'm, I'm always open-minded uh, to, to amendments and to have a look at things. There is no time to look at them properly, and uh, that's a tragedy in the way in which the government has managed this. They've only really secured uh, two cross-bench uh, votes this afternoon uh, to a point where amendments have been circulated, giving no one any time to really consider uh, uh, to, as to uh, what those amendments do. Now I know uh, many people have spoken before me as to some of the defects in the current bill, and I'm not going to repeat uh, what those defects are uh, because uh, it's been covered uh, quite significantly by other other speakers. What I do want to talk about is alternatives. So I'm going to start talking about the Governor General's speech on the first day of uh, the, the, the 46th Parliament. Um, I'm going to be careful here not to breach standing orders. I'll have to say that, uh, that the, the, the Governor General's speech is, in fact, the Prime Minister's speech, and so I'm not being critical of the, the Governor General when I, when I uh, criticise what, what was said. Um, I will say that that speech was quite uninspiring. Uh, it was about carving up the current economic pie rather than growing it. It, I could, have, it could have been a, a Labor win for the election, and I might have heard the same sorts of things. Talk about education, talk about social um, housing, talk about defence, a whole range of uh, different portfolio conversations, but none of them ins inspirational. Okay, and uh, th that I found quite, uh, quite troubling. No vision uh, in that particular speech. Then we got hit by a pandemic. We saw threat to life. We saw threat to basic supplies. We saw loss of jobs. But, but we all actually came together to get through COVID. Now, we're almost out of the other side. I won't say we're completely out, but we are almost out of the other side. Um, just starting to come back off some of the most dramatic health, economic and social events of recent times, a global pandemic with massive uh, uh, consequences and disruption uh, and dislocation. And, and what does the coalition do? What's the first item on their agenda? They immediately reach into the bottom drawer, or maybe it's the, the drawer of the Business Council of Australia, and pull out surprise, surprise, an industrial relations package, a so-called reform package that would, if enacted in full as originally proposed, be to the very considerable disadvantage of many workers and their families. Instead of learning from COVID, instead of growing the pie, instead of building in resilience, they went back to their traditional battlegrounds that they typically have with the Labor Party. And I guess it's a case of you, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, or perhaps in the case of the Liberal Party, um, old dogs only know one trick. Now, if I look at the big picture as to what is happening in Australia at the moment, I can see that companies are faring pretty well. Certainly, if the ASX 200 index is anything to go by, um, some of that uh, wellness has been fuelled by uh, taxpayer-funded uh, JobKeeper uh, 
allowances or subsidies that have been used contrary to their legitimate intent. So we've, be, be, we've seen some businesses behaving quite poorly throughout all, throughout all of this. On the other side of the ledger, we have seen stagnant wage growth. The wage growth index has been uh, plummeting over the last decade, and that has to be of concern. Now, I'm not a person who says we, we don't let businesses profit. I actually am a strong believer in that uh, those who take a lead in business and they take a risk and they, and they do well from that, you know, good on them. But there needs to be some sharing of wealth and prosperity. That's the way it has to be. And that does not appear to be happening. I can listen to people talk about trickle-down economics over and over again, but then I look at the data and it's not working. So I think to myself, where are the policies that talk about how we assist business in growing? Rather than trying to take the current pie that we have and carve it up in a different way, how do we make this pie bigger? How do we make it tastier? That's missing. There's a number of things we could do. Government procurement, for example, giving some emphasis towards um, Australian businesses in government procurement. I remember the one of the first things we did when we came uh, out of COVID or um, uh, as we were dealing with COVID was we gave a, a COVID safe app application to a foreign company, a foreign entity. Rather than injecting that money into a local capability that uh, would retain, you know, help retain jobs, we put ourselves in a situation where uh, we gave it to an overseas entity. Um, and indeed, that created some problems because of the US, Ed, US uh, Cloud Act. But one of the things when you do that, when you don't support Australian industry, not only do you give the foreign entity money, which they then, in, uh, re which they then reinvest in their own company to better be able to compete against Australian companies, you simply you, you end up giving a double whammy uh, to the uh, uh, to the Australian companies, a double negative uh, uh, whammy. So. We need to think about the way in which we, we do procurement. Clause 4.7 of the Commonwealth Procurement Rules allows government officials to take account of the uh, economic benefit of contracting with a particular party. That doesn't mean it has to be an Australian party, but you look at the party and you say, uh, how many jobs are they creating? What capital investment are they making? What's the supply chain effect of the procurement? And we can, uh, we can uh, use that to inject uh, government money back into our own economy, stimulating jobs, uh, helping with the wealth that we want to see here in Australia, and doing other things like helping in relation to nat national resilience, something we have learnt as a result of the pandemic that we need to have regard to. Now, the government says we can't do this. There's, there's a whole bunch of people who are fanatics in, in relation to free trade, and they say, well, we've, we've got to have uh, free trade. And I get that we're a trading nation, I don't, and I'm, I'm not in, discouraging us from being a trading nation. But when we procure things, we can't look at a foreign entity and, and, and try and compare them with the Australian entity, because the Australian entity may have to pay um, minimum wages. They, they, they may have to pay uh, leave loading, they may have to pay long service leave, they may have to comply with occupational health and safety requirements, they may have to comply with uh, environmental requirements, and all those are good things. But they drive the cost of the business up, and the government basically mandates those things, but then, then doesn't recognise it when it compares uh, a product that comes from another jurisdiction where they don't have all of those things that make uh, our society what it is today. So the government needs to stop pretending that there is a level playing field or it likes to have a level playing field and procure it, because it simply doesn't. There is no level playing field. Supporting value add. Where's the plans to support value add? We need to stop just exporting our rocks. We need to stop just exporting lithium and, and rather export batteries. Where's the government's plan on doing that? Where's the legislation that's brought forward that allows and permits us to do that sort of uh, activity? Don't just export iron ore, export steel. Value add. 
grow the jobs, develop intellectual property. That's what happens when you do that value add. Again, the, the government doesn't want to do it because they think they're going to skew the market. Well, you know, let's look at what's happening in Wyala at the moment. Because we're not backing Australian companies, um, as, as, you know, Australian industry, we've got, uh, we've got a, a situation where Wyala may well face a, uh, a company going into administration. I don't blame the government for that. But having the policies that enable us to stand up uh, and support our industries are extremely important. Again, growing the pie, not carving, carving the existing pie up. Infrastructure policies. We, we had uh, a $10 billion a boost in infrastructure program, uh, programs, but what most people don't understand is that the government places requirements on infrastructure contractors that mean only Tier 1s can get the big jobs. And here's the sad news. There are no Australian Tier 1s. We actually have a policy implemented by this government that uh, mandates the use of foreign companies. And what happens is those foreign companies, they, they of course subcontract here in Australia because the work has to be done here, but they squeeze the supply chain. They squeeze the profits out uh, back into the, uh, the head company and then they get rid of that overseas by way of uh, uh, you know, transfer pricing, licensing, a whole range of different accounting tricks. Uh, to low tax jurisdictions. Why aren't we fixing that? And indeed, on tax, we know there are so many companies that are just paying no tax at all, not contributing money that could come into consolidated revenue and be employed to assist small businesses doing much more than what this legislation would do. But it's all missing. As some senators uh, are aware, or senators will be aware, together with Senator Lambie, I have tabled amend an amendment to the bill that effectively blocks almost everything in the bill except the wage theft uh, and enforcement uh, provisions uh, that would, uh, that, that would rest restore or remedy a situation where we, ha we have seen wage theft and we do have to deal with that wage theft. Now, will that uh, amendment be acceptable to government? I don't know. I don't think so. And unfortunately, the the, uh, the Attorney General, the IR Minister, is uh, still on leave. So we probably won't have any authoritative response from him in respect of whether or not that my, my amendment would be uh, palatable. Uh, again, I don't think uh, it will be because. Um, it, you know, it really does gut the bill, but it's the only way in which I can see it can be supported at this point, of view, uh, point in time. Now, it is clear that One Nation are on board. Um, we've seen Senator Roberts now uh, d um, uh, circulate amendments, so one presumes that they are on board. And uh, again, very late almost impossible to do the analysis to work out whether or not you can or cannot support them. And we also don't know how those amendments might interact with the other player that's left, which is Centre Alliance uh, Senator Grift. Uh, and so we're now in a situation where, uh, noting that uh, Senator Lambie, I won't speak for her, but she has supported or she has co-sponsored my amendment, we're in a situation where this will come down to uh, Senator Griff. Ultimately, that's where this is going to uh, come to, informed, of course, by his colleague in the other place, uh, uh, Ms. Rebecca Sharkey. Now, they have all the cards. Uh, the government have a time uh, 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 have time pressure here because they want to deal with this between now and uh, tomorrow. So, Centre Alliance is in the box seat. They better use that position well. They better use it to get some really good amendments that that uh, that you know, strike the right balance between business and workers. Because right now, the bill doesn't. The bill doesn't do that. Unfortunately, we don't actually know what Senator Griff is doing, and uh, you know, what uh, uh, Senator uh, that, what uh, Ms. Sharkey's views are, because um, Senator Griff is not on the speakers list. And. Uh, that, that to me is in some sense disrespectful. He has the casting vote on this, 
but not prepared to come into the chamber and explain to the people of South Australia who he represents exactly what his position is. In all of the bills that, I've, that I get involved in where there's controversy and I might uh, have a casting vote or a significant say in what happens, I stand in this chamber and I tell people what I'm doing and I tell them why I'm doing it. And I think that needs to happen. So um, my, my message in closing to Senator Griff is come into the chamber and explain yourself. You, know, you clearly uh, will feel a particular way about this bill. Uh, but you need to stand up and explain to the people of South Australia uh, in the second reading debate uh, as to what your position is and why. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, for most of my working life, I've worked in the trade union movement, and I've proudly worked for United Workers Union. It's gone through a number of amalgamations in all the time that I worked there. But there are some things that have never changed, and it is the union which represents some of the lowest paid workers in this country — cleaners, security officers, aged care workers, childcare workers, hospitality workers and so on. These are people who don't have the luxury of flexible working hours. These are people who were the heroes of our pandemic. These are the aged care workers who were in this place yesterday begging uh, those few on the other side who actually met with them to do something about the Royal Commission into Aged Care to start to really lift uh, the lives of people who find themselves in aged care. These are workers who earn around $22, $23 an hour. They work part-time, but these days they work insecure work. Most of them are at the beck and call of their employer currently. Most of them have to work two and three jobs um, to survive. And that's the story of my working life as a proud trade union official at United Workers Union. And of course, as that trade union official, I've seen these sorts of bills be presented by conservative governments over and over and over again. I have never seen a Conservative government put forward an industrial relations bill which benefits workers in this country. Never. And I would challenge those opposite to stand up and prove me wrong, because that has been my life's work. I worked for United Workers' Union for more than 20 years. I'm very proud to be in the Senate. I'm very proud to be in the Senate. But to suggest that somehow, when I left United Voice uh, in 2013, as it was called then, that somehow I forgot about those workers and I forgot about the 20 years that I've worked alongside and acted on behalf and advocated for and stood in picket lines in the rain and the heat that somehow I left those workers behind, you are sadly mistaken. They are in my veins and they are in my heart, and I will defend the rights of workers until I take my last breath, because that is ultimately who I am. So I saw during the, the court Liberal government days in Western Australia the first wave, the second wave, the third wave of industrial relations reform. I saw a Liberal government reduce the wages of low-paid women, low-paid cleaners, low-paid early childhood education, educators, low-paid aged care workers. I watched as their award rates tumbled down. And what happened to that court government? Because workers will only take so much. They rose up and they voted that government out of office. They rose up and voted that government out of office. And even as bad as the Barnett government was when it came into power in Western Australia, it didn't go near workers because it had learnt its lesson. That when you start to reduce the take-home pay of low-paid workers, you will wear the consequences of that at the ballot box. And of course, while I was standing uh, alongside workers at the rallies and in workplaces and everywhere else, uh, we were also fighting 
uh, under Mr Howard's regimes, under his individual workplace agreements. And gee, I wish someone would get those old ads out and play them. Remember those ads? Workers were going to be better off. Workers were going to be able to directly negotiate with their boss. Who could forget them? Individual contracts. So what did we see? Again, once again, the casualties of those individual contracts. The workers with the least power in this country are the low-paid workers, women workers, insecure work. And we saw them once again suffer the indignity of losing more money. This time it was their penalty rates. Suddenly your penalty rates were gone because you had to sign an individual contract. And I remember Mr Howard and Mr Reese saying over and over again, no one will be forced to sign these contracts. What a load of rubbish. We all know how it works in the workplace. When the boss has got all the power and you get called in and you get told, Sue, if you want to shift next week, here's your new agreement. It's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And of course, there was no recourse to the uh, Industrial Commission for any worker who signed an individual contract. No recourse at all. And they were secret agreements. They were secret agreements that if you were a 16-year-old worker, guess what? You couldn't even take that home and show it to mum and dad. That was outrageous legislation. And whilst Mr Howard might have tinkered at the edges, it eventually cost him his seat and it eventually cost the Howard government, government in Australia. Because once again, as we saw in Victoria, where similar legislation was brought into place that we'd seen in Western Australia, those Liberals were voted out of office. In Western Australia, those Liberals were voted out of office. And federally, Mr Howard, the first Prime Minister ever to lose his seat, was voted out of office. And make no mistake, make no mistake, you will be voted out of office for this legislation because despite what you say, this legislation will cut workers' wages. At a time in this country when we have an industrial relations legislation, which yes, is absolutely needs to be reformed. And you stood over there and Mr Porter stood there and said, you know, we accept workers need more protection. Well, this legislation doesn't deliver it. And in fact, working lives of low-paid workers are much worse since I left the union in 2013. We've got the gig economy. We've got the Uber drivers. We've got all of those uh, workers who deliver meals, who you can get on an app to come and fix your tap and you negotiate how much you pay them. It's disgraceful. These are human beings trying to earn a living, and they should be entitled to some basic protections. They should be entitled to an hourly rate that gives them the decency to live a good life. They should know from week to week how many hours they have. They should not receive a text from their boss telling them, come in tomorrow or not come in tomorrow. Now that doesn't just happen in the gig economy. That happens to workers in the disability sector, looking after some of the most vulnerable people in our community. That's how they get their work via their mobile phone. Oh, two hour shift available for you tomorrow. That is not a dignified existence. It's not a dignified existence for the worker who's subjected that, to that kind of summonsing to work, and it's certainly, in my view, not the dignified way for the person with a disability to receive uh, the care that they are so absolutely entitled to. But that's what we're seeing in this country. Right across even the public service now, we have ca casualised, contracted, insecure work. It used to just be the domain of members of United Workers' Union and the SDA, shop assistants and so on, who were seen as low paid, uh, not very well trained, poorly educated. Uh, so therefore you could treat them uh, with disrespect. Well, they are some of the most honourable people I've ever had the privilege to meet in my life, and many of them 
are friends. Jude Clark was here yesterday. She's an aged care worker that I signed up to the union a long time ago, <laughs> too long to remember. But Jude and I have been through a lot together. And the first industrial action that Jude took was working in a nursing home in Geraldton, not for herself. And if you met Jude yesterday, she's the aged care worker with the pink hair. That's Jude. And why did she go on strike? Not for pay, not com for, for conditions, not because some bully union official like me told her to, because the residents in that nursing home, and I still remember it as if, if it was yesterday, and it's a long time ago now, Thank had you, disgraceful Senator Lyons. beds. It being 7.20, I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. <laughs> State governments in Australia are giving experimental, life-altering medical treatments to children and refusing to produce data demonstrating the extent of these practices, details about the cohort of children who are affected, or any evidence about the long-term outcomes of these practices. In any other field of medicine, that would cause a major scandal and prompt immediate investigations. But when it comes to the treatment of children with gender dysphoria, some as young as five years of age, states apparently feel empowered to operate in secrecy and to actively avoid any public disclosure or external expert Senator oversight. Pratt. In June last year, the Health Chief Executives Forum, a body consisting of each Australian jurisdiction's top health bureaucrats, commenced an audit and review of the care and treatment of children and adolescents experiencing gender dysphoria. The context in which this audit and review was to occur was that, according to data sourced under FOI, the number of Australian children and teenagers presenting to gender clinics and being treated with puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones has skyrocketed in recent years. This is consistent with international trends in which teenage girls in particular are driving massive increases in children seeking medical alterations to their bodies. Many experts have observed that children with childhood trauma, girls with autism spectrum disorder and same-sex attracted teenagers make up a significant portion of young people seeking to transition medically to a different gender. In December last year, after being contacted by doctors and psychiatrists concerned at the lack of data available on this trend in Australia, I wrote to the chair of the Health Chief Executives Forum requesting public release of the data and responses provided by states and territories. I noted in my letter that the release of the data provided by states and territories would enable experts and practitioners to better understand this trend and study the underlying causes. It is evident, I said in my letter, that a significant amount of policy development in this area has occurred without public transparency, independent scientific oversight or adequate collection of data and evidence. Let's remember what concerned psychiatrists are saying about the practices of gender clinics in the UK where some level of transparency and scrutiny has actually been applied. US psychiatrist Professor Stephen Levine says there is no other field of medicine where such radical interventions are offered to children with such a poor evidence base. Dr David Bell, a recently retired senior psychiatrist at England's Tavistock Youth Gender Clinic, says treatments are not fit for purpose and children's ends are being met in a woeful, inadequate manner, and some will live on with the damaging consequences. He says children have been very seriously damaged. And of course, England's health regulators and the High Court have both publicly canned the Tavistock Clinic for failing to keep adequate data and failing to produce evidence that supports their practices. So in that context, with all that information available to them, how did Australia's state governments respond to my request to be transparent and release the data they had? The response I received from the chair of the forum explained that in June 2020, the Health Chief Executives Forum asked member jurisdictions to provide advice on this issue. Jurisdictions operating gender clinics were asked to provide information of referral pathways, the clinical services provided, what clinical guidelines are adhered to, what data is collected and whether any long-term monitoring is undertaken. So far, so good. But after outlining what information was sought from states, the letter goes on to say no information about the number of, or nature of patients was collected. After discussion, the letter states, members agreed the Health Chief Executives Forum would not progress this work. So they started a review, 
didn't collect any information whatsoever about how many children they are treating, what sex those children are, what other conditions or trauma, if any, the children are dealing with, or what the long-term outcomes of their treatments were. Shouldn't alarm bells be going off everywhere when the nation's most senior health bureaucrats start an investigation into something, fail to collect any data and then abandon their investigation without any findings? In some cases, these are the same bureaucrats in charge of gender clinics, which are apparently delivering an unknown number of experimental treatments to an unknown number of children with unknown results. And their response was that they decided the audit and review <coughs> wouldn't progress. How is it acceptable that in this one area of medicine, silence and secrecy is seen as commendable, while transparency and investigation is frowned upon? And if these state governments are confident in their practices, what have they got to hide? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. COVID-19 has exposed many structural inequities in Australia and internationally, from economic insecurity to wildly unequal access to health services. In 2021, the global vaccine rollout has come sharply into focus. Australia has the means to acquire and distribute a life-saving vaccine amongst our population. And make no mistake, this is a privilege. But what we are seeing on an international level is rich nations making strides towards full immunity while poorer nations are left behind. Australia is complicit in this. This is why the Greens are calling on the Australian government to support the temporary waiver currently being considered at the WTO, which would waive intellectual property provisions for the TRIPS agreement with respect to COVID-19 vaccines, a waiver which has already received the support of over 100 countries. Between programs and direct, links, direct talks with manufacturers, Australia has negotiated for over 125 million doses. This is more than enough to vaccinate our population. 130 other countries, however, have not received even one single dose. If a country cannot access or afford some of the artificially scarce supply, they have no option but to watch their citizens suffer. By waiving intellectual property rights, vaccines will be manufactured and delivered where they are needed most. Our Prime Minister has said that it's a moral responsibility for a vaccine to be shared far and wide. I couldn't agree more. Access to health care is a human right. This vaccine is a public good. It is unconscionable to deny any country access to protect the profits of pharmaceutical giants. Australia has given $80 million to the COVAX program to help distribution in vulnerable countries. This is welcome, but it is also not enough. The COVAX program is struggling to meet its funding goal of $6.8 billion. It is also struggling to access vaccines among the global demand. Expecting this program to alleviate the burden faced by the Global South is ridiculous. Even in the best case scenario, millions of people are being left unvaccinated and at risk of becoming critically ill. Some have argued that the intellectual property provisions waiver would hamper scientific innovation by deterring private investment. This is frankly a ludicrous argument. There is no evidence to suggest that this waiver would drive away those looking to invest. And even if it did, is a pandemic not a good enough time to value lives over profit? Or do we insist on protecting corporations over people? This argument is clearly a smokescreen to protect those who profit from such predatory capitalism. Our priority should not be pharmaceutical company profits. It should be increasing access to a life-saving treatment. This should not have to be said. As a response to the waiver request, Australia signed and circulated a letter to the WTO encouraging discussions with vaccine developers. This letter, co-signed with six other countries, sounds nice, but it does nothing. It's a pseudo-compromise we've offered to placate countries who face a real and terrible threat. To reject this waiver is to condemn the Global South to face either crushing debt to acquire vaccines or to let their citizens die. If there is any good 
that should be affordable and widely distributed it is a vaccine in the middle of a global pandemic. The countries who are facing the worst of this threat are already facing legacies of previous neo-colonial deals designed to drive them into debt. This way we would help to give them autonomy, moving away from the dependence they have historically been subject to and the reliance on the whims of our aid. This waiver does not increase our spending. It does not cost taxpayer, taxpayer money. Australia has the ability to help at minimal cost and an obligation to do so. Rather than propagating a cycle of reliance, this waiver will promote countries' independence as they're able to manufacture and distribute their own vaccine. I call on the Australian government to value people's lives over the profit of pharmaceutical companies by supporting the TRIPS waiver at the next meeting of the TRIPS Council, which could happen as soon as next month. Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I rise this evening to make some remarks about the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust, which I think is one of the great contributions of Australian liberalism to environmental conservation and preservation. Now, this trust was set up almost 20 years ago today uh, by the Howard government, and the minister of the day, Robert Hill, uh, said in announcing the plan for the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust that it would be established for a 10-year life and be required to manage the properties in accordance with the Howard government's goals of maximising public access to the sites, cleaning up contamination rehabilitating bushland and preserving heritage buildings and features at the sites. Now, that is exactly what the Harbour Federation Trust has done over these last 20 years. You now see extraordinary uh, access to the public uh, across these sites at Middlehead and Northhead and, of course, further south. Uh, now, as part of the Morrison government's commitment to the environment, we commissioned a review into the Harbour Trust uh, 18 months ago, uh, and I thought as an active senator for New South Wales that I would engage with that review. And I put in a submission back in January last year which said that when the camera pans around Sydney, it starts at North Head. Trust assets are iconic, beautiful and unique. The preservation and maintenance of the natural environment is essential in maintaining Sydney's place as Australia's global city. Uh, and that review, Mr President, uh, has delivered a slew of recommendations which our government has adopted, funded and followed quite closely. In the budget in October, the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, provided $40 million for further rehabilitation of trust sites so that people can go to North Head, uh, which hosts the quarantine station. People can go to Middle Harbour, uh, which hosts the iconic 10 terminal buildings. Uh, and in time, there will be more public access, uh, which I think is so important. One of the major issues that the community has mobilised against has been the idea that these lands would be locked up for developers and for private interests. And that is not uh, something, that, something that our government was prepared to support. And in fact, in announcing uh, the legislation yesterday that will embed this trust in perpetuity. Uh, the minister said, Susan Lee said, uh, we are ensuring the ongoing future of the trust and delivering on our commitment to keep its wonderful sites in public hands. And importantly, the minister has dealt with this question of leasing by saying, under the proposed leasing arrangements, commercial leases for appropriate sites will have a maximum term of 35 years, with leases longer than 25 years subject to disallowance in parliament. Um, so we have delivered a structure which has preserved these unique, pristine lands for public access. Over the 20 years, more of those buildings and more of those sites are now accessible. And now we have put in place a framework so that these sites will be protected forever uh, under the Commonwealth. Now, I know it's unusual that the national government would run a trust like this, but these are arguably some of the most iconic pieces of land in the world, and it's very important that we have control over these lands to maintain our trust. Now, uh, I did want to touch on the extraordinary volunteer program. Uh, basically, uh, for the last 20 years, there have been hundreds of volunteers that have given their time to help preserve these sites. And I want to pay special tribute to the Headland Preservation Group, 
uh, and its president, Jill Lestrange, who's done so much and have given so much of their time uh, to preserve and conserve these lands. I've met many of the volunteers when I've been on the Harbour Trust sites uh, who keep the, bush, keep the bush walks going, um, who look after the place. Uh, they really are so proud of their work uh, and we're proud of them. And that volunteer ethos is such an important part of maintaining those lands. So I know there's been great consternation about where these lands would go in the future. And this government has made it very clear that we're keeping the trust permanently. It won't be a transitional body. Uh, we will be putting more money into it and we won't be allowing really long-term leases which put at risk any sense of, of public access to these unique and pristine lands. And so I thank again the Headland Preservation Group and all the volunteers that have kept these lands in pristine form. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. Well, McCormick workers in Victoria are taking strong strike action and have been for the last three weeks. They are the workers who make the sources for some of Australia's favourite fast, fast food chains like McDonald's, Hungry Jack's, Subway and Nando's. These workers are taking action because for the last five years they have been subjected to a wage freeze. Five years. Five years of hard work. Five years without thanks from their company, which is actually very profitable. Now, after tirelessly working throughout the pandemic, putting food in restaurants for all of us, what are they being offered? A wage freeze. A wage freeze and cuts to their penalty rates. What a kick in the guts. When I visited these workers three weeks ago, I promised to bring their stories to Canberra. So here are those stories. Yana. Yana has worked at McCormick for 18 years. She enjoys her work so much that she wants to work there till retirement, but she feels totally and completely disrespected by this company today. Mary. Mary is 55. She's been working at McCormick for 33 years. She's a machine operator and she loves her job, but she is being seriously undervalued by this workplace. And Steph. Steph has been working at McCormick for 13 years. Her mum, Mary France, for 21 years. So their entire household works at McCormick and they currently have no income at all. I am proud of these workers for taking this action, for demanding the pay and respect they've worked hard for during the last five years. I am proud to stand with these workers. I call on McCormick to come to the table and give these workers a fair offer. But this, this story, these stories of these women, this is just the height of what is happening right across the country, right across the country in Scott Morrison's Australia. Stagnant wages, insecure work, and people are saying enough is enough. We need to get wages moving in this country. This government should be using the pandemic as an opportunity to build a better future to make us stronger than we were before COVID, not to further entrench insecure work. On our side, we believe that you should be paid fairly for the work that you do and that our road to recovery should be built on a big and bold jobs plan. That is what this country needs going forward. But Scott Morrison can't even come up with a plan for good, secure jobs because all he knows and all the Liberals know is how to suppress wages, how to freeze super and how to ensure workers are worse off in life. And if they force their nasty IR bill through this parliament, more and more workers will face what the McCormick workers are facing, disrespect that runs so deep that people suffer a five-year wage freeze. What a missed opportunity by this government. What a missed opportunity. This government could be giving people hope. They could be giving people stability. They could be giving people jobs that they can actually plan a future on. Last year, we heard the Morrison government thank and praise our essential workers, but we all knew, we always knew, that these were hollow words because this government has yet to show its thanks and gratitude by rewarding workers with any kind of jobs plan, a plan for strong wages, for secure jobs that they can count on. Australian workers deserve so much better. McCormick workers deserve so much better. 
We owe it to them. Their employers owe it to them. This government owes it to them. It shouldn't take workers marching off the job to see a rise in their pay packets. It shouldn't be commonplace for employers to engage in five-year wage freezes. What should be commonplace is for employers to actually respect their workers. But how can we expect to see that when our own government won't respect Australian workers? Australians deserve better. Senator Griff. I thank you, Mr. President. A year and a half ago, I spoke about the statutory review of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. I reflected on the previous review from 2010, which identified a number of issues with the Act and made a series of recommendations. Unfortunately, those findings were not acted on and the recommendations were not implemented. It was very much a missed opportunity for reform. That speech called on the government to learn the lesson of 2010, to take the 2020 review seriously, to use the opportunity to build on the strengths of the EPBC regime and to fix whatever issues were identified. Since that time, Professor Samuel has concluded his review and found Australia's environment is in a state of unsustainable decline unsustainable decline. It found the Act is failing, failing to protect the environment or conserve our biodiversity. It shows the EPBC Act is not fit for purpose. Fortunately, the review does not just set out the many problems with the Act. It also provides a comprehensive reform agenda changes that would facilitate economic development while properly protecting our environment. This review is exactly what we needed. A clear look at what is broken and how it can be fixed. But the government response, unbelievably, makes it difficult to have confidence this review will be more successful than the one back in 2010. Transparency is essential for any genuine reform process, but it has been conspicu conspicuously absent so far. They spent months delaying publication of the review. They spent months obstructing a Senate inquiry into the streamlining bill. They proposed an inquiry of just two weeks for the standards bill, two weeks. And after five months, they have still not responded to the review. Their plans are a mystery to us all. We don't know where they agree with the review and where they disagree. We don't know what recommendations they will act on and which they will totally ignore. We don't know what changes they want to make now and which they will make in the future or just completely disregard. The government wants us to support its reform bills, but how can anyone support legislation without understanding the effects? How can we support legislation without knowing the broader policy context? All we know is that the government wants to accelerate project approvals by devolving assessments to state and territory governments. There is merit to such a policy as long as it is done in the right way with effective environmental standards, an independent regulator very much being part of a broad reform agenda. But where are the effective standards? Where are they? Where is the independent regulator? Where is the broad reform agenda? Until these questions are answered, we cannot have confidence that the government intends to follow through and fix the many issues with the EPBC Act. Centre Alliance will not support the government abandoning its responsibilities. A serious problem, a serious policy problem, has been identified and it is in the government's duty to resolve it. 
The very first step must be the release of a comprehensive response to the review, something we would have thought would have been out well and truly by now. A review and a response which sets out the government's plans and priorities and provides a roadmap for the implementation of its reforms. After they respond, we can consider our next steps. But if there was ever a need for government to take action, an agenda for reform and an opportunity for change, this is it. I can only hope that this review will not be another missed opportunity. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, Last year, I rose in this chamber to talk about the um, hashtag No Borders for Borders campaign. I introduced to the chamber the story of Barney and Charlie uh, from near Burke, who travel 900 kilometres to attend boarding school in Victoria, and who last year, when their campus was closed, uh, with, faced with the choice of either travelling through a COVID hotspot of Melbourne, flying to Sydney and uh, isolating unaccompanied for two weeks in Sydney before driving 1,200 kilometres back to school. Uh, they instead opted to do remote schooling at their boarding house at their closed Victorian school, uh, isolated from their friends and family um, at a time that many would agree was stressful for all. Uh, through negotiations and through efforts of groups like the Isolated Children's Parents Association, we were able to get the state authorities to see reason and to enable Barney and Charlie to return home. We also worked very hard to get other school students who board across state lines um, to be able to rejoin their families at home. Uh, for holidays and then return to school. One of the key issues of that campaign and the need for the No Borders for Borders campaign was the haphazard introduction of border closures by states across the country with um, unclear rules and regulations, uh, unclear um, exemption requirements and that changed from each occasion of border closures. So imagine my excitement when I heard that um, Prime Minister and Cabinet Secretary Mr Phil Gaitchens was appointed to head a new task force that would report to National Cabinet. And one of their key terms of reference was to work on a nationally consistent approach to responding to the COVID pandemic. Well, as a member of the COVID-19 Select Committee, uh, we heard from Mr Gaitchens in the last week, um, and uh, I asked what that nationally consistent approach would look like. Do we have a nationally consistent approach to shutting down borders? Do we have a nationally consistent approach to addressing hotspots such that uh, when Premier Daniel Andrews says it is easier to close a border than to ring fence a hotspot, um, we don't face that into the future. Unfortunately, what I heard from Mr Gaitchens was states are sovereign governments and the chief health officers have statutory powers, and those statutory powers are not something the Commonwealth can wind back. Now, while I appreciate that states are sovereign governments, how hard is it for state governments to agree on a set of rules and trigger points so that the people of their states and the people of their na this nation can understand when we might face border closures and when we might face these incredible restrictions? Is it going to be when we have 13 cases? in a community transmission, or 100 cases of community transmission, or one case of community transition, transmission. We just don't know. Last week I was invited to come 
and make a presentation to the Isolated Children Parents Association in New South Wales and, uh, at their annual general conference. And I got to meet some of the families who I was able to help last year. And their gratitude was absolutely humbling. But also what was concerning is that these families still don't know if they will have to face the same sort of tumult again if we have another case of uh, community transmissions and the pandemic. I implore the states to come together and agree to a national consistent approach. Thank you, Senator Davey. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.